What's up guys? It's yo boy Oma Sensei. Welcome to Star Wars Reborn as Anakin Skywalker Part 5. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. It would seem that the Captain Tifo has more than enough people stationed downstairs. Anakin though to himself as he was still within the room where he and Padme had reacquainted themselves with each other. While Anakin had said he was going to check everywhere by himself, it was easy enough for him to locate everyone within the building. His senses within the Force had gotten a massive upgrade after going down into Hell, coming out with an ability the Jedi and Sith wouldn't like, either because it is against the way of the light, or was simply far too much powerful within the hands of one person for the Sith. It was currently within the night cycle of Coruscant, and Anakin had just been sitting here awaiting for what would happen next. While the original Padme may have not liked being watched through some cameras, it would seem that she didn't mind Anakin keeping an eye on her. She had not covered the cameras up, and he was the only one with access to what was happening from within the room. He also had seen R2 again. The droid had been programmed to also alarm him of anything suspicious that may happen. Padme actually felt incredibly safe under his watch, and not creeped out at all. Given she had been intently keeping an eye out for him, it would seem she was at least no hypocrite in this sense. Within Padme's room a floating droid at her window was acting very suspicious. It created an opening for itself to unleash some centipede-like creatures, and once released they were starting to go towards the slumbering Padme. Sue activated itself from its own form of sleep to look around the room, but the centipedes were smart enough to hide from the astromech. However before they could get too close to her or even crawl upon her body, Anakin entered the room with his lightsaber ignited and killed off the two centipedes. In doing so however he doesn't awaken Padme because he made sure to be as quiet as possible, knowing that the droid outside will start to make its move and run away. Anakin used Mechaderu on it to completely take control over its system. He allowed it to continue on its way so he could follow it towards its master. After doing so and seeing it start to get away, he rushed down through the building and informed Tifo of the assassination attempt, but also said that Padme was still asleep so as to not disturb her. Getting into a ship he begins to chase after the droid discreetly. In doing so he has to dodge and weave through all of the other people still driving throughout the night cycle of Coruscant. Seeing just up ahead, Anakin sees the woman assassin collect her droid and get into her ship, rapidly trying to escape because she doesn't know whether or not she has succeeded. It is always better to make haste than waste your time sitting around to hear of the results as people could already be out looking for her if she has failed. In fact people would look even if she had succeeded. While she was escaping though, Anakin was stealthily on her tail, knowing that she would lead him to his prize. Performing all sorts of maneuvers that would be deemed and as illegal within the traffic lanes of Coruscant, both pursuer and pursuant, continue the chase with the assassin now aware of her hunter. As they continued downwards, eventually the two crafts came across an area that seemed to be some sort of power generator. The assassin went through some power couplings and tried to get Anakin to go through it, but this energy wouldn't harm him at all. His body's natural defenses excluding his nano suit and the force would be able to tank a high level of voltage. The assassin goes up and pulls into another area, which was a tunneled airway with various channels. Anakin decides to allow the assassin their short reprieve, given she would still lead him to where he wants her to, and decides to take another way around. Anakin comes to a stop amongst an intersection, various intersections in fact, as there are multiple layers upon layers. He awaits his chance to go down and land on the woman's ship, but before that he uses Mechaderu on the speeder he is on. He doesn't want to cause any undue harm now. Just because he is having a little fun, he tasks one of his thought processes to fully control the speeder. 3, 2, 1. He jumps down and as he does so, he avoids multiple flying cars that would have crashed into him very narrowly. But it looked as if everything was within his control. He lands smoothly not alerting the woman at all of his presence. But that doesn't last long as he intends to land her in the ship she is piloting. He turned on one side of his dual saber, and a blue blade appeared alerting the woman inside. She tries various maneuvers to make him budge, but he doesn't move a muscle even without the force he could physically hold on with extreme agility and still be unimpeded by the movement. Disabling the ship and using the force to usurp her weapon, she was now defenseless and the speeder was going down. Using the force, Anakin redirects the vessel, so it doesn't do any harm to those it may have landed on and hops off as it crashes. As Anakin lands, if he didn't land properly or use the force to aid himself, he wouldn't be hurt at all and maybe even a small crater would have been made by the impact. His body is extremely strong after all, and all this weight was easy to manipulate and move through the use of his upgraded nano suit power armor and bodily genetic modifications. The woman exits the craft, and she starts to run with Anakin leisurely chasing behind her. The woman enters a club and he comes to a stop, knowing that it would be hard who, am I kidding it would be incredibly easier to identify her. Anakin thought to himself as he entered. Anakin decided that he should get a drink himself, he may not be all that interested in alcohol, but that doesn't mean he shouldn't enjoy the benefits of his condition. He can drink all the alcohol he likes, and he would probably never get inebriated. An alien creature speaks to him after getting a drink. Wanna buy some death sticks? Nah, I'm good. Anakin replied not bothering to do the same thing Obi-Wan did but he does add, I think it would be best that you don't sell that stuff anymore, and also not use it yourself. Who are you to tell me what to do? The alien snaps back sharply. It is just a suggestion, you can do whatever you want with your life, and it is not my decision whether or not you continue to do what you do. Anakin replied calmly. Hey, whatever, 
The alien walks away a little disgruntled and instead of being forced to change, he was given the choice to change himself. Anakin should have little sway on a person's actions and decisions, they are their own. But that doesn't mean he was unwilling to let them go off without trying to reconsider their position. However, not everyone wants their flaws brought up into their faces so directly. After grabbing and taking a drink, Anakin decides to walk around to lure out the assassin. As he does so, various women of compatible species give him various looks ranging from mild interest to full on seductive gazes. He can't exactly be conspicuous in this environment, given he has some rather unique features even among other species. It is now common for someone to be so tall and have a prestigious outfit, which was secretly his nano suit infused power armor, walking around. He identified the woman, which was in fact a changeling and easily incapacitated her. He didn't have to chop her hand off which was customary amongst the galaxy. But he didn't knock the changeling out. He needed some valid reason to hunt down the bounty hunter, and getting information by tacking down the assassin was considered valid. Of course he could simply just not do this and waste his time. But that would be too suspicious. No, it is always better to have some modicum of truth when it comes to lying. Lies are easier to believe when there was some truth within said lie. But that doesn't make it perfect. It just makes it easier for him to continue to go under the radar as a simple but powerful Jedi. The crowd is stunned at his actions, but he just says it is Jedi business, before easily lifting the changeling and carrying them outside. Do you know who you were trying to kill? Anakin questions the changeling. It was a senator from Naboo. The changeling replied, Who hired you? He continued, It was just a job. Instead of grunting in pain or being silent in agony, the changeling was able to reply only slightly out of breath, due to being knocked out so suddenly then reawakened. I will ask again. This will be your last chance to answer. Who hired you? Anakin said in an ominous tone, making sure the changeling knew it was in a whole heap of trouble. I it was a bounty hunter called Dash before the changeling could finish its sentence, a dart was fired, and Anakin knowing this was going to happen, didn't stop it given he had looked into the other the mind of the changeling, and saw what other's jobs it had accepted. Death is a more suitable choice for you. He thought silently to himself as looked away from the now dead changeling, and stared at Jango fed as he flew off. The assassin then said something as it died. We shan't at Slimo. Anakin doesn't care enough to hold the person and let it die, leaving the being dead there on the cold ground outside of a club. Track down this bounty hunter you must Obi-Wan. Yoda says as Anakin had reported the situation to the council, and it would seem that the council wanted Obi-Wan, who had originally tracked down Jango to take on this mission. Most importantly, find out who he is working for. Mace continued, I am to assume that I am to resume protecting the senator. Anakin questions, you are to escort the senator back to her home planet of Naboo. It would seem she has requested your presence in particular. Mace said while talking to his apprentice now full grown, she will be safer there, and don't use registered transport. Travel as refugees. As the leader of the opposition, it would be very difficult to get Senator Amidala to leave the capital. Anakin says waiting for their response even though he could always find a way to convince her. Until caught this killer is. Our judgment she must respect. Yoda says with finality. Anakin, you could go to the Senate and ask the Chancellor Palpatine to help convince her about this matter. Mace gives a suggestion instead of outright telling him what to do. I think that would be a good option. Anakin and Obi-Wan both bow as they are now dismissed with their own missions to go on. Anakin has now met up with Palpatine, and he seems to have a lot to say to him given that Palpatine has not had such a large influence, at least not directly on his life so far. Palpatine would take this opportunity to try and further his own desires. I will talk with her. Palpatine says as Anakin faces him behind his desk instead of being up close and personal. Senator Amidala will not refuse an executive order. I know her well enough to assure you of that. Thank you, Chancellor. Anakin replies politely, but didn't address him in any other matter implying any closeness between the two. If you don't mind me asking, it would seem that the Jedi are quite proud of having a fine, prestigious, talented and young Jedi master such as yourself. Is it true you rejected becoming a part of the Jedi High Council? Palpatine just had to ask to satiate his curiosity to try and plant some seeds of doubt, if there weren't any already. Yes, Chancellor. I did turn down the position offered to me. Anakin answered. Interesting and here I thought that becoming a part of the Jedi Council would be something all aspirant Jedi wish to strive and achieve. You are much like one of your masters, Qui-Gon Jinn. I do believe his name was. Palpatine continued. I have been told that I take some traits from him. Anakin replied to imply he was still listening within the conversation they were having. Yes, yes, from what I have heard. Some rumors here and there, mind you is that you are quite talented, and I do believe that you have great potential. It is not only I who hold you in high esteem given your skills, and in fact here, many believe you to be able to surpass Master Yoda in the future. Palpatine was trying to make Anakin have a favorable impression of himself. Palpatine continued, I see you becoming the most powerful Jedi ever, Anakin Oh, Sorry, if you may forgive me. But may I call you Anakin? Only if you don't mind of course. Anakin played a passive role in this conversation and let the Chancellor continue to waste his time. Of course, Chancellor, I wouldn't mind you addressing me as such. Of course, of course. I would only do so in private if we ever have the chance to meet more in the future, Palpatine added. I will of course get right onto the task of making sure Senator Amidala goes with you. I can't have her dead now. It would be such a great tragedy. I believe then that I shall also be taking my leave. Anakin says as he gets up to leave. Before he goes however, Palpatine makes sure to add. Please, do be sure to visit more often. I quite might enjoy the talks we have between the two of us. And I do believe we would make such great friends. It'll be sure to keep this in mind. Once again, thank you, Chancellor, and your assistance. Anakin bows before Palpatine adds yet another clause. There is no need, my friend, for you to continue to call me as the Chancellor. Please just call me Sheev, 
It is my first name, and not many people use it. Being a politician sure makes making friends quite hard. Palpatine says faking some melancholy. I will also keep this in mind. Anakin leaves before Palpatine can get any more words in. I am taking an extended leave of absence. It will be your responsibility to take my place in the Senate. Padme was speaking while Anakin was waiting for her to finish up. Representative Binks, I know I can count on you. Mesa wanted to be taking on this a heavy burden. Jar Jar replied before continuing. Mesa accept this with my, my humility and... Jar Jar seemed unsure of himself, and was trying his hardest to be cordial and polite, following in line with the social norms and etiquette within a political setting. Jar Jar, I don't wish to hold you up. I am sure you have a great deal to do. Padme interrupted him before he has an aneurysm. Of course. Jar Jar responds. Melody. Jar Jar briefly but politely bows before heading off in his own direction. Padme looks over to her protector and moves over towards him, even though she likes Anakin. That doesn't mean she doesn't have other things to separate herself from him. I do not like this idea of hiding. I can sense you don't like the situation we are in. Anakin responds. Obviously, Captain Obvious. Padme responds with some sass. Whoa, Senator, if I didn't know any better I would say that you are being quite emotional and I understand. Who would like it when their life is targeted? Anakin replies. I only hope to put your worries at ease as the Jedi Council has seen the benefit to seeking and following the tracks of your mysterious attacker. I am sure you are familiar with the Obi-Wan Kenobi, yes. Anakin continues with a question. I am, but that is not the point. I haven't worked for a year to defeat the Military Creation Act to not be here when its fate is decided. Padme said with heat, but not actually angry at Anakin. No, she is angered with the situation. Sometimes we must let go of our pride and do what is requested of us. Of course, that doesn't mean that what is requested of us is always correct, but sometimes the situation requires a little patience. Anakin said, Arnie, you've grown up. It is not like I haven't seen that you have, but what you are saying is quite wise. It is no wonder you have become a Jedi Master at such a young age. Padme feigns not knowing much about him when she clearly knew more. No, you humble me. I still have much to learn. At least I believe I do. But I also believe there is more to life than what is within the Jedi. Anakin states, raising an eyebrow. She questions as she continues to pack. You are unsatisfied with the Jedi, not dissatisfaction. But I see flaws within the Order. Flaws that could lead to disastrous consequences if left unchecked. And no matter what I do, it would seem that I am unable to sway its current direction. He told her of his concerns. I am sure that you could do something. I have been within the Senate for a few years now and have seen my fair share of downs. Padme leaves off before continuing. But I believe that there is much hope in the rekindling of democracy. I have a lot of faith in the Chancellor. I suggest that you don't heavily rely on the Chancellor's opinions. Anakin replies deciding to try and change her way of thinking when it comes to Palpatine. But he would have to do this slowly because she might reveal his thoughts about Palpatine to him inadvertently. You don't believe the Chancellor has the best interests of the people at heart. Padme was curious to why Anakin felt this way, and didn't immediately reject such a notion. He had after all not really helped her when it came to the engagement between the two. In fact, she would have said that he actually enabled this unfair agreement of selling her off. Not that she disliked Anakin, she liked. Like a lot. But that still didn't mean she liked the way everything was going. As you are a politician yourself, I am sure you are aware of the diplomacy and intrigue that happens. Anakin said in a leading tone. Yes, I am. Padme confirmed having finished packing her luggage, and they continued their talk all the way to their destination. Well, Anakin then went on to explain the current political climate, at least from his view from within the Republic and the Jedi. The ups and downs and the subtle corruption that was slowly but surely becoming more and more prominent. He didn't point out Palpatine as the culprit, but simply for now explained that there was more than what meets the eye when it came to the Chancellor, and that she should keep that in mind. Anakin had a decision to make himself, but had decided to just leave Jabitha to be used by the other girls. He didn't need her, not right now as he didn't need to get to anywhere without most haste. His only duties right now are to protect Padme, and he was more than capable enough of doing this by himself. He may have liked the invisibility features that Jabitha could provide, but it was unneeded. Arriving on a shuttle, Anakin was seated within along with Padme, Tifo and another woman. Be safe, Melody. Tifo said as the three within had gotten up while Anakin was still seated. Thank you, Captain. Padme responded. Take good care of Dorm. The threat's on you too now. The woman now identified as Dorm says herself. You'll be safe with me. Dorm smiles while looking at Tifo before looking at Padme and shedding a small tear, while trying to keep up a smiling face. Padme looks to Dorm and says, You'll be fine. It's not me, Melody. I worry about you. What if they realize you've left the capital? Dawn questioned Padme about her safety with a lot of worry. Well, then my Jedi protector will have to prove how good he is. Padme says before getting ready to leave with Anakin. As they were walking away, Padme couldn't help but add. Suddenly, I am afraid don't worry. I will be sure to provide you with safety. Anakin states. That's not what I'm worried about. Padme says. We do have R2 with us, so if anything goes wrong R2 could fix things. Anakin says trying to brighten up the atmosphere. I am sure. Padme smiles at this as the both of them walk off into the distance. By the way? Are you sure you had to dress up like this? We are supposed to be disguised as refugees after all. Oh, that is right. Padme seemed embarrassed at this. Wait, how come you didn't notice as well, Master Jedi? She points her eyes towards him. This isn't on me, take some responsibility and own up to your forgetfulness. I am sure it doesn't matter anyway, as long as we get to Nabu safely. I am sure nothing could possibly go wrong. Anakin states knowing that stuff will most definitely go wrong. But she doesn't need to know that. I am sure. Hey, you, no droids. 
One droid spoke to another, which was in fact R2 as Anakin and Padme were within the communal dining hall of the refugee transport ship, both of them are on. Get out of here, the droid said as R2 brought over the food it was tasked to get. Wheeling over, R2 stops as Anakin and Padme were seated. Thank you, R2, Padme said before continuing. It must be difficult having sworn your life to the Jedi, not being able to visit the places you like or do the things you like. While she there to herself, or maybe see those who like you Anakin just nods along. While seeing she has something else to say, Padme then continues after some hesitation. Do you remember that kerfuffle over the betrothal between the both of us? Anakin finishes her sentence. Yes, Padme confirms. I am. I am wholly aware of the politics that went into it. And I am also aware that if you had stayed as the queen, we may have gotten married. Anakin continues himself. Is that even allowed? Padme questions. I mean, are the Jedi even allowed to get married, to have a family are you even allowed to love? I had thought it was forbidden for a Jedi, but forgive me if I don't exactly understand why that would have been allowed. If you really are interested, I could give you a quick rundown of how the Jedi currently conduct themselves within the confines of their code. Anakin said, a code. Is this some agreement every Jedi is supposed to take? Padme questioned. Yes, and referring back to your question about love, yes. I would say that the Jedi dislike the idea of love in a romantic sense, because it creates an attachment. Anakin continued, attachment is forbidden, possession is forbidden, but there is the clause of which the Jedi preach about compassion. Compassion is supposed to be central to the Jedi, and their way of life, and a lot of people, would define that as unconditional love. So overall, it is complicated. Anakin finishes. You seem to be using language that separates yourself from the Jedi a lot. Padme notices this discrepancy. Yes, I tend to be doing that more and more. Anakin for now dodges this question and continues. You don't seem to be all that surprised however about the Jedi. Let's just say I have done some research into these things, especially after our incident. Padme replied. You have changed from whence I last met you. You look so different now. Well, yes, I have. When looking at you, I would say you haven't changed at all. Well, maybe a little. Anakin said which drew Padme's interest. How so? She was interested in why he thought so. You have grown older. Yes, but the beauty that I remember seeing from all those years ago remains. Anakin smiles. Are we well how kind of you? I am faltered. Padme blushed a bit but was unable to dully hide it even with the makeup she had on. The transport ship has finally landed on Naboo after its short voyage. I wasn't the youngest queen ever elected, but now that I think back on it, I'm not sure I was old enough. Padme said as Anakin was holding the luggage and they were walking, I am not sure I was ready. The people you served taught you did a good job, why else would they elect you a second time? I believe that if you hadn't stepped down, and you hadn't changed the laws, they would have elected you for a third term. Anakin replied, didn't they even go so far as try and amend the constitution, just so you would stay in office? I was relieved when my two terms were up, Padme said as they continued. After the election of the new queen, she had offered me the job of becoming the senator. Padme continued, when the queen asked me to serve as senator, I couldn't refuse her. Why was that? Anakin questioned. I felt that I couldn't. It was just a feeling, but I believe that I should and trusted in my instincts that this was the right decision. Padme replied, admirable choice. I do think the queen made the right decision, as there would be no other senator representative like you. The one thing I have to say though is that the life of a politician doesn't seem like a very safe one. Anakin said, I didn't know the full possibilities and responsibilities I was getting myself into either. Padme continued, the two continued to converse for a while. Before getting Padme settled within the room, she would be staying at before both of them went to meet up with the current queen of Naboo. If the senate votes to create an army, I am sure it is going to push us into a civil war. Padme stated as Anakin was standing just behind and beside her. They were within a meeting room, the current queen, along with Padme, Anakin and other council members of Naboo were present. It is unthinkable. There hasn't been a full-scale war since the formation of the Republic, the councilman said within the room, outraged. Do you see any way through negotiations to bring the separatists back into the Republic? The queen directed her question to Padme. She answers, not if they feel threatened. My guess is that they will turn to the trade federations or the commerce guilds for help. Before she continues with, in fact, with the rise in value and economic wealth of the Emperor, they might want to get some help from them as well. Padme briefly looks at Anakin as she says this. It's outrageous. But after four trials in the Supreme Court, Newt Gunray is still the Viceroy of the Trade Federation. The old councilman said before continuing, I fear the Senate is powerless to resolve this crisis. The Queen says, We must keep our faith in the Republic. She gets up and this prompts everyone else to get up as well as she approaches Padme and continuing to walk. The day we stop believing democracy can work is the day we lose it. Walking alongside the Queen, Padme replies, Let's pray that day never comes. In the meantime, we must consider your own safety. The Queen says before looking at Anakin. The councilman asks Anakin, What is your suggestion, Master Jedi? Well Anakin begins only to be interrupted by Padme. That's okay. While I trust in the safety Master Skywalker here provides. I believe that it would be best if I use my own knowledge to the best that I can. I can't leave my fate up to the hands of others, now can I? Padme says looking towards Anakin daring him to disagree. I think Melody, that perhaps that is a good idea. But wasn't that quite rude of you? 
Anakin says feeling slightly slighted. I apologize if I made you feel like you are unneeded. In fact, I need you immensely right now, and your help is appreciated. Talk about domestics while around others. As you wish, Melody. Anakin says as he just stares at the cheeky woman. You just wait, you will get yours. He thought to himself as the conversation between everyone was over now, and everyone went their separate ways. Except Anakin, whom had to stay near Padme a lot during their time together. Not be either he or she disliked this. Stupid, stupid, Arnie. Isla was muttering under her breath and seemed to be a little upset at her beloved. Anakin had gone off and accepted the mission to protect the woman he had been betrothed to, while she had been left at the temple with nothing much to do. She was jealous and also disappointed, not in Anakin but in herself. Disappointed in herself because while they had been in a romantic relationship for a few years now, she had been afraid to take the next step. It was a bit of an insecurity because of the way her people, her species was displayed in a sexual manner, and she didn't want Anakin to think of her in the same way. Not that he would, but it was just herself that believed this way. And while he had wanted to consummate their love, she had said she wasn't ready. The next time I have a chance, I will initiate that next step. Isla firmly resolved to herself about her future actions, while simultaneously blushing heavily. Isla. Barris called out to her as she was daydreaming about the special time she would share with Anakin, getting over her jealousy quite easily, forgotten so fast. Are you alright? Huh? Yes, yes. I am fine. Isla replied coming out of her daydream. There were reasons as to why Anakin had not gotten into her initiate relationship with either Barris or Shark at this point. Shark was still clinging onto the Jedi code, even though she has slowly been coming out from her shell and her isolationist attitude didn't help anything. Isla was fine with Anakin getting more girlfriends, as long as they were connected to him the same way he was connected to them through a dyad. She knew what it meant, and she knew how it happens without this. It meant he had no spiritual compatibility with another woman, and if he did and they were force sensitive, it should automatically happen. Of course those weren't the only factors as Barris and Shark wasn't immediately connected to him, so there were other things to take into account. At this she didn't mind sharing him, per se but she wouldn't accept him getting into a relationship with any woman not connected to him through this way. With Barris, she hadn't gotten into a special relationship with Anakin because she was still young. But now she has come to a certain age, she was becoming bolder. But she wouldn't take the next step because Barris believed she needed to reach a certain level first comparable to Anakin to be worthy. This was just silly thinking, but she wouldn't advance their relationship because of this. Isla wasn't going to help either of the two however, because this would take away from her time to spend with him, not that he didn't have time. The council by this point was especially in favor of Anakin being able to do whatever he wanted at this point, and while there was some mission they would get him to do because it was mandatory, they saw the benefit in him staying with the temple. Specifically when it came to teaching younglings, as he was a very good teacher capable of elevating the abilities of the younglings in a short amount of time. Well, what are you waiting for? Let's go get some practice in. Barris spoke to her. Okay, okay. They were both within the training room. Obi-Wan within his own ship, had finally discovered the planet that was taken off of the Jedi archives. He landed and entered through an entrance on this water-filled planet, in the middle of the night with his hood up covering himself from the rainy, thundering weather. Master Jedi, the Prime Minister is expecting you. A female Kaminan walked up to him as he entered and lowered his hood with a surprised look on his face. I am expected, Obi-Wan questioned. Of course. The woman replied. He is anxious to meet you. After all these years, we were beginning to think you weren't coming. Now, please. This way? The facilities and architecture was shaped in an oval shape, while being painted a bright white with lights that only increased the glaring look of purity. May I present Lama Su, Prime Minister of Kamino. The female Kaminan had brought him to the leader of her people. And this is Master Jedi Obi-Wan Kenobi. He finished for her. I trust you are going to enjoy your stay. Lama said to Obi-Wan, please. He gestured for Obi-Wan to take a seat as a seat slowly came down from the ceiling. And now to business. You will be delighted to hear that we are on schedule. 200,000 units are ready with a million more well on the way. That's good news. Obi-Wan replied with some confusion but decided to go along with what the minister said. Please tell your master Sifo Dias that his order will be met on time. Lama said. I'm sorry master, Obi-Wan said with a questioning tone. Jedi Master Sifo Dias is still a leading member of the Jedi Council, is he not? Lama questioned. Master Sifo Dias was killed almost 10 years ago. Obi-Wan replied. Oh, I am so sorry to hear that. Lama gave his condolences. But I am sure he would have been proud of the army we've built for him. The army. Yes, a clone army. And I must say one of the finest we've ever created. Tell me, Prime Minister, when my master first contacted you about the army did. He say who it was for. Obi-Wan questioned near stumbling on his words. Of course he did. This army is for the Republic. But you must be anxious to inspect the units for yourself. That's why I'm here. Anakin and Padme had gone to the retreat Padme had wanted to go to. We used to come here for school retreat. We would swim to that island every day. I love the water. Padme said as Anakin was following her lead side by side, taking them to a terrace of sorts overlooking the ocean. We used to lie out on the sand and let the sun dry us, and try to guess the names of the birds singing. She continued. That is quite nice. It is fortunate that you and your people get to afford such luxuries, as there are those who suffer much more in the galaxy. Anakin replied. I know of this, and wish to somehow help those in need. Padme said with some conviction. It is admirable and a trait I like within you to help those in need. 
but you cannot believe you are able to help absolutely everyone. You would exhaust yourself if you even tried. You can say, I have heard from some sources of your exploits throughout the galaxy, even starting from your time as a child. So you have been stalking me. Anakin lifted an eyebrow in response. W what? Why I would never. What do you take me for? Padme pouts a little here and looks away to hide her embarrassment. Well, even if you didn't stalk me, I am sure it was easy enough to find out things about me. Because I have been a public figure for quite some time now. Anakin continued giving her an out. Ah yes. That was what I meant to say. Anakin just smiled at her as she turned around and gazed into his eyes. I am sure. She was drawn in, and Padme decided, with no hesitation to grab him down to her level to kiss him before stopping herself. I am sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Padme turned away, embarrassed again at her actions rather than her words. Melody, I don't think I could ignore such an action. This could be misinterpreted as you having some kind of interest in me, and it makes me wonder when such thoughts had started to float into your head. Anakin said bringing her attention back to him. No, this was my fault. I shouldn't have done that because you have your vows, and I have my own duties. Don't apologize for something like this. Are you saying you regret your actions? Anakin questioned her. No, I mean, I wanted to do so. But I don't think a relationship between the two of us would work. Then you shouldn't have done something like this on impulse, Melody. You have opened the gates, and now you must accept the consequences to your actions. Anakin goes in and kisses her again, but only does so for a few passionate seconds as she clings to him. He shouldn't do this behind Isla or even any of the other girls' backs, and should at least inform Isla of what was happening. I think for now, that is enough. Anakin said as he looked into her eyes, and she looked into his before lowering her head with a blush on her checks, and the two would continue to ignore what had just happened. Back on Kamino, Obi-Wan was getting a grand tour of the facilities housing thousand upon thousands of clones. Very impressive, Obi-Wan said looking at his surroundings while trying to gain more information. I'd hoped you would be pleased. Lama said as he was a step behind Obi-Wan. Clones can think creatively. You will find that they are immensely superior to droids. We take great pride in our combat education and training programs. Looking over to some children of whom all look the same Lama continued. This group was created about five years ago. You mentioned growth acceleration. Obi-Wan said, curious about this subject. Oh, yes. It is essential. Otherwise a mature clone would take a lifetime to grow. Now we can do it in half the time. I see. You also shouldn't have to worry about their lifespan as it would have been a problem a few years ago. But due to some external factors and recent discovers as of the current situation, we were able to introduce a virus specifically made to make sure these clones are able to live longer. Lama, Sue said. Someone was kind enough and generous enough to make a donation so as to make sure these clones don't die young if they managed to survive being killed within a battlefield, which would be highly unlikely because of our combat education and training. Lama continued, They are totally obedient taking an order without question. We modified their genetic structure to make them less independent than their original host. Lama continued, And who was the original host? Obi-Wan questioned, A bounty hunter named Jango Fat. Lama answered, And where is this bounty hunter now? Oh, we keep him here, apart from his pay, which is considerable. Fat demanded only one thing, an unaltered clone of himself. Lama replied, Unaltered. Curious, isn't it? Pure genetic replication. No tampering with the structure to make it more docile and no growth acceleration. I should very much like to meet this Django Fett, Obi-Wan said towards Lama, but the woman behind him answered instead, I would be very happy to arrange it for you. After coming to the end of their journey, they stop at a balcony that overlooks the fully grown and matured clone army. They seem to be highly trained and were marching with perfect unity, creating an impressive feat and display of their militaristic order. Magnificent, aren't they? Lama said as he gazed at the creation he had helped build. Wait a minute, you said something about a benefactor. That donated a generous sum to just make sure the clones are able to live through their proper lifespans. Did you not? Obi-Wan questioned, curious about who this person was. I am afraid that if you wish to know of this person, you are unable to find out. It was an anonymous benefactor. Lama replied. I am sure that you would be able to tell me. Obi-Wan did a Jedi mind trick on both the female Kaminan and on Lama Su himself. I am not able to tell you. We do not know who donated the money, but I am able to tell you of another person we have been working on a spirit project with. Lama said, tell me. Obi-Wan continued to use the Jedi mind trick. It was the military general from the Emperor named Vader. Why would the Emperor want to work with you guys? Obi-Wan was interested as this may connect to the matter of the bounty hunter and this clone army. We assume that the Emperor wants an army of its own and have been working on creating synthetic humans through genetic modification. Lama said before continuing, We needed someone else we could make deals with, but the clone army and the synthetics being made for the Emperor our spirit matter altogether. Thank you, that is all I needed to know. While it was strange for the Emperor to want more people, that didn't mean it was connected to any other matter, because the Emperor so far has not broken their agreement with the Republic. They also hadn't joined the Sis, so this piece of information doesn't matter. What Obi-Wan failed to miss however, was that the Emperor were creating life as well. Just like the clones, and they were only starting to be made very recently, which coincides with the development of how clones would be able to live their natural lifespans even with the use of the growth accelerant. Padme had invited Anakin out to a picnic that would have them in a romantic setting. Obviously she knew what she was doing, but was somewhat hesitant to take whatever next step there was. I don't know. You do. Anakin stated simply. Well, yes, but I believe that it would be unfair to compare them to you. Padme was referring to the only other person she had developed a crush on. I have only had eyes on you for the past few years, ever since I had laid my eyes on you. 
I dash she stopped becoming shy. Moving on to another subject, Padme begins. How do you feel about politicians? Well, considering that I have to be like a politician myself, I guess that I like myself and that is it. Anakin answered. Is there no one else? Padme asks a bit hopeful. Perhaps. Anakin looks at Padme in a meaningful way, before moving the conversation along. Do you think the system works? I am of course referring to the democracy of the Republic. Is there something wrong with it? Is there some way you would have it work instead? She questioned him, curious because he does have a background that would put him in many situations that could get political. Well, from my experience, or at least from what I've gathered, is that the system works best when the people in positions of power figure out the root cause of a problem, and come up with a solution to fix it. Then they should complete what they have said. Anakin answers. He continued. I have seen it work best. In fact within the Emperor, of course there is no bias. Padme rolls her eyes here. There is, I admit, but at least things are resolved, fixed or completed in some shape or form that benefits the people. Anakin replies thinking about all the hard work he has put into building up his empire. The Republic does exactly what you had described. Padme starts. The trouble is that people don't always agree. Luckily enough, my mother is there to have the final say. Anakin says. Yes, she is very wise, a very good and capable leader. Padme smiles thinking about Shmai. Yeah. I have heard something about how you and my mother are quite the good friends. The best of friends in fact. Anakin smiles teasing her. Well we sort have a long standing communication between the two of us. It would seem that you have met my parent, then is it my turn to met yours? Anakin looks at her with a smirk. Stop. She cutely smiles and turns away now shy. Both Anakin and Padme when then go on to enjoy the rest of their day just having a fun time. And of course, Anakin had called back in to inform Isla of the potential between the both of them. Isla was upset with this, but accepted it nonetheless. Because he had said, no, promised to make sure Padme would be able to become connected to him through a dyad. How he would do this, he had no way of knowing how. But now that he has promised his lover, he would have to do it. There were two reasons for doing so. First he really liked Padme, second he really loved Isla, so he would do so. Instead of continuing to create a romantic atmosphere, Anakin had decided that it was best to continue to plant the seeds within Padme of doubt. Doubt of the Republic and their capabilities to be good for the people. It was already starting to crumble from within starting from a long time ago. And one could argue it started with the Republic deciding that Coruscant was to be the capital. It had a whole hidden Sith temple beneath it radiating corrupting dark side energies. That if one doesn't have enough control over themselves, they would lose themselves to its influence. She was slowly changing her mind, and sooner or later he may be able to get her to become a part of his own Emperor. But this time she would become his Emperor's representative instead of Naboo. Not that he would abandon Naboo because it was such a close star system to his own expanding empire. It would be remiss of him to not try and have his mother bring them under their banners. This would signal something within the Republic, but it would also ensure that Padme would not be afraid of their relationship anymore, because her worries lied in their differing paths. He wouldn't tell her now that he plans to leave the Order, but within the coming days he would reveal this to her. She may not instantly agree to whatever relationship he would start with her, because it would be secret for a while. But there would be those who could help carry this burden. As had Isla been safe in the knowledge she didn't have to hide her relationship with him while around Ahsoka, Barris and Shark. Of course, he would also have to reveal his small, tiny problem of having many lovers to be in the future. But he was sure he could convince her, maybe. If she doesn't agree to his selfishness, then he could only let her go. Because he didn't want to waste any more energy into seducing her. He wasn't willing to give up what he already had for something else. That was just not within his nature. While an epic confrontation between Jango Fett and Obi-Wan was happening as Fett tried to escape and successfully did so, there were some interesting developments going on within the Emperor. Specifically the creation, construction and activation of the Stargate, as Anakin had called them as an homage to that series. While using in combination the Infinity Gate Qua Engineering, alongside Bree Hypergate Engineering, he had successfully created his own teleportation devices. That didn't need an exuberant amount of energy. A Stargate had been completed on Tatrine, and a will and only colony worlds, connected to Anakin's growing empire. This speed up trade between planets, and will significantly decrease costs in the long term. While within the short term he had to spend a fortune, he used his money wealth to do so, otherwise he would have had to increase the tax of his people. He had more than enough money as is, so why even bother trying to do so, which would only increase dissatisfaction. He had them constructed at various cities or settlements on all planets. That had some relevance as creating more than a few on each planet for absolutely every area is not conducive to his plans, or even all that great for the people. Now with fully operational portals, trade and transportation for people would become a whole lot easier. There were other things that he had started to get to work on. One thing in particular was the Death Star plans that he had acquired for himself. Not that he wanted to destroy some planets, but it might come in handy in the Star Forge. Just as he had combined the technologies of two ancient civilizations surrounding teleportation, he wanted to work on combining the Death Star blueprints along with the remnants of the Star Forge. Well, maybe I shouldn't do that. Anakin had no particular need for something like this. But he did have a need for the Star Forge and still fully intended to recreate it for himself. He had both the power and techniques necessary to maintaining his absolute dominance over the thing Inc. as it tried to re-establish its semi-sentience. Another thing happening on his star systems was the now standardized Emperor Serum. He had taken to calling it the Emperor Serum as it relates to those within his empire and to him being the creator of this bio-engineered chromosome. After stabilizing it some more to make sure there are not even any temporary side effects, like the ones he had experienced or even the prisoner that had been tested on, he started giving it out for free. Unfortunately he had no way to make sure it was passed down properly, which would mean and does mean that everyone would have to inject it once in their life 
instead of being able to just have it at birth. This basically revolutionized the medical sector and made most of the current science useless, because this fundamentally changed what the health sector was about. It was the preservation of life, the curing of viruses and diseases, and a whole bunch of other things. Through his serum most people wouldn't have to worry about viruses or diseases ever again, at least they didn't have to worry about the common or rarer problems. Genetic mutations would also be a thing of the past, at least mutations that were negative in some manner, because the chromosome would automatically fix any problems. This would basically increase the people's freedoms to participate in behavior that would be unseemly. Meaning incest, as when it came to children between two people whom are closely related to each other, there would be big problems for any progeny between the two. This simply got rid of the problem, since the mother, father and child could be injected with the serum to fix any genetic disaster that occurs, and as a result, some of the laws needed changing. Now while this now be true, that didn't mean people still didn't feel some type of way about this. Thankfully there is a lot of research that Anakin had his scientists publish in support of his serum and its effects, explaining to everyone the benefits of it. Naturally it wasn't under his name, but under a subsidiary of Skywalker Industries, which had become a widely known and accepted company within the Emperor. They loved it even more because of this. And of course he didn't just create this serum for humans, but other species as well. First he had to slowly go through who was higher in population within his empire, and slowly go down the list. At the top was obviously humans, but after that were various other species, specifically Twi'leks because they are people mostly enslaved but freed in the Emperor. Another thing he probably forgot to mention was the fact he had given his mother immortality as well. Through the use of midi-chlorine manipulation she will now live forever, or at least it is projected she would because she could always die some other way. Anakin would of course try to stop it, but if it happens it happens, and that is why he was also busy trying to complete his own dimension within the Force. Doing so he would be able to control the life, death and even souls of the dead of even living biological base beings, rather than just his droids. He was not only possessive over his women, he was also possessive of his mother. Of course if she didn't want to stay within the living world anymore, he would let her go, reluctantly. It would be her choice in the end after all. But from he could tell, she wouldn't die unless he did. Obi-Wan was following both Jango and his son within his own cruiser. An epic chase between the hunter and the hunted was going on, and Obi-Wan wasn't always the hunter. In fact he was becoming the hunted himself, once remarking that this is exactly why he doesn't like flying. Boba seemed to be having some fun, while Jango and his son both believed they had finished Obi-Wan off from a distance. Feeling secure they went down to the planet they were fighting over and landed within of the modules below. Obi-Wan finally taking this as his chance descends onto the planet he had traveled to. It was known as Geonosis a star system so close to Tatooine. It could be considered as the closest neighbor, in fact some smaller trade deals, went through the hyperspace lanes connecting the two. The Emperors may have rejected joining the Sis, but that doesn't mean they were against building some form of relationship with them. In the future Anakin may very well be able to start inducting them into his empire. Anakin also plans to make sure the Sis, instead of being a pawn within Palpatine's design, he would turn it against him. It would become a buffer between his growing empire and Palpatine's empire, all but a name, yet to be created. Then there is Tyrannus. Anakin knew that sooner or later Tyrannus would start to doubt the legitimacy of Palpatine and his plans, which would make it all the more easier for himself to convince the man otherwise. Geonosis was similar in its biomass to Tatrine. It was a sprawling mass of red sandy dunes, with buildings built into the planet. There were very hilly and mountainous terrain scattered throughout the dunes, making it extremely hard to traverse. Dome-like structures popped up everyone similar in looks to Anakin's own biospheres, but his were actually good habitats to live within. Obi-Wan had spotted a lot of Trade Federation ships on the planet, and landed within a safe distance of any civilization. After a short but what felt like was a long journey, Obi-Wan had made it to a crevice of some sort, and he entered. He followed the noises which only continued to grow and grow, as he came closer to an edge. Looking over he sees droids. Lots of droids being made down below, deep within the planet's crust. We must persuade the Commerce Guild, Corporate Alliance and the Emperor to sign the treaty. A voice was heard below. What about the Senator from Naboo? A voice spoke, which sounded familiar to Obi-Wan as he had gotten close enough while hiding himself away to remain unseen. Is she dead yet? I am not signing your treaty until I have her head on my desk. A man, leading the group spoke. I am sorry to say. But it would seem that the senator from Naboo has some form of connection to one of the most important people we wish to sign the treaty. Preposterous, who is more important? The familiar voice was Newt Gunray, the viceroy of the Trade Federation. You best believe that I will not be sending any more assassins to take the life of the senator. I am afraid it would greatly upset the emperor. The man replied firmly. Damn it, those stupid emperors Newt Gunray muttered under his breath, not acknowledging or going against what the man had said. With these new battle droids we've built you, you'll have the finest army in the galaxy. Even though we had been behind in production, we should still have more than enough. Another deep voice entered the conversation, as the Viceroy had wisely shut up knowing the actual strength the Emperor has, and its growing power. Now within another room, the people had come to a stop, and their discussion was in full swing. As I explained to you earlier, I am quite convinced that 10,000 more systems will rally to a cause with your support, gentlemen. It was Count Dooku, otherwise now known as Darth Tyrannus, former Jedi Master and Councilman. What you are proposing could be construed as treason. An alien with an alien language spoke. The Techno Union Army is at your disposal, Count. An alien cyborg spoke. The banking clan will sign your treaty. Another alien within the room agreed. Good, very good, Dooku replied. Our friends from the Trade Federation have pledged their support, and when the battle droids are combined with yours, we shall have an army greater than any in the galaxy. The Jedi will be overwhelmed. Dooku continued, the Republic will agree to any demands we make. What of the Emperor then? The Viceroy just had to ask. 
Yes, I do believe that we will not be able to coerce them into signing the treaty with us. But I have not been completely blocked from interacting with them. In fact, some small trade agreements have still gone through. Dilku explained to everyone because they feared that empire in particular despite it being relatively new. It had a lot of power. What everyone was mostly thankful for was their somewhat peaceful nature, which only made less dangerous within everyone's eyes. That didn't mean however that they could mess with it. So will they become a part of the CIS? The Cybergalian asked. No, but a separate treaty could be made with them and depending on the situation, they may even abandon their relationship with the Republic completely and become allied with us. Doku said, we all just have to make the right calls and decisions when dealing with them. Anakin was having nightmares, the same nightmares that the original was having, but he knew this was just an after effect of the changes to the timeline brought by him. A shadow of what the universe could have been if he had not changed the process, which lead to a completely different outcome. This was also a test, a test of his willpower, something that would be continually tested whether or not he likes it, because he also still worries for his mother just like the original. How could he not? He loves her. He didn't show this side to Padme however, and wasn't disturbed in his meditation sessions, as he had next no need for sleep anymore, and it only became something for enjoyment. He still practiced meditation though, and this was the only time the Force could try and mess with him. The annoyance aside, he was fully aware of what was happening with Shmai, and knew she was completely safe. He also reminisced about what would have happened had she died like the original. Thinking about, he no doubt would have unleashed his wrath upon everything within the Tusken Raiders camp, because of his pain. He would do so because she is his mother. There was no possibility of this happening, especially after he had made them see him as their god. The Tuskens throughout Tatooine have become civilized in a manner, but that was only because of their fear and respect for him. He also guesses that the constant propaganda from his droids and the faith or religion created contributes to this fact as well. But this only benefits him, so he isn't complaining. When will you stop bugging me? I have put in a lot of effort to make sure I remain balanced within your energies Anakin thought to himself, but projected to the Force, and as usual, it didn't give him an answer. Coruscant's too far. Ah, for can you boost the power? Obi-Wan spoke to his droid wanting to connect with the Jedi Council back on Coruscant. The droid communicates with Obi-Wan, saying that there was no way. We will have to try something else. He gets onto his ship and says more to himself than to the droid. Maybe we could contact Anakin on Naboo. It's much closer. The relationship between Obi-Wan and Anakin wasn't that hard to comprehend or even that strange at all. In a sense they are like brothers where they were trained under the same master. Even more so their relationship was sort of close because of some missions that had been tasked to go on. However there was at some point some contention between the two as Anakin was elevated to the rank of master before him. While Obi-Wan knew rationally it made sense, he did still have his own pride and didn't want to be surpassed so easily. Anakin was able to calm him down however, and it is not like Obi-Wan was all the emotional himself, not even counting the fact he was very patient. So in the end the two were friends at the very least, maybe even having brotherly relations, given that Anakin was willing to allow Obi-Wan to use his training room every so often. Of course, the girls would not be present when he was allowed, but he was allowed nonetheless. Anakin knew that no matter what happened in the future, Obi-Wan would always survive unless he encountered himself, as there was no way he would survive if he decided to go after him. Anakin, Anakin, do you copy? This is Obi-Wan Kenobi. He spoke into the ship. Being that he is on Naboo, Anakin did respond. Yes, Obi-Wan, I do copy. That is a relief. I have some vital information that I want to pass on to the Jedi Council on Coruscant. Obi-Wan says using the ship's built-in communications device. My long-range transmitter has been knocked out. That is quite unfortunate. Anakin replied. You should retransmit this message to Coruscant. Obi-Wan continued. Anakin started the recording device to send it back to those on Coruscant within the Jedi cruiser ship provided to him. I have tracked the bounty hunter, Jango Fett to the droid foundries on Geonosis. The Trade Federation is to take delivery of a droid army here. And it is clear that Viceroy Gunray is behind the assassination attempt of Senator Amidala. The message continued to play and was transmitted to the Jedi on Coruscant, whom were all within the Supreme Chancellor's office. While the Emperor seems to have not gotten into any type of deal with the Sis, the Commerce Guilds and the Corporate Alliance have both pledged their armies to Count Dooku and are forming a wait. What is wrong, Obi-Wan? Anakin knew exactly what was wrong, but he just had to say this anyway, as it was a message being recorded in real time rather than being replayed. Obi-Wan ignited his lightsaber on the recording as the people within Palpatine's room heard the conversation between Anakin and Obi-Wan. He started to deflect energy-dense shots sent his way as a Dredika was seen coming into the holographic frame. The message ended here with Anakin only ever saying one line. More happening on Geonosis, I feel, than has been revealed. Yoda spoke as Anakin was still in call with the council after the message ended. Mace looking at Yoda, said, I agree. He looks towards the transmission device and continues, Anakin, I would have liked for you meet up with us on Geonosis, but you still have a much more important job as it is right now. You must protect the Senator at all costs. That should be your first priority. Understood, Master. Anakin just agrees with what Mace said, but knows that if he didn't make a move now, Obi-Wan could die. While Obi-Wan was immune to dying most of the time simply because he was meant to be someone of importance. It was him messing with the timeline, that the Force had to make adjustments to its already created plan. The message went out as Padme came from behind him, but he always knew she was standing there with him on the ship, and just decided to not point it out. They'll never get there on time to save him. They have to come halfway across the galaxy. Look, Padme knowing her way around a ship easily accesses the ship's interface and pulls up a map. 
Geonosis is actually quite close to Naboo, and it was quite recent when we received the message meaning we have time to go there. It is on the hyperspace lanes connected to Tatrine, which would make it all the more easier for us to go through with your status out there. Padme's presence is probably a guaranteed thing to happen. While Anakin didn't want to exactly look after her and knew he didn't need to do so because she can handle herself, that doesn't mean it was safe to go. We would take about half the time to get there than the Jedi. Padme said to him and had this look in her eye to dare him to say she wasn't coming or that he wasn't going to rescue Obi-Wan. Well, Master Windu was one of my masters, and in fact he was quite a good one. It would be disappointing to him if I just straight up ignored his orders. Anakin was baiting Padme to give him an excuse, but she didn't seem to catch on. Arnie, are you just going to sit here and let him die? He is your friend, someone you have trained together with, yes. I was given strict orders to protect you, Padme. Anakin was trying his best here to make her catch on, but she was as dense as a brick. That was until it clicked within her mind. Wait. She shouted before continuing. He gave you strict orders to protect me. She was mumbling to herself before she had a eureka moment. That is right. He gave you strict orders to protect me. Now you catch on. Anakin smiles whilst rolling his eyes. I guess that means that if you are protecting me, you would need to follow me to wherever I go. And if it just so happens to be in Obi-Wan's direction, Padme continues. Yes, I would have to follow you. Anakin confirms. Anakin gets into the pilot seat as Padme hops right into the other side, beginning to stand up the ship as R2 is there along with them. Anakin decided to use Mekudero only temporarily so on the spacecraft to speed up their journey by using the Force. Back on Geonosis, Count Dooku was making his appearance, entering the room that Obi-Wan was being confined to. Obi-Wan speaks the first word on his mind. Trader. Oh, no, my friend. This is a mistake a terrible mistake. They have gone too far. This is madness. Dooku replied as he watched Obi-Wan being contained within some technology that held him perfectly in place. I thought you were the leader here, Dooku. Obi-Wan said, this has nothing to do with me, I assure you. I will petition immediately to have you set free. Dooku replied taking the diplomatic approach. Well, I hope it doesn't take too long. I have work to do. Obi-Wan sarcastically replies. Dooku, ignoring this continues. May I ask why a Jedi Knight is all the way out here on Geonosis? I have been tracking a bounty hunter named Jango Fett. Do you know him? There are no bounty hunters here that I am aware of. The Geonosians don't trust them. Who can blame them? But he is here, I can assure you. It's a great pity our paths have never crossed before Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon always did speak very highly of you. It is unfortunate that I have been unable to make contact with him as he has been holed up on Coruscant for quite some time now. I could use his help right about now. Dooku seemed melancholic, but he was at least still happy that his former apprentice had survived the encounter with Maul. Master Qui-Gon would never join you. Obi-Wan replied confident that he would never. Don't be so sure, my young Jedi. You forget that he was once my apprentice just as you were once his. In fact, I have heard that he had taken on the Chosen One as his new apprentice. Dooku said while circling the currently imprisoned Obi-Wan. He knows all about the corruption in the Senate, but he would never have gone along with it if he had learned the truth as I have. Dooku explained. The truth. The truth. Dooku pauses as he waits to build effect. Silence before the explosion or storm always grabs your attention more so than the explosion that is covered by the overarching sounds from other things. What if I told you that the Republic was now currently under the control of the Dark Lord of the Sith? Dooku continued. No, that is not possible. The Jedi would be aware of it. Obi-Wan denies Dooku's statement. The dark side of the Force has clouded their vision, my friend. Hundreds of senators are now under the influence of a Sith Lord called Darth Sidious. Dooku finishes explaining. I don't believe you. Obi-Wan is still in denial of his statement. The Viceroy of the Trade Federation was once in league with this Darth Sidious. But he was betrayed 10 years ago by the Dark Lord. He came to me for help. He told me everything. Dooku then continued his pitch. You must join me, Obi-Wan, and together we will destroy the Sith. Dooku was very passionate about this as even though he was withholding a lot of information, there was these thoughts within Dooku's mind that he would be able to destroy Sidious if he just had some assistance. I will never join you, Dooku. Obi-Wan simply stated in response. Dooku just turned around and started to walk away before turning around one last time and looking at Obi-Wan. It may be difficult to secure your release. He said with some pettiness. Back on Coruscant an emergency meeting is taking place and Jar Jar, ever the fool was taking the stands and proclaiming and posturing to the crowd of senators, officials and dignitaries. It's a clear Deza Separatists made a pact Wisa Deza Federation due trade. Senators, Delo Felagates in response to this direct threat to the Republic Mesa purpose. That the Senate give immediately emergency powers to the Supreme Chancellor. Jar Jar had not really made a compelling speech. But his gestures and contents of his speech seemed to be enough to sway the crowd. Everyone started to cheer and went into a semi-frenzy of chanting Palpatine's name before some order had to be called to settle everyone down. Standing up, Palpatine begins his own speech. It is with great reluctance that I have agreed to this calling. I love democracy. I love the Republic. He says with such an innocent look for an old man corrupt in power. The power you give me I will lay down when this crisis is abated. The crowd cheers and claps at his miniature speech, not prepared or planned out by his design at all, of course. And as my first act with this new authority, I will create a grand army of the Republic to counter the increasing threats of the Separatists. The crowd has some mixed reactions but mostly it seems to be positive. It is done then. May spoke as he was present to see the meeting happen live, just as Master Yoda was also there right next to him. Yoda just hums in agreement before looking back towards the Supreme Chancellor. I will take what Jedi we have left and go to Geonosis and help Obi-Wan. Mace continued. Visit. I will. The cloners on Kamino and see this army they have created for the Republic. We meet back up with Anakin, Padme and R2. 
who have now made it to Geonosis in record time. I didn't know Jedi cruisers could go this fast. Padme exclaimed in surprise. They were cruising just above the surface on Geonosis, and Anakin was just silent, knowing that he had messed a little bit with the ship to make it go faster. See those columns of steam just ahead. There are exhaust vents of some type. Padme spoke to Anakin telling him of the terrain and potential spots to land. That will do nicely. Anakin pilots the ship to land within them to make sure the ship stays hidden. After landing, Padme decided to take the leading role. Look, whatever happens out there, follow my lead. I'm not interested in getting into a war here. As a member of the Senate, maybe I can find a diplomatic solution to this mess. Whatever you say, just know that I won't be helping you in negotiations if you're gonna be like that. Anakin replies. And what does that mean exactly? Padme asks as they exit the ship leaving behind R2. It means that my aggressive negotiations won't be coming in handy here. Anakin replied. And what exactly does aggressive negotiations mean? Padme asked confused and it showed on her face. Negotiations with a lightsaber. Anakin replies as they enter through an entranceway. They both continue to enter through various hallways with Anakin taking point. But even if he does, he allows Padme to point out in which direction they should go. Because it was all random. He could just go directly to where Obi-Wan was. But where was the fun in that? No, he wanted to make sure Padme knew that sometimes her peaceful negotiations don't work. It would take a lot more than this however to change her mind however, as she is quite stubborn. Whirling through the area, they come across a Geonosian's nesting hive. Anakin knows this but keeps quiet as they both continue walking before he gestures. Wait. In doing so, one of them attack rightfully so. But Anakin doesn't exactly want to kill some random worker, just because they went down the wrong path. Especially when he knew where they needed to go. So he just incapacitates any of the Geonosians that come towards him or Padme through the force or pure and controlled physical force. An entire chase sequence would happen if Anakin wanted to waste time. But he didn't as he just used the force to help himself and Padme get to a safer area. He knocked out those in his way before both of them were surrounded by Dradikas and Jango Fett coming down to lock them up. All according to plan of course. He thought to himself, don't move Jedi. Jango pointed his blaster at Anakin and Anakin gave up just as Padme surrendered as well. Within a Colosseum, Anakin and Padme were restrained together within a small room that had an entrance and exit going outwards. They were both placed in a small vehicle that would be pulled along by some alien fauna. Geonosians had tied them up and were currently doing other things to prepare them for what would happen next while others were just around to guard them. Don't be afraid, we will both be fine. Anakin said as he glances at Padme. I'm not afraid to die. She responds. Staring into his eyes, she continues. I have been conflicted ever since you have come back into my life. It feels as if I was dying having seen you again, and I wouldn't have it any other way just so that I could be with you. Anakin then asks, Padme, what do you mean? He had an idea what she meant, but still wanted her to tell him, just like what had originally happened. She just stares into his violet eyes, and if Anakin could describe the way she was looking at him, it would be with hearts and eyes. I love you. Well, that was quick, but it was just as fast as it originally happened. Anakin thought to himself before saying, did you not say that we shouldn't? Where is your restraint now? Seeing as we are in quite the heap of trouble, I thought that it would be prudent that I shared my feelings with you. Padme said, I don't want to regret things even in my death. Padme comes close leaning in with her head seemingly wanting something. At least she knows what she wants when her life is on the line. He thought to himself as he obliged her feelings by also leaning in and kissing her. As they engage within this intimate moment, their carriage is drawn out towards the Colosseum, where they would be fighting for their lives. Their kiss ends before they could be fully outside of this place. There were a few reasons Anakin wanted things to happen the same or similar to the original, and this was one of the reasons. He knew that without some form of pressure making Padme reflect inwardly, she would never admit to herself her feelings. And even if she did, she would never act upon them. Now that she has, it would become all that more easier to have her become his. He of course had to deal with the problem that she wasn't connected to him through a diet for the sake of Isla. And he had to do so through making her force sensitive first. There were a few ways, but the way he had done for Grievous wouldn't work because of the nature of his transformation. The second reason for following the normal events was because of the force itself, and while he disliked the idea of people dying just because the force wanted balance, it was currently not within his power to stop it permanently. If he somehow managed to save a lot of the Jedi that would die today, the force would react in a manner that could try and harm him and others in some manner. Despite being the chosen one he was not immune to being metaphorically spanked. He has purposely not done anything to subvert the design of the force. But that doesn't mean he could persuade it from taking the lives of everyone within the Jedi. It was becoming increasingly easier to change the minds of younglings through his teachings. They would become similar to Grey Jedi themselves. Wait a minute, now that I think about it, the name of Grey Jedi doesn't really suit me. Anakin thought to himself as he looked outwards towards the thousands of Geonosians here to see what would take place. Anakin and Padme were escorted to some large pillars that would be used to chain them as Anakin also saw Obi-Wan chained up as well. Anakin, did you even transmit my message? Or did you come here just like this? Obi-Wan questioned him with some disbelief on his face. Yeah, sorry about that. You see the senator here, she was adamant in coming here. We were coming here to save you. Or at least that was what we were here to do. Anakin replied as he was chained up. Good job. Obi-Wan says in response to Anakin's explanation. On the main terrace and balcony, 
The Geonosian leader alongside Duku and the other beings that had been here for the signing of the treaty were present. Settle down, settle down. The Geonosian leader spoke in his native tongue to all of those within the crowd as Duku looks down and sees a problem. Wait, when did those two get here? Duku thought within his mind as the political situation would be very complicated if either Anakin or Padme were to die here. He didn't sense them coming here and wasn't told of their arrival at all. It would seem that they believed themselves to be above me. Duku continued to think to himself. Let the execute dash the Geonosian leader was about to continue before being interrupted by Duku. Excuse me. But I believe that you should bring the younger man along with the woman away from the arena. What do you mean? They are intruders trespassers on our land. The leader responded as the crowd had quieted down awaiting the beginning of the games. That may be so. But the young man over there is the prince of the emperor and while the woman is a close ally aligned with them. It would be remiss of us to kill them. We would be in deep trouble. Duku tried to provide his counsel. Don't mind what Duku says. Just execute them both. Newt Gunray. The viceroy said before Duku could convince the Geonosian leader. That what he was doing is probably wrong. No, I would dash Duku was cut off as the Geonosian leader continued himself. Let the executions begin. The leader spoke in his native tongue. This will not end well. I hope that those two will survive. Duku thought within his head and in fact wanted more than just Anakin and Padme to survive because of the political situation, but also wanted Obi-Wan to survive as well. He was after all technically his grand student. The Geonosian crowd goes wild as they can finally take part and witness the expected gruesome fight to the death to come. Gates open around the arena the two Jedi and Senator were placed in giving way to multiple alien creatures. One could be identified as a Reek, and if Anakin had to make a comparison, it was similar in stature to a rhino from his previous life. Another was an Aklay, which looked similar to a Mantis, while the last creature was a Nexu, a feline-like creature with an abnormally large head. Back with Obi-Wan, Padme and Anakin, Anakin said, Hey Obi-Wan, don't you have some sort of negative feeling about our current situation? Negative feeling? Of course I have a bad feeling about this. Obi-Wan said in exasperation. That is what I wanted to hear. Anakin said not really explaining why as he had a small smirk on his face. Obi-Wan was just confused, but started to concentrate on the Mantis-like creature approaching him. Anakin, you seem a bit too relaxed. Obi-Wan questioned Anakin as Padme was getting her self-freed, and had successfully done so. Yes, it would seem that Padme is currently on top of things. Anakin said as she was climbing the pillar with really good agility. Yes, I am starting to believe that she doesn't need your protection at all. Obi-Wan said, impressed with Padme's skills. While Obi-Wan was dealing with his Akle, Anakin had to deal with the Reek which was starting to run towards him. He easily broke off his restraints with pure physical force and decided to hop on the Reek's back before using the force to subdue the beast and turn it into his temporary companion. The Nexu going towards Padme had to be dealt with as Anakin didn't want her to be hurt, so he used the Reek to bum rush the feline-like creature. Padme safe atop the pillar just sat there while watching this all happen. The Viceroy was unhappy that Padme was not suffering and that Anakin had helped her out. He can't do that, shoot the Senator. I want her dead. Obi-Wan was still dodging the Mantis, as it even went so far as to destroy the pillar he was chained to, showing just how much physical strength it had. Anakin didn't immediately kill the beast and also took it under his control as well, as it would come in handy for the battle to come. Jump down. I will catch you. Anakin called up to Padme as she then jumped down landing safely into his arms, instead of right behind him like the original. The beast they were on wasn't exactly the softest, and it would surely hurt her nether regions if she were to do so. Putting her down so she was seated behind him, Anakin received a quick kiss to his check by her, before settling on board the Reek. The Nexu, now tamed through the force along with the Reek, followed along Anakin and Padme as they went towards Obi-Wan, picking him up on the Reek, they all started to walk around the arena while on board the Reek. This isn't how it was supposed to be. The Viceroy was complaining, then turned towards the bounty hunter. Django, finish her off. Mr. Fett, it would be wise of you to ignore the Viceroy's order. Dooku said as he then turned to the Viceroy. Viceroy, if anything is to happen to the two, if either of them even gain a scratch, it will be you who will deal with the consequences. It would seem that the Viceroy was informed of their arrival instead of myself. Since he wants to be like this and jeopardize the security and safety of the newly formed sis. I do not mind giving him over to the Emperor. And Dooku thought to himself about the actions of Newt Gunray. The Akle was still alive, so Anakin decided to try and take control over it as well. Temporary control that would make the beast subservient to him, just like with the Reek and Nexu. Tradikas roll out from an entrance to the arena now surrounding the three who are on the Reek. While this was happening a figure was coming in from behind the important figures on the terrace, overwatching the events taking place. A purple saber was ignited right in front of the unsuspecting Django, as Mace Windu had now made his appearance. Turning around, Dooku says upon seeing the person behind them. Master Windu, how pleasant of you to join us. This party's over. Mace said as all around the edges of the arena, multiple Jedi were seen. Even Isla, Shark and Barris were there with them, and all three of them had their eyes on Anakin, who was being hugged from behind by the beautiful senator. Chaos ensued all over as Dooku was now confronted by Mace. Brave, but foolish, my old Jedi friend. You're impossibly outnumbered, really. From what I can tell, it would seem that we aren't. Mace responded, leaving the order seems to have affected your judgment. Dooku only smiles before saying, we'll see. 
Battle droids made their approach as Mace had to fend them off, while Dooku along with the rest, were making their escape. Droids thousands upon thousands of them were pouring into the arena as Mace was forced into it alongside all the other Jedi. Anakin had actually stored away his lightsabers using his nano suit, a function like this had existed, so that he wouldn't happen to lose his lightsaber in case of being captured, which was very unlikely to happen. But it was quite handy nonetheless in situations like this, where he had to hide away any form of weapon he might have. The Jedi were disorganized and all going about their own thing, as droids kept pouring in even when the Jedi were successfully taking down quite a few, but it was not enough. The Geonosians within the arena had all escaped by now, and only the stragglers were left to try and escape themselves. Padme was sticking close to Anakin as Isla, Shark and Barris were slowly making their way towards Anakin as well. Instead of joining in on the battle, Jango just stayed behind with Dooku, as Dooku had commanded him to do so. The animals Anakin had under his control were guided safely outside of this arena to live their lives safely as wild animals. He had no need for them anymore, except for them to make some trouble for the droids as they escaped. Having gotten some cover, Anakin talks to Padme. Is this the diplomatic solution you were talking about? It would seem that I am forced to use some more aggressive tactics. Well, yes. I would call what we are doing aggressive negotiations of course. Padme replied. Slowly but surely the Jedi were being massacred left, right and center, because it seemed as if there was no end to the battle droids. Many of the Jedi had been killed. It was a massacre. Shark had made her way into the center, and moved herself closer to Anakin, where Barris and Isla were nowhere to be seen, likely pulled back from the engagement. Arnie, what the hell are you doing with Dash Shark whispered to him as Padme was close by. Use telepathy. Anakin sent a telepathic message to Shark, as in this moment of stress, she seemed to forget about some of their diet's benefits. Dooku's voice was heard as the droids came to a stop. Master Windu, you have fought gallantly, worthy of recognition in the archives of the Jedi Order. Isla along with other remaining Jedi, which were not much, had also been guided to the center of the arena. Anakin knew Barris as fine as he was connected to her, and because of this connection, Isla and Shark can also inadvertently sense this as well. Isla coming into the center made her way over to Anakin as well but did so discreetly while talking to him through their link. It would seem you have been enjoying your time together with the Senator Anakin wisely decided not to respond. Now, it is finished. Dooku's voice still called out. Surrender and your lives will be spared. Dooku had made sure to set the droids to stun, if they had any capabilities to stun when targeting Anakin or Padme, because of reasons mentioned before. We will not be hostages to be bartered with, Dooku. Mace replied out loud. Then, I am sorry old friend. Dooku replied as the droids were now getting ready to blast them all to oblivion come. A strange fact however was that Anakin had actually saved more Jedi than what would have originally survived, as even though he didn't want to fix the Jedi Order's problems. That didn't mean he could save a few extra good people. The circle made up more than just a few remaining, surviving Jedi. But it was still obviously not enough to completely change the situation around. Look, Padme being the first to react amongst a group of four sensitive people, said something about how dull their senses were, but of course, this was excluding Anakin, Isla and Shark, as he had already told them about who was coming. Everyone looked upward seeing the unexpected arrival of Yoda, who was in a ship piloted and armed by clone troopers. The battle began again as they were using flawed tactics, but it was winning them the battle, as it has been reignited with renewed vigor. The ships being piloted by clones created a perimeter around the Jedi, plus the Senator to better protect them from the droids. Everyone had gotten onto the ships as they landed, in particular however was that where Anakin went, Shark and Isla followed. They make their escape. Originally Boba would have been traumatized, angered and saddened by the death of father, Jango. Here however, Jango didn't participate in the battle due to Dooku not letting him go into it, as he had in the original timeline, because he had gotten excited about the battle. As they were moving above the planet's surface, the ships came across some ships. Aim right above the fuel cells. Anakin said to the clones within to better direct their shots. The clones had very accurate aiming, with which they were successful in their endeavor to destroy the escape ships. When it came to the droids, Anakin didn't need them anymore. He didn't need to take over the droid factories here as they were something he could put behind him, not that he would stop creation of droids. No, he was going to make the Star Forge for that, and so much more. He was thinking of upgrading the Star Forge into more than much a massive ship, droid, and whatever else construction site. He intended to include his very own medical facilities. That would help him create his sense, where he didn't have to rely on the Kaminans anymore. Of course, it would mainly still produce droids, while the Kaminans would likely still remain his main source and supply of sense, as it would take up too much space on the Star Forge. A large battle was taking place on Geonosis between the clones who were having their first real battle, their first field test so to speak, and they had Jedi leaders commanding various squadrons. Anakin couldn't really do much here without revealing his advanced knowledge, and it would be even more bullshit if he just said it was a part of a vision he had received. What he could do however was help avoid unnecessary death by better setting up the clones in better positions. When it comes to warfare, a lot of factors are important. Quantity is important as well, but even the greatest of numbers could be overwhelmed by the few if they were not careful. This invasion only works in the Jedi Order's favor because of the intimidation factor, and that the clones were actually more capable than droids. Mace landed on the ground and took control over the clone army, heading straight into the thick of things. It was chaotic, and the Jedi made many mistakes and errors, especially since this was technically their first time going into such a battle of the scale it was. Not that many of them hadn't come into conflict before. No, this type of situation was disorienting and confusing, so there would be many mistakes to happen. Anakin didn't want to destroy the Federation stuff because he could take control over their ships. He may have more wealth and control currently, 
but that didn't mean he wouldn't accept more ships into his fold. From far away, since his abilities have been increased, he is able to take control over the Federation starships and bring them under his control. He waited until the cost was clear, then had the ships be transported all the while back to Tatooine, where any on board would be checked. If deemed necessary, he would then kill those on board. Most of the Federation starships had droids on board anyway, meaning that they would now be all be converted into his empire's resources. How unfortunate for the Trade Federation. Anakin was aware of the Viceroy, and if given the chance, he would assume control over the Trade Federation himself. He has a feeling they would be handed over to him. In the original, the Sis was getting ready to construct the Death Star, but they had no access to such a weapon of mass destruction. Anakin had made sure of that, so they could only go into retreat. Anakin couldn't allow all of the starships to be destroyed now, so he had specifically not taken control of the ones that would have allowed the Sis members to escape. He needed most of them alive after all. After a long while of battling, well, what seemed like a long while with what could have happened, would have been around a few minutes, the droid army started to retreat. Anakin, along with Obi-Wan, Padme, Shark, and Isla, were in pursuit of Dooku, because Obi-Wan wanted to do his duty. Anakin knew that it would probably only be him confronting Dooku, and in fact does want to get him alone. He doesn't want Obi-Wan to overhear whatever he is going to talk about with Dooku, and he doesn't mind Isla or Shark listening in. He would have to be cautious however, as he doesn't want to imply that he is doing anything that would endanger other people's lives, which he would be doing anyway, no matter what he did. The difference is that it would leave a bad impression of him, and he wouldn't like that. Anakin and Obi-Wan land on the outstretched hangar bay, leading into another built-in cave. Before getting off however, Anakin makes sure to destroy the droids following them, so that the person who had dropped him off doesn't get killed in trying to escape. Shark, I want you to stay here with Padme. Anakin says to Shark T, Okay, I can do that. Shark replies, Isla, you can come with Obi-Wan and myself. Anakin says as well, Okay? Isla nods her head, Be safe, Arnie, Isla. Shark adds with a solemn nod before Anakin and Isla go off with Obi-Wan. Before going in, making sure that he and Obi-Wan are alone, Anakin proceeds to knock him out. Completely unaware of what had happened, Obi-Wan falls unconscious, as now Anakin can face Dooku. He is excited because this would be a learning experience when it comes to his lightsaber combat. He fully intends to make the best out of the situation. Why did you do that for? Isla asked him. You will see once we go further in. I would have knocked you unconscious as well, if we weren't in such an intimate relationship. Anakin answered. Well, as long as you know what you are doing. But are you sure Obi-Wan will be safe here? Isla questioned him. He will wake up within the next few minutes. He will be completely safe here until then. Anakin answered. Anakin wanted to use Dooku as a whetstone to sharpen his blade, so to speak among other things. Coming into the room Dooku had stopped at, he turns around to face Anakin and Isla. Count Dooku, you were a respected member of the Jedi. Why have you done this? Isla questioned in a commanding tone, unafraid of the powerful force sensitive before her. Isla, I think that you should stay back for a bit. Anakin said before Isla didn't listen to him and charge at Dooku. Isla managed to fend off Dooku's force lightning attack, which would have put the original Anakin out of commission for the next minute or so. As you see, my Jedi powers are far more beyond yours. Dooku says as Isla now backs away moving back towards Anakin with her lightsaber still ignited. Through the force diet, Anakin becomes stronger the more women he is connected with, but so too does those whom are connected to him as well, within the force. This was the reason Isla was able to successfully block the lightning and come out relatively unscathed. I would suggest that the two of you back down. Dooku says as he starts to circle them. He blasts another wave of force lightning at the both of them. But Isla, now aware of his capabilities, easily defends such an attack using her lightsaber. Count Dooku. I am not here for the Jedi. Anakin said out of nowhere as Isla became confused, but still went along with what he wanted. Oh, and here I had thought you had. Dooku said surprised. If you are not here for the GD, then I must ask. Who are you here for? I am here to secure a proper deal between the Emperor and the Sis. So, you are here to sign the treaty then? That is wonderful, we wouldn't mind and would be most delighted to have Dash Dooku as interrupted by Anakin. No, the Emperor doesn't want any part in whatever war has been started here today. Anakin was deciding how much he should reveal, as Dooku may report back to Palpatine about what he says. I want to make sure that if the Emperor allows any further trade between you and those who join you, that you keep your armies away from them. Anakin then continued, Another thing I want within this small agreement however is to make sure that the Trade Federation doesn't have a part in the war as well. I want them, no the Emperor wants them to pay for their actions. That is quite the big ask of you, young Master Skywalker. I am well aware that the Trade Federation has become a nuisance, but you can't just expect me to hand them over as they are a generous part of the armies the Sis has. Dooku explained not saying no, but not agreeing either. A non-aggression pact, Anakin stated. The Emperor will not raise up its banners against you or for the Republic. This would be similar in nature to what the Republic currently has with the Emperor and the Trade Federation. Dooku asks, still not having agreed. The Emperor will only take one third of the accumulative wealth and resources, including droids for themselves. Is this agreeable? Dooku takes a brief pause before saying, yes, I do believe this is appropriate. Well, now that this is over, I think it is high time we have a little jewel. Don't you agree, Isla? Anakin spoke out loud before igniting his saber. 
but this time he was able to mix and match the coloring of the crystals. It came out as purple, both of them. I do. Isla smiled now knowing what Anakin wanted. Wait, when did you have a purple lightsaber? She said confused, seeing this new lightsaber color. You two seem quite close, it would seem. Dooku stated before continuing. I do hope you live up to your reputation as the chosen one. He ignited his red lightsaber, which was perfect when it came to dueling, specifically one-on-ones. But that didn't mean he would be incapable here. While all of that was going on, Shark, along with Padme, had made it their top priority to make sure they surround the area to capture Dooku. They used the clones to help them with this endeavor and they gladly followed orders. However, what was actually both of the women's top priority right now was ensuring that Anakin would be safe as he had gone into the metaphorical tiger's den. Anakin and Isla were working in tandem with perfect synchronization as they engaged Dooku, which was pushing him back by quite a bit. He was easily able to handle his own situation however as his defensive capabilities were quite good with the lightsaber. You two seem to be made for each other, Dooku said after having a brief reprieve from their combined efforts. If I didn't know any better, I would say you two were in some kind of relationship. But that wouldn't be the way of the Jedi, now would it? You should really mind your own business there, Count. Isla spoke up, slightly worried about where this conversation was going. Are you worried? Don't be. I didn't agree with the Jedi for a reason. Dooku explained before re-engaging Isla and Anakin. Anakin allowed Isla to take the lead while he supported her as this would help her become better at lightsaber combat more than he would. With her style she was able to attack Dooku and didn't seem to tire, which was a minor benefit, by being so close to Anakin. The dyad was an extremely broken connection that allowed immense benefits, even more so when one takes into consideration that Anakin could become stronger as well which when he does it creates a chain reaction and makes others connected to him stronger as well. After a while of intense combat however, Isla now starts to tire making Anakin take the lead himself more and more with him learning very quickly from his short exchanges with Dooku. Count, it would seem that a time of battling is over. Anakin suddenly stopped which prompted Isla to stop as well. Oh, and why is Dash Dooku stops as well as he begins to sense the approach of someone he is familiar with. Backing off, Anakin and Isla take a back seat seeing as Yoda has finally showed up to the scene. Master Yoda, Dooku said a little surprised as he turned around to confront the green alien. Count Dooku, Yoda replied, you have interfered with our affairs for the last time. Dooku said as he used telekinesis is to rip a machine on the wall and throw it towards the Grandmaster. Yoda easily repels the object as Dooku then starts to throw even more things at Yoda, all being reflected, which then prompts Dooku to look towards the ceiling. He draws on the force and starts to break down the ceiling above Yoda, letting it fall onto Yoda, which Yoda again is able to stop in time. Powerful you have become, Dooku. Yoda spoke after the brief exchange and display of their telekinetic abilities. The dark side, I sense in you. To further explain just exactly why Yoda was able to sense Dooku's dark side alignment rather than Palpatine's or Anakin's leads back to two things. Dooku is inexperienced in how to hide his force energy energies or more specifically his force alignment within the force. Second is that Dooku also has a force bond with Yoda, because they were once master and apprentice a long time ago. I've become more powerful than any Jedi. Well, it would seem any except your sprawling master Skywalker. That is, it would seem that Qui-Gon was right about him being the chosen one. Dooku responded while referencing towards Anakin, whom was watching them alongside Isla. I do believe, however, that I have become even more powerful than even you, Master Yoda. Dooku then begins to use force lightning against the old alien. Yoda reflects this, however, without the aid of a lightsaber pushing it back towards Dooku. Much to learn, you still have. Yoda spoke to Dooku. It is obvious that this contest cannot be decided by a knowledge of the Force, but by our skills with a lightsaber. Dooku reignites his lightsaber. It is obvious that this contest cannot be decided by a knowledge of the Force, but by our skills with a lightsaber. Dooku ignites his lightsaber. Yoda does the same, not saying or exchanging any more words. The two then go into a flurry of rapid, fast-paced attacks, where they are still evenly matched within the beginning of their duel. Yoda makes a strange battle cry as he leaps into the air to close the distance between himself and Dooku. Their moves are fanciful even though they were extremely practical to both of their statues at the same time, which helped to display the intense duel between the two. Their duel goes on for a total of 50 seconds as Yoda continues to be the jumping bean that he is and moves from place to place. Yoda also keeps exerting himself, which then he creates grunting sounds due to him getting along in his years. It takes a lot of energy. No doubt to do an extensive exercise such as lightsaber combat. Fought well you have, my old Padawan. Yoda said as they came to a brief stop. This is just the beginning. Dooku replied before using the force to direct an object towards Yoda, to create distance to distract him as the object was falling towards Anakin and Isla. Noticing this, Anakin doesn't do much, and Isla helps Yoda out in trying to stop the object from falling on them. Anakin needs Dooku alive after all, so if he participated, it would only make his future harder. He was prepared however that if both Isla and Yoda failed to hold the object to grab Isla and move out of the way. Dooku now on his ship, looks back one last time to see that Anakin was looking at him. Dooku nods in his direction to affirm that he was still going to go through with the deal, while Anakin also nods back. The reinforcements outside this place were unable to stop Dooku's escape, because they didn't know from where he would go, though they did manage to slightly damage his ship. That was all they could do. Yoda slowly made his way over to the exhausted Isla and Anakin, while Padme and Shark had also gone into the room with several clone troopers flanking them from both sides. Padme rushes in to hug him regardless of the situation, which slightly upsets Isla, 
while Shark also had to keep her calm, given that Yoda was here. Arnie, Padme exclaimed, why the hell does he get to get away with something like this? Isla thought within her mind about how Yoda didn't seem to mind this little reunion between the two. Seem it would, Senator Amidala, connected to Master Skywalker you are. Yoda spoke seeing the two embrace each other. Padme now shy about what she had just done detached herself from Anakin. Oh, Master Yoda, I didn't mean anything by this. Padme hurriedly explained the situation. Master Yoda, I have a situation to report to you about. Anakin decides to distract Yoda with the importance of what has happened. Please, young Master Skywalker is tired I do. At the time, you may tell me. Yoda said as he seemed quite tired mentally rather than physically. I understand. And Anakin did understand just like he had said, as coming across a student you were very close to and still carry a bond, disconnected even as it would certainly mentally drain someone. Even the most mysterious and wisest of all people would experience their downs, just as they have their ups. Yoda turned around to see that Obi-Wan also walked into the room. What happened to me? Obi-Wan was rubbing the back of his head as it was sore. Anakin supplied an excuse. Something fell on your head. You were completely out of it, so Ara and myself here went to face the Count. That's strange. I didn't feel anything through the Force. Obi-Wan said with some confusion, while sporting a large bump on the back of his head. Yoda laughs here being slightly cheered up by the situation. Seem it would Obi-Wan, more training you need. He hums after finishing here before continuing on his way outside with Obi-Wan and the clones following after them. This left Shark, Isla, Anakin and Padme, as the only ones left within the room. Well I guess we should all introduce each other here. Anakin said knowing that this may break down into a semi-cat fight. Not that Padme really stood a chance, but she would probably give a valiant effort. Hello, I am Isla Sakura, a very close friend of Anakin's. Isla introduced herself first to Padme. Narrowing her eyes, Padme responds. Hello Master Sakura, I am Senator Amidala, other known as Padme, and I am also a very close friend of Arnie. She gave her Anakin-esque smirk back and introduced herself. Arnie. Isla turns to Anakin. She calls you Arnie already. Shark decides to break the tension that was building by introducing herself. I am Shark T. Can't you see we are both talking here? Both Isla and Padme said as they turned back to each other, not actually talking and was just communicating through their eyes. I apologize. Shark said as Anakin moved over to her to allow the two women to sort out whatever they were doing. To him it seemed like they were testing each other. On what? He didn't know nor did he try to find out either. Are you alright? Anakin asked Shark as she seemed to be dazed. No, she admitted quite readily. Shark may be older than Anakin and others, but that doesn't mean anything when she didn't truly experience much life had to offer. Being from a social species, especially within a culture that promoted it, she had no real connection to her home of Shiley, other than her traveling there from time to time in the past to train her Padawans. She had become more open with Anakin, and readily shared her feelings with him, and she couldn't be any more grateful for having him. What is wrong then? He asked her as Padme and Isla were now asking each other various questions concerning Anakin within the background. I dash she hesitated before continuing. I didn't know how to lead those clone troopers. A lot of them had died people I had known within the Jedi had died, and I feel as if it was my fault. I could have done much more. Anakin hugged her, which did get the attention of the other two within the room, as Shark started to silence cry on his shoulder. There was a lot of baggage to unpackage within Shark, and she was fortunate to have developed close bonds with others. She would have been mostly alone throughout the entirety of her life, right from when she was a youngling to now. Isla came in and joined the hug, which turned it into a group hug. Padme was silent here, and was uncertain if she should also hug the group, but she had a feeling she knew why Anakin was hugging the woman, and it most likely has to do with the responsibility of being a leader during times of war. Holding the lives of those below you within your hands is not a good feeling, especially when those same people died due to your inexperience or mistakes. It is okay, you did your best. Anakin said as Shark came back to herself, aware that there was technically a stranger within the room. Thank you. Shark sent through the diet they shared. No worries, I am here for you anytime. Anakin replied through the connection. Padme makes herself known through a small cough. Well, it would seem that you have some explaining to do. Her smile here seemed a bit forced, nonetheless it didn't change the feelings that the four sensitives within the room could sense coming from her. Yes, I do believe I should explain just what exactly is going on here. Anakin rubs the back of his head reminiscent of other shonen protagonists from his past life. While all of that was happening on Geonosis, Dooku had made his way to Coruscant. His ship under the cover of the night entered Coruscant's atmosphere, slowly descending towards the planet. Originally Dooku went there because he wanted to hand over the plans from the Death Star, but since Dooku does not have anything like this, there must be another reason for his visit. Dooku slowly made his way from the dark side of the planet to the light where the sun was rising, encoating the city within its golden hues. Far away from civilization however, he drew closer towards the industrial district. That was far out from the main location most are interested in when coming to Coruscant. It was smoky, and the sun now was giving off red and maroon hues of coloring, as the clouds sometimes blocked the sun from view. The industrial area was a large area with multiple plants. That seemed to run on some kind of energy that created clouds, plumes of smoke. This was emitted into the atmosphere. This area of Coruscant wasn't just an area full of industrial buildings hard at work to help provide for the main city's supply. It was also the area with broken down, crumbling skyscrapers, with ships also being left behind. It was a graveyard of broken everything. Dooku had made it into a hideaway far from the mainstay of Coruscant and his new enemies within the Republican Jedi Order. Exiting the ship, Dooku saw a cloaked figure approaching. The Force is with us, Master Sidious. Welcome home, Lord Tyrannus. 
You have done well. Sidious turns around with his hood still pulled up, and leads Duku away from the bay they were in. I have good news for you, my lord. The war has begun, Duku explained. Excellent. Everything is going as planned. Sidious responded. I also have the most interesting bits and pieces of information that you may want to know. Duku continued. Oh, what have you found out? Lord Tyrannus that was so interesting that you just have to tell me. Sidious questioned. It is about the boy. The chosen one. He seems to be far more connected to his home than what most of the public perceives. Duku said. Is that so? Sidious feigns disinterest, but Duku continued. Yes, master. It would seem that Skywalker still keeps in close contact with someone within the Emperor, which is why he allowed me to leave. Interesting. This must mean that the boy is still within a vulnerable state. Sidious said out loud while thinking inwardly. Yes, this is good. This makes manipulating the boy that much more easy, as I can tell that he doesn't agree with the Jedi, along with him still supporting the Empire he is heir to. Oh, how wonderful for me. Sidious laughs within his mind as Duku and himself discuss other things, top among them is the deal established between the Emperor and the Sis, where the Trade Federation would have to be dissolved. A sacrifice that Sidious was willing to take. In fact, there was very little that he was not willing to sacrifice when it came to furthering his designs and plans for the future. He would achieve his goal by any means necessary. Duku had left out a fact however. No he had left out several when talking to his master about Anakin, one such thing being how well he worked together with another Jedi. Or even the fact he thought that the two were much more than just friends from his observations. There was other things as well, with how Senator Amidala's eyes seemed to linger on Anakin in the arena. He had also been fortunate enough to even see the small displays of affection the two shared or more like Amidala had done to Skywalker. Duku was actually extremely surprised by this revelations, but he would keep them to himself as it would seem that the boy was keeping these relationships secret, as he should because he is a Jedi at this point of time. Duku did have a feeling however that this not last long. There was something within the Force that was stirring and it tipping the scales. Tell me, Lord Tyrannus, is there anything else of interest when it comes to young Master Skywalker? Sidious asked him after their meeting was over. No Master. Of course there was, but Duku didn't tell his master everything, and was becoming disillusioned to him as well. He didn't only believe that the Republican Jedi were corrupt and backwards, he also started to believe that Palpatine was probably not the best option either. That is quite unfortunate. I had thought that during this you may have discovered that the boy would have other weaknesses. Sidious said before continuing, The Jedi have nothing but praise for the boy. It is quite unfortunate that they were unable to recruit him to the council. That was news to Duku, and it only confirmed what he had already been piecing together within his mind. Really? Did Skywalker reveal to you the reason behind his rejection? He wouldn't just be following in Qui-Gon's footsteps, now is he? Still have some affection for your former apprentice, do you Tyrannus? Sidious questioned him. I have already resolved that if the Jedi get in my way. I wouldn't hesitate to kill. It is just that I believe that Qui-Gon could see my side of the story. He left of here while continuing mentally within. He would help me overcome you, my master. Your affections for your apprentice may be the death of you. You must not hesitate to strike him down if he was ever to come after you. Sidious said in his dark corrupting tone. Duku just bows. Yes master. On Tatooine, Shmai had received reports about what was going. Knowing about a potential ally or threat is important within the grand scheme of things. As she needed to be mentally prepared and ready for any threat to her life, the lives of her people or to her son. She kept up to date on what he was doing. And to her relief, he had seemed to be staying on Coruscant much more. What mother wouldn't worry about their child? But she was especially invested in knowing and others would say she was much more worried than what was considered normal. All those people simply didn't know how it was to feel like as a mother, or even as a parent. Thankfully it also would seem that her child always kept in touch with her to put her worries to ease. Now that she was immortal, or at least have eternal youth as her son had explained to her, she could watch him as long as she would like. She had also gone through with the super serum, and she had never felt younger. She looked younger and much more beautiful within her prime, and this seemed to draw some of the eyes of the people. Having a higher natural beauty certainly helped with charming people. She was also aware of many things, specifically the cult or at this point, the religion about her child, where he is praised as some sort of god. She didn't know how to feel about this. But as her youth was rejuvenated, she too had been added into the religious pantheon of her people. Something about being the mother of their lord and savior definitely elevated her within the eyes of the people who followed and prescribed to this religion. My Empress, here is the weekly report. Grievous had come into the throne room and presented the data he had collected to Shmai. General Grievous, Shmai greeted before continuing. Has there been any more news about what is going on between the Sis and the Republic? She asked. Empress, there has been some news. But it isn't between the Sis and Republic. The Prince has negotiated with the Sis, and has managed to reach a non-aggression pact agreement. Grievous replied. The Sis, or at least the current leader of the Sis, has promised to make sure the Trey Federation is dissolved. That is good. Shmai nods her head as inwardly she thinks to herself. That is very good. The Trade Federation had messed with my son's life before, and now is my chance to further destroy them. On a side note they have also messed with Padme, so it would only be right if we take something as compensation. There are other things, my Empress. Grievous continued. You may continue. Shmai prompted Grievous. We have successfully expanded the the reaches of the Emperor and outwards, and our control over the surrounding space and hyperspace lanes have come under our control, Grievous said. Another to add is the completion of the Stargates as now this will allow us to reduce the costs of traveling. There is something bothering me however. What is it? Shmai asked. There is a group of radicals within the Empire that wish to have you overthrown from your position, Grievous said. Did they say why? She asked. 
They believe that you and the subsequent connection to Anakin is eroding their ability to be free. Even though they are very few within the Emperor, it is still troublesome as they started destroying small businesses of our citizens. Grievous says. Frowning, Shmai says. They believe that myself and Arnie included somehow have restricted them. I want to have them brought to me in chains to discuss what has happened. Also make sure to send the necessary resources and money for those harmed. Yes, your majesty. Grievous bows before adding one more thing. Another thing, Empress, is that the radical movement heavily dislikes the religion created by the living droids, which has now spread out, and the citizens of the Emperor participate in. So it was the religion that was making them feel this way? Shah asked. No Empress. They hate the religion because they believe it to be an affront to their own views. Just as they are a few, I have gathered that there is even a few of the few which have created a cult of their own, preaching about how Anakin is the devil, Grievous reported. Now Shmai was frowning heavily, but quickly covered up this look as it was quite scary. Even Grievous felt scared, and she wasn't even force sensitive, and he genuinely feared for his life there. Grievous, you will bring these people to me, without fail, she asked politely. But there was this aura around her that couldn't be mistaken. Ah yes, your majesty. I will get right on it straight away. I will uproot these corrupt and foul individuals for even daring to go against the empress or the prince. Grievous replied while bowing. Good. You may leave now, general. Shmai prompted Grievous to leave. Thank you, your majesty. He stayed bowed like an old Chinese imperial, where they wouldn't dare look the emperor in the eye. Just that this time it was Shmai, and their culture was different from the imperial east of Anakin's previous life. Now to get back to other things. Shmai thought to herself as she didn't really have much to do, given a lot of the administrative work could be taken care of by the artificial intelligence installed by Anakin. He had done it with the express purpose of making her life easier as the leader of an empire, while he is still attached to the Jedi Order. With everything going to plans and that there was a small amount of dissent with the Emperor and only went to show just how much power and control over the people Anakin or Shmai had. Not that they would abuse this power as there was no desire to do so. Shmai also knew that she didn't want to or even stay within this position for some time. She had already been doing this for a few years now, and thought to herself about having some form of break. She is also excited about her Arnie finally coming back to her permanently. Why? Because sooner or later he would be leaving the Jedi Order, he had said so himself. He told her all about the failings of the Jedi and failings of the Republic, which was slowly turning him more and more away from trying to help them. She knew he had done much, but sometimes there are some things one couldn't change. Maybe if they tried to take over the Republic, but that is a long ways off for now considering everyone else involved. Shmai also thought about another topic. When Arnie gets back, I can finally start arranging for him to meet a few females, maybe one of them could get along well with Arnie. That is correct, she wanted Anakin to have some sort of romantic partner. Or there were those other girls that had come looking for him, but they were Jedi, and I am unsure if they are willing to leave the Order with him. She then continued inwardly. Then again, all three did come looking for him very worried. What can I say? My son seems to be quite the charmer. Shmai said to herself out loud as she giggled to herself thinking about the prospect of having some grandchildren to keep her occupied. Once the Emperor's succession is over, it was sunset and the golden hues of Coruscant gave off quite the view from where the Jedi was standing. Obi-Wan having returned alongside Yoda and Mace where the three of them are within a room. Qui-Gon was also present to see what was happening as he was away on a mission himself, and that was why he wasn't present to help the Jedi rescue Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon had been briefed as well about what had happened on Geonosis, and was thus within the room with the three. Do you believe what Count Dooku said about Sidious controlling the Senate? Obi-Wan questioned those within the room. It doesn't feel right. Join the dark side Dooku has. Lies, deceit, creating distrust are his ways now. Yoda spoke up here. Surely Master Yoda that isn't true. Qui-Gon said as he couldn't exactly believe that Dooku had joined the dark side. He was in denial. Your former master aligned with the dark years. Doubt the Jedi you do. Yoda asked. It is not that I disagree with those eyewitness accounts. It is just that I feel I should have been there myself to know truly whether or not it has become like this. Forget you do. Dooku's master I was once. Yoda spoke to Qui-Gon. Nevertheless, I feel we should keep a close eye on the Senate. Mace stated after their brief exchange. I agree. Yoda agreed with Mace's judgment. Where is Anakin anyway? Qui-Gon asked not knowing where he was. Obi-Wan answered. Last I heard was that he was on his way to Nabi with a few other Jedi as well. Escorting the Senator Amidala back home. Who did he go with? Mace questioned. The usual people that he hangs around. Or is it they hang around him? Obi-Wan said. Do you mean Master Shakti and Isla Sakura? From what I know, Anakin's former Padawan Barisofi has already returned to the temple. Qui-Gon said. Yes, it was Master Sakura and T. Obi-Wan confirmed. Strange their closeness with each other is. Yoda said. Much kept secret Skywalker has. Qui-Gon spoke in Anakin's defense. Well, Master Yoda you can't believe Anakin would be doing anything wrong here. Evidence of misconduct, we do not have. Suspicions I do have, Yoda said. Uphold the Jedi Code at several point, yes. But in disagreement he is with the Order. Wonder why I do. Mace spoke here. While Anakin was quite the mischievous student, he has matured a great deal. Humming Yoda agreed. Yes, correct you are. Master Skywalker seemed close to the Senator I saw. A ladies man, perhaps. You joke Master Yoda, Obi-Wan said. Another thing was the battle. What about the battle? Mace questioned. I have to admit that without the clones, it would not have been a victory. Obi-Wan stated. Victory. Yoda exclaimed. Victory, you say? Master Obi-Wan, not victory. 
The Shroud of the Dark Side has fallen, begun the Clone War has. After Yoda's declaration we rejoin with the absolute mass amount of clones being dropped off on the planet of Coruscant. All at attention and ready to receive their orders for what will happen next. Boarding ships, they start marching in formation. Perfect synchronization, perfect unity and cohesion as every single one of the clones face us with masks, march to whatever destination they may end up in. Thousands of clones, dozens of ships, all under the reddening golden hue under the rays of the sun of Coruscant. Palpatine along with many of his supporters and close aides, allies, or those he would consider pawns, gather around to watch the terrible magnificence of the clone army before them. Magnificent, isn't it? Palpatine states as Bail Organa is also there alongside others to view the absolute madness that is the clone army. I wouldn't say magnificent, but it is definitely something to be impressed by. Even though I wholeheartedly disagree with what is happening and like the idea of peaceful negotiations, it would seem that Chancellor Palpatine, the Senate agrees with your decision, the young Bail Organa said. It is with great regret that this may be so. Unfortunately, desperate times sometimes calls for desperate measures. Palpatine of course still fakes still sympathetic nature, but inwardly is cheering that his plans are becoming better. His designs are finishing faster, and his time as an emperor is fast approaching. You would have to forgive me, as I disagree. But a vote has been cast, Bail Organa said. But inwardly he knew that this decision would lead down a more corrupt path. Being close to the Chancellor would only benefit him however, so he mustn't be in too much opposition if at all. I love democracy, Palpatine added. That is why when this is all over, my new powers will be relinquished. How could I not do this for the good of the Republic? Back on Naboo, Anakin, Padme, Isla and Shark were within another area, another room that gave privacy to the four, as they all discussed the weirdness of the situation. So what you are telling me is that you three, or more specifically, you two are connected to him and vice versa, Padme said. Yes. Anakin answered while Shark just stayed silent, and Isla nodded her head. This connection is only established when two people are compatible with each other through the Force, and this basically means you guys are something like soulmates. Padme says. The other three just nod as Padme continues. Because of this bond, and because it is a special one, and due to the nature of how Anakin seemingly has more than one soulmate, this means that he will have some sort of harem. Padme said as well, feeling slightly jealous at the prospect at first. Now after calming down and thinking about the situation, it seemed perfectly natural for something like this to happen. Well, maybe not perfectly natural. But it is not like the Galaxy Outlaws polyamory or polygamous relationships Padme was making up excuses within her mind as she was blinded by love. Not that being with this type of relationship was that bad to begin with. It was just it was against Padme's sensibilities. And she didn't have a few years to get used to the idea. Just like Isla, Shark or Barris did. Isla and Anakin are officially within a relationship as lovers, Shark and Anakin are not in a relationship of sorts, but are slowly getting there, while it is the same with this other girl I have not met yet. Padme said before continuing, Wait don't let me forget yet another on Tatooine. Yes. Anakin nodding again seemingly having no shame at all. He had come to terms with who he is a long time ago, and was not going to apologize for it. If Padme didn't want to join then that was her decision, not his. His greed only kicked him when Isla truly became his, meaning that he wouldn't let anyone else have her except him. Whether that be while she is alive, in death or in another life, she he would remain his forever. The same would apply to the others once they have the courage to enter into a relationship with him as well. Padme, I know how this seems. I know that it makes me scum. But that doesn't mean I don't treasure your feelings for me, it also doesn't mean I don't treasure the feelings of those around me either. Anakin began. Just know that if you don't want to dash Anakin was cut off however as Padme had just leapt into his arms, and started making out with him while the other two girls were there. After doing so she just stays embraced within his arms. I don't care, I love you, and that should be more than enough. Padme then decides to drop a bomb on Anakin and the other two girls. Let's get married. Ha! Huh. Confusion abound, everyone was quite flabbergasted at what had just been said. Not even Anakin was expecting for this to happen. My reasoning for such a decision is because Isla here seems like she is not ready to take the next step, so I will become your first wife. Padme smiles brightly, and Isla reacts by standing up. No, I am his first lover, his first girlfriend. You can't just steal that from me. Isla exclaims. I thought a Jedi couldn't get married. Padme conveniently leaves out Anakin from this equation, not taking him to be a Jedi given he had already told her about what he is to do in the future. The two continued to go back and forth before they both settled down. Anakin didn't interfere with their little dispute as it wasn't really his place to talk here, and he didn't want to redirect their anger at himself. He does get a little mentally drained from this however as he decides to end this once and for all. Okay? Since everyone here seems to be against my marriage with one of you, I have decided that I will marry you both. Isla, will you be my wife and Padme, will you also be my wife? Isla and Padme look at each other here and as if in agreement, both nod at the same time before both saying, yes. Then it is settled then. Anakin sighs while Shark just sits there awkwardly having witnessed the entire event. And while she may dislike where this was going, even feeling a little jealous herself, she doesn't say anything. She knew sooner or later she would cave and decide to full-heartedly love Anakin with all her heart. That is if she didn't already and was in denial. I am glad this is over, we can have the ceremony here in the morning. Anakin stated getting straight to the point not intending to delay something like this. Now that the Clone Wars had officially begun, Anakin knew that it was time to leave the Order. There were many factors when going into this decision, even though he would be unable to experience what would have originally happened, this seemed like the better option. It was not like everything that happened in between would be all that affected by his loss of course that was unless there was someone to take his place, in a sense. There was no one though that could do something like this, and when he decides to announce his departure, 
he is sure there would a few, no, a great amount of people that would follow as well. That doesn't mean they would join him or anything. It would just mean that some may join him, while others whom were afraid to go would leave as well, using him as an example. He would become the excuse for the Jedi who were undecided on leaving. On Naboo, the day after Anakin's proclamation to be wed with Padme and Isla, a very, very small gathering was being held where there would be only a few witnesses to this event. The first was the officiator, the priest of sorts, R2, the enigmatic astromech droid and shark, who was also here to be a witness to this event. Anakin didn't want to do a three-way wedding as that wasn't what was happening. It was Anakin whom loved the two, and it was the two, Padme and Isla who loves him, not them loving each other. That was not how relationships worked, and even if it was like this, Anakin was greedy and disliked the idea of sharing. Even though it was amongst his other would-be wives, he very much disliked this idea. It wouldn't make sense in this instance however as Isla is only connected to him, and not anyone was but is able to access the connection he has with the other girls. It made it all the more easier for them to go through with his decision to create a harem of sorts. But when it came to Padme accepting, there was no excuse. She was just that deeply in love with him, and if he had to put a finger on why this is, it is because of the Force, and how it wants everything to still go the same way. Even though he has made so many changes, that there have already been what some would call a very big differences. First was all of his personal power, militaristic and economic building. Second was the creation of an empire that promoted freedom within the outer rooms. Then there was the elevation and creation of another new technology-based race, the living droids. Third was the subsequent avoidance of death for Qui-Gon. Then his mother, back to the Empire, back to the Jedi Order and then to himself. It went on and on, but the Force adamant in having more of the Jedi die, having the dark side prevail for a short time before being set in balance again. Only to not really be in balance as within the future, there would still be this battle between both sides even when the light wasn't as extreme and the dark was not as consuming. It was inevitable because that was the way the Force worked. No, that is the way life works. Anakin thought to himself as he awaited for the pastor to be done with whatever mumbo jumbo he was speaking. Weddings are mostly for girls after all, and Anakin knew that he would have to do a proper ceremony at another time with both of them. Yes, that was how life worked. Conflict is present because it is needed, as without conflict, without something to cause a change, there would be none. It was evolution at its finest, and if one were to take a greater look at the grand scheme of things, they would see that the Force is a massive network of organisms, banding together to subsist off of the energy field known as the Force. That is why the Force could be separated into two the living and the cosmic. What was really strange however when one thought about it was that Anakin could have been the thing the Force is looking for. That disruption to help it evolve and become greater than itself at the current point of time. But it doesn't use him for that, or at least try to use him. No, it tried doing everything within its semi-sentient capabilities and powers to guide him down the path of the original, while at the same time allowing him to do things that were against it. It wanted him to create a balance but didn't have the strength to overcome his will. And now, the two shall exchange vows. The priest finally caught up to the important point. Of course, Anakin had prepared his vows and exchanged them with the person with whom he was currently being wed to. It was Isla first, which Padme had acquiesced to because in the end Isla was and is the first to be his lover. After briefly exchanging their vows, both proclaimed their love for each other and this prompted the priest to once again get into position, as he has another wedding to conduct. Now it was Padme's turn, and just as Isla was beautiful within her own people's traditional garb, so too was Padme within her own as well. Why wouldn't he take a little more time and allow them both to enjoy their moments? It only increased his favorability points, which would then lead to him being able to do certain things, as they would both be in a happy mood. Of course he couldn't leave one or the other hanging, as he got it on with only one, so he had to find a solution to this. And a solution he had already come up with. He can use his bond with Isla to transmit pleasure and feelings with each other, making it easier for her to achieve release. While he could probably go on for a day or two simply through pure willpower, but that was ridiculous for those involved. Except himself of course because he is the one capable of doing this, in fact he was pretty sure he could go on forever, if he really wanted to. After achieving immortal, biological and otherwise, it had increased a lot of factor about his biological factors, meaning that no matter how many times he goes at it, he would be unlimited in his power. And now, bride and groom may exchange their vows. The priest continued for the second time as Padme and Anakin then went on about how they love each other and all those other things. Sometimes, some things are just best left unsaid. You may kiss the bride. Asterisk A-H-E-M asterisk I mean you may kiss the brides. The priest then left after this as Anakin had to passionately kiss both women, not simultaneously as that would be impossible, unless he had two heads and two lips. He had to show his emotions, feelings and desires through his actions, as even though words are good and all, they were not important in comparison to his actions. Anakin spent the rest of the day with Padme and Isla, both of them seemingly very happy with themselves and their decisions that lead up to this point. However, they all had places to be at, and Anakin was starting to feel a bit bad about leaving Shark out. But upon further review, Anakin can't help but put that on her, as she needed to be the one to respond to the emotions. It was not he that is conflicted, it is her, and it would be time soon enough to see just how far she is willing to be silent. Anakin had a feeling she would choose him in the end, especially since they are connected, and have had time to develop a relationship. But with all things in life, he always liked preparing for the worst while hoping for the best. Amazing foresight capabilities through the Force aside, he couldn't just rely on what the Force tells him as sometimes it give wrong information to him on purpose. 
He knew it was both a way to mess with him, and a way to test him constantly. The force was like mad eye, constant vigilance indeed. What are you thinking about? Padme questioned him as he was just stargazing along with the two women, as Shark had done what she needed, and left the lovebirds alone going back to Coruscant first. Is this that meme? I am not really thinking about anything in particular. Anakin answered. No, you were. You were just hiding a lot of it. The bond between Anakin and Isla had blossomed. But that didn't mean he allowed full access into his mind, just as he gave others the same respect. He likes his privacy and prefers not to be hypocrite when it comes to this fact. Of course, there are always exceptions to this rule as other people that are not good and more inclined to evil or criminal acts are all the more. How would HK say it? Meat bags to be used. Don't go trying to snoop around. You wouldn't like it if I did it to you. Now would you? Anakin said, not expecting the next answer. But he should have. Yes. I want you within me, inside my mind. Ala answered. Padme does a double take disbelief at the bold statement. Are we what? What did you just say? Well, let me explain it a little better. Ayla didn't seem to understand the implications of what she has just said. The diet between Arnie and me is special, and because of this we can be inside each other's heads whenever we want. Of course he has set up measures to prevent someone from entering unless given permission and dash stop stop stop. Calm down for a minute there. I would have figured that already. But can you repeat what you just said before? Padme still was in disbelief even more so that she noticed Isla seemingly not educated in private matters. It was either that or she was completely oblivious to these types of things, despite coming from a species, distinct in all manners related to adult themed stuff. I said, yes. I want you within me, inside my mind. Isla repeated herself with the exact same wording. Do you not understand? Anakin questioned her, amused. What is so funny? Isla confused asks. I can feel your emotions, the both of you. Spit it out. Why don't you just keep repeating that one mic within your mind for a bit and see if you could attach that to anything else, in any other situation. Specifically in the context of the bedroom. Anakin supplied seeing as she was still confused. Right, fine. Isla adopted a thinking pose for a bit before she started to blush visibly, meaning that she has probably figured out the source of their amusement. I, I knew what I said. You guys just can't take a joke. She practically harumphed. Now, now, don't be so down. I am sure that this is just a facet of who you are. Anakin stated. Adorable. I don't want to be adorable. I want to be sexy. For you. Isla exclaimed while acting like a mild son dear in this brief moment. Stop being childish now. Anakin says as he wraps his arms around her moving his lips closer to her. His breath tingles her skin as she listens to him speak. You are very sexy to me. You don't have to try so hard, nor try so little to appease me and my desires. But, I want to do things for you. And I dash Isla is interrupted by Anakin. You can do so when you are ready. Anakin stands up while lifting her into a princess carry. I think the three of us have had a big day. And it is time to get some shut eye. And, who will you be sleeping with? Padme just had to ask, and it would only be fair to answer honestly. By myself. Anakin answers because even though he is incredibly in the mood, it wouldn't feel all that good to just go through with it straight away. Knowing how girls are, he would have to take them at separate times, because to do so within the same night would be disrespectful. He loves them now, and because they are his there is no escaping his clutches. He can take his time, he has been doing so for the last few years now, especially when his libido started to increase more and more as time passed. By yourself Padme and Isla both exclaim as he gently puts Isla down. Yes, he replied. He but. Padme continued because she was looking forward to what would happen. She had been keeping a close eye on what he had below, and and it seemed like it would be more than satisfactory. While she didn't care too much about size, she was still looking forward to it as it would have been her first. No buts. Anakin answered, I don't believe it is the right time to do this. But don't worry. Now that I have the both of you, you will both be very satisfied. He smirked. And why wouldn't this be the right time? Padme demanded. Yeah. What she said. It would seem that Padme and Isla were having one of their moments of unity and cohesion as a teen, double teaming him here. Sighing he explains why and how it wouldn't be all that special to take them both within the same night. Hearing this they both agree that it would be a little disturbing to think about how, if Anakin did one of them and then went on to the next. The imagery was quite arousing, but at the same time, what woman would want that? They didn't want to be just seconds, they wanted to be the main dish, seconds, side dish and dessert. It would be unfair to not give them the full experience, in an environment they were comfortable with, the mood being set. Not everything had to be perfect. But it would be a disservice to not try and do one's best. That is all anyone could ask for really. Anakin did in the end acquiesce into sleeping with both women, just some innocent sleeping within the same bed where no shenanigans took place. He didn't really have to put his foot down on this or whatever, and it was nice to know that both Isla and Padme were still thinking for themselves. It would be extremely weird to Anakin if the women around him only thought about him, and only thought about pleasing him. He would feel extremely worried and disturbed because at that point they would slowly not be real living people anymore, and only be slaves to his will. He had preached about freedom to his people within his emperor, and he meant it. After some time spent on Naboo with Padme and Isla, they all had to return to their duties. If only it was for the time being, as Anakin will be preparing himself and others within the order to leave. Of course they may try to stop him, but forcefully. He thinks not, the Jedi may be many things, but they have restricted his movement and capability to be free to the minimum requirements, when it comes to him or others. His restrictions were all in compliance with their rules, and he didn't mind loosely following them. The Clone Wars are the beginning of the end of the Republic's Millennium Long Peace. A strange but happy little incident that occurs as a result of the Republic's occupation of Geonosis was that they would be unable to hold it for long. Anakin knew that they didn't have the capacity or the economy to sustain it. 
which means it would be all his once they left. The Emperor would then finally be able to secure its hyperspace lines from every spatial dimension, surrounding the seat of the Emperor and Tatooine. Once this does happen though, he would probably have to contest Count Dooku or Dooku's droid maker, Poggle, for the planet. He is sure however that it would come under his control no matter what Dooku says. This would harshly make the Sis's army smaller and smaller, significantly impacting the result of the war. Not unless Sidious or Dooku has some other plan or design to get around this flaw when it shows up. For now however he will have to wait. Within the Jedi Order, one interesting thing of note took place. The elevation of another Jedi Master to the High Council was done. It was just a replacement for a Master that was taking a step down from the position. There was a few things to do within the Order, top among them was going into the Jedi Archives, downloading every piece of information. Uploading the multiple holocrons, Jedi and otherwise from within the temple's walls and the slow so of descent from within to create chaos. He didn't want to just leave, that would leave no impact. With no impact, a lot of the Jedi wanting to leave would be kept to the minimum amount, and those who were both willing to leave and join a new order are even fewer. The more that left, the better for him. He would soon be advertising by creating rumors of another group of Force Sensitives that have created an order, an organization within the Emperor, that didn't hold the exact same views of the Jedi. Of course, not everyone would even want to join the order, and those that left would be much more to go on about their own business. The indoctrination of the Jedi Order was quite strong, and while Anakin has greatly affected those very close to him, the younglings he has taught and a few others he has interacted with him, it would still be hard. At least he was okay within the knowledge that Isla, Shuck, Barris, and Ahsoka would leave with him when the time would come. He had already briefed all four of them on what is going to happen, and out of the four, the only one that was most hesitant was Shark. He would have to confront her about it later. Then there was the rest of the Order, which would heavily mess up with the sequence of events. Because if he links this back with him tacking over Geonosis to stop the mass production of droids for the Sis, it could affect the war as well. Wait a minute, if I take over Geonosis, I weaken the Sis in the long term. If I take some of the Jedi with me to the Emperor, I would weaken the Jedi who would become the generals within the war. Anakin thought to himself, that is right as Anakin picks apart from the things he wants and discards the rest because he is a picky eater, he would get the best bits, and potentially none of the disadvantages. This would set him up better than Sidious and prepare him for what is to come, which would no doubt be four main threats. The Sis, the Republic to be turned Galactic Empire, the Huts and the Yuz and Vong. As Anakin thinks about it, these are the main external threats. But he knows about some internal problems. Where it would seem some individuals dislike the propaganda done by their living droids, and now propaganda done by his citizens as well. It was actually ridiculous, and if Anakin could he would try and harvest their spiritual faith-based energies, if there were any. Sadly, if he wanted to experiment with an idea like this, he needs to rapidly develop his spiritual plane. His heavenly dimension originally to be created just for his droids, but now has expanded into a full-on gangster's paradise. He had on occasion started visiting the Hell Dimension, looking into the way it worked, and started to pull within the Force, and create his own dimension. He has only started this process however, and those who die and are only minorly connected to him through the Super Serum, created through advanced Sith alchemy, cannot ascend just yet. So his followers of whom were dying, which are few and far between. But he can't exactly stop the advancement of age for everyone, now can he? Maybe. That was besides the point however, he wanted to create a paradise. So a paradise he would create. But for now it was developing, and from what he could tell, the absorption of the energy known as the Force was speeding up the progress. Another factor was its spiritual connection to him indicating his sole ownership of this spiritual space. He also thought back to his other ideas, more specifically his idea to recreate the eastern aspects of cultivation within his previous life, as there were some connections between the Force and those aspects. He would become a young Chinese master, no it would be more appropriate to call him at this point, the leader of the sect. He had been experimenting with midi-chlorium manipulation and with the energy field of the Force to see if he should do what he wanted. Then there was the scientific aspects of trying to edit the structure of midi-chlorians, where he had to create a super virus with the intent purpose in being able to edit midi-chlorians. This was super dangerous as if anything goes wrong. He could completely disconnect himself from the Force, if he wasn't careful. He would be free, but at what cost? The cost would be his connection to the girls but also his abilities within the Force, but the most important aspect was the connection. His abilities within the Force could be replicated through other methods. There were species within the Star Wars Expanded Universe capable of using psychic abilities regardless of Force sensitivity, and they usually had gotten this traits as a result of evolution, meaning that there were other ways to become more powerful if he really wanted to, but his current physical and mental capabilities are already well above the rest. Another thing to take into consideration is if he changes his midi-chlorians, so to speak and upgrade them, was if he could change them back into the original cellular makeup and structure. He would probably be capable of this, as if he could change it, he should also be able to change it back as well. That isn't how evolution usually works, but whatever. Anakin thought to himself, Youngling Tano, come to see me, you have. Yoda spoke as Ahsoka had come to consult with Yoda again. When am I to get a master? She had not been chosen, and she knew it was for a specific reason, withheld from her. No master would take her. But that didn't mean she failed as she was told specifically she would have one. Your teacher shall be Master Skywalker. Yoda answered her question. Her eyelid up? Really? Even though she was aware of Anakin leaving and she would go with him as well. That didn't mean she was immune to some things, like excitement of becoming his student just as Barris was. Yoda had felt it was time for Anakin to take on another apprentice, and was going to forcefully give him one, one that he would accept and not go back on as there were many offers that he had turned down before. Many prospective younglings ready to be taught by the very best. 
but he had declined them. It was only after Barris was knighted that Yoda sensed it was time for him to accept another student. Even though he had not been accepting, Yoda knew he wouldn't refuse this little to Garuda's request. To officially become Anakin's student before she left the order with him was Ahsoka's goal. She wanted to acknowledge for her efforts by him, and because of her insistence she was to be rewarded. Of course, she didn't know that Anakin wasn't looking to accept a student, because he knew he would be leaving the order. But if it is Ahsoka, he probably wouldn't mind accepting her publicly as his. Humming to himself, but out loud, Yoda replies, Yes, strong within the Force you are. Midi chlorians higher than my own Skywalker is. The same applies for you. The Jedi do standardized tests to see a student's Force sensitivity, but it isn't always done, and Ahsoka's was such a case. It had come to the Council's attention that Master Skywalker, along with other ladies, was close to the youngling Taino, and because of this had her tested. The results were quite staggering as she tested even higher within the Force than Yoda as well but not to the same exaggerated extent as Anakin. He is the chosen one after all. So, I will become strong just like Arnie. Yoda did think it was strange, and he had his suspicions as to why the girls were so attached. He knew of the boy's strangely compelling aura, and he tried to link that back to a Jedi once heard about some time ago. She would instinctively be able to rally the support of people subconsciously, because of her natural force abilities related to empathy, emotions and the mind. Maybe young Skywalker didn't know as well, that he had something like this. Yoda knew that Anakin had some secrets that everyone has and didn't want to pry to, much as it didn't seem like anything against the Order or its code. Maybe, they were harsh in their initial judgment of the boy, but that was things of the past, and it seemed like he had moved on. What Yoda didn't know however was that Anakin did move on. No, in fact he didn't move on at all. He wasn't at the Jedi's location in this instance, and always had his mind for himself, those he cared about and the people within his empire. Luckily the Jedi would both be getting some help, but unluckily get some damage done by Anakin in the future through the war. Perhaps, but time, dedication and effort to your future training you must have. Yoda stated, Thank you Master Yoda. You don't know what you have done. Ahsoka gave her thanks, and because of her feelings of gratitude, she decided she would reveal something to Yoda that wouldn't harm anyone. Especially since this secret had long been abandoned and was no longer used for Anakin. There is an entrance we're going deep down into the temple. There you will find an abandoned ancient Sith temple. Ahsoka said before getting up and leaving leaving Yoda behind confused. Ahsoka had revealed this because Anakin had already moved everything of importance out of the base he had made for himself underneath. It didn't have any sort of purpose for him anymore, and being it didn't serve a purpose it would be disposed of. Since the Jedi might want to learn of something like this, Ahsoka told Yoda to this piece of information as thanks that she would later on have to give her edited recount of events leading up to its discovery. Since she was the one to tell them of this, she would have to create the lie. Wait, Padawan Ahsoka. Yoda called out to her to stop. Yes. Ahsoka beamed from Leku to Leku at the address Yoda had called her by. She was no longer a youngling but a Padawan, an apprentice into someone she admired and loved a great deal as well. Come with me you must. Sith Temple beneath, tell me and the council you will. Yoda said in a tone of exasperation and seriousness, to make sure that Ahsoka knew of the severity of such a claim. Ahsoka was unfazed however, and is just happy. Sure, Master Yoda, I can do that. She was still smiling, like a baby that had gotten its favorite candy. Ahsoka would then go on to explain to the council members about the base hidden underneath. They would explore the Sith Temple, and discover the Virgin's present within the fort here. That was blocking their foresight. This in combination with other events would make Sidious more cautious, as now the Jedi would be aware of what had been hampering with their foresight base abilities. They may not be able to deal with this dark side vergence. But that wouldn't matter because as thanks, Anakin would absorb the Virgins into himself to further increase his pull within the Force. His power, strength and radiant energies. They wouldn't know of this event, but it would be done before he left. Again, Anakin has gotten a lot from the Jedi, and it would be unkind of him to not at least him them out a little with their problem. I am back. Anakin stated as he entered the Jedi Temple with Isla on his arm. Luckily there was no one else around as they would be either, at least suspicious of such behavior, and at most outraged, that they would be so bold to act like lovers within the season of spring. No, it is we are back. Isla supplied as she's still incredibly happy after recent events, and now that she had Anakin to herself, she would be able to come onto him. She didn't want it to be on Coruscant because she wasn't ready, and she appreciated that Anakin knew that. Now however, she thought to herself about when it would happen. If she didn't supply that she was, then it would never come because although lustful and greedy, Anakin was very compassionate and had a great deal of temperance. His self-control was so exemplary that she wondered if he had decided to just become a Jedi and follow through completely with the doctrine, would he ever be swayed? So, what do you think we will be doing then? Anakin had a smirk on his face as he saw the look within Isla's eyes, and felt the conflict within their bond. I, I don't know, she whispered with a shy expression. Let's go to my room then, there are all sorts of protections in place to stop intruders. Anakin said knowing that she was in the mood and wanted it, desired it more than ever, and if he didn't do anything now, it would be a while yet before he would get another chance. Not that it would be all that long. It just meant that mentally and emotionally, she wouldn't be ready again. If he just rejected her advances continuously, it would only make her feel inadequate, which would only become more of a problem as time passed. Isla just nodded and answered with a whisper. Okay? She cutely stammered. Anakin and Isla had gone back to his room. Isla was nervous. 
But Anakin was stone cold. Because there was no need to panic, he was not like Isla the Virgin. He was a Chad, a Sigma male. Enough with that. I just made myself cringe. Anakin thought to himself. Anakin coughed to himself as got his thoughts away from those silly things, as he had a lady to entertain. He wouldn't be a very good husband now if he couldn't fulfill the needs of his wife. Arnie. Isla questioned him as he closed the door behind him. Yes. He walked over to her as her eyes screamed desire. Will it hurt? She was nervous but not scared. No, she knew that Anakin would take care of her. But since this would be her first experience, she was anxious. From what I understand, the Twi'lek anatomy is similar to humans, and because of this, I am sure that it would. The only real difference compared to humans are Yoleku. Anakin said not really knowing or having gone in depth just to know about alien biology. Most of his time is focused on himself, and because of this it leads to most of his medical knowledge centered on humans. So you don't know. Isla just gave Anakin a deadpan stare. To sum it up, yes. Anakin answered honestly, as his roundabout way of giving an answer without answering didn't work. Isla having had enough of waiting jumped in. The two would then go back and forth emboldening each other, and Anakin had to make sure to keep the connection he has with the other girls off, otherwise they would feel the feedback of what was happening between the two of them. The diet certainly had many benefits, and just as he could feel her pleasure and even experience it, she would feel his and experience it as well. This basically means that they would exchange physical and spiritual feelings to the extent it became real. Anakin made sure that no one else would hear what was happening within the room, as that would be both dangerous, and he didn't like the idea idea of sharing even the sounds created from their coupling. He used the force but did so stealthily to accomplish what he wanted, as he could split his mind many different ways, not caring about efficiency. But most of his focus was on Isla in this moment. If Anakin did allow things to be heard, heated moans and groan would sound out from within. It would seem that Isla was not a screamer but she certainly increased the sensual experience of the situation. Anakin was also experiencing a release where he could finally get back to having the fruit he had enjoyed within his last life, and before he had to stop going to Coruscant brothels, after becoming official with Isla. He held in for a long time, and it was now he could finally indulge himself as much as he could. Isla would not be able to take him for the entirety of the nights and days he was capable of going on for. In the process of their coupling, the diet was becoming even stronger. As the two engaged each other in the experience, Anakin and Isla were able to see much more of each other's memories. Isla didn't see everything or anything like that, but she was able to see the pains he had went through. But because of their current activities, any of that angst was pushed away by the pleasure. Anakin as well was able to see some of her memories, and he decided just as he kept a tight lease on his own mind to make sure he didn't see or even transfer her memories into himself too much. Again he liked his privacy, and because of this he didn't want to invade hers as well. But at this point they have become one. The goal of the diet was for this sole purpose, or at least this version of the diet was. This would continue for about two hours before Isla would become both mentally and physically exhausted from the workout. In the morning she would feel sore, but she would remember this experience with extreme clarity. She was blissful, and instead of being turned into an absolute animal, she had managed to keep her sanity, instead of being broken. Why would Anakin want to break her anyway? She is his now and forever, there was no doubt about it. Thankfully because they are able to share in each other's physical feelings. Anakin was able to achieve his release as well. And he didn't bother to stop his seed from entering her as there was absolutely no chance of Isla being impregnated. The reason being that while it is possible for hybrids to exist, that was from genetic manipulation, and Anakin would have to change himself some to do so. In fact if he really wanted he could have included genetic compatibility between himself and other species, that were not human or nihuman through the art of the small. He didn't do this however, because there was no need for it before, but if he wanted to be able to have children with his more alien wives, it is a must. So after Isla and Anakin's intense battle was over, he proceeded to do just that. Just his cells, specifically his sperm cells to be capable of impregnating with perfect genetic stability, females from other species. He started with Twi'leks then moved on to Tegrutas and ended on Mare Islands. Because he was not currently connected with any other species other than humans and those mentioned. I think that is enough for now. Anakin thought to himself as Isla curled up on the bed into him. His size was great enough to make him cuddle her rather easily, and she, within her exhausted state of mind, was unconscious. She instinctively held onto him. He greedily returned this embrace as he didn't mind her doing this. There was no chance he would have a dead arm, simply because she used his arm as a pillow. His body and other factors are way too advanced for something like that to happen. While Isla slept Anakin really didn't have much else to do but just go over what was going on within the galaxy, or more specifically his own developing empire. The first thing he was alerted to was the uprising of some freedom fighters. He is unsure about what exactly these freedom fighters were fighting for, but they were harming the peoples and his own self-interests. That just wouldn't do. It would seem however that Grievous had already been tasked with dealing with the heretics, and his mother was the one conducting such actions. It had taken some time, but it would seem she is becoming more and more ruthless towards others, and while she has kept her kindness, it would seem however that she has developed a habit of giving out harsh punishments. This was probably not helped by the fact these rebels were trying to depose not only her, but also make sure he isn't able to assume the title of Emperor. His mother does love him a lot after all, and soon enough the both of them would be reunited, but he should at least try and do everything he could here before leaving. He still has some unfinished business on Coruscant that doesn't include the nexus underneath the temple, more involving Sidious and his plans, but it involved the underground corruption of Coruscant, 
He had essentially become the underboss of the criminal underworld of Coruscant, and he had reduced crime rates by a large amount. His persona as Vader was extremely powerful when it came to intimidation tactics, combine this with the voice and presto. Everyone, well, near everyone would bow down to him. Unfortunately, Vader was becoming more and more irrelevant, and he would have to retire Vader soon enough. Just as he is leaving the Jedi, Vader would be passing on his mantle to Anakin, so to speak. The large, massive and overwhelming droid army would all officially go under his control, after Vader sets it up for him. What he would do with the Nexus underneath however was another matter as currently within the Force, he has the capability of being able to crush an entire planet if he wanted. This was partially why he didn't want to create the Death Star, as there would be no need. So the Nexus and all its Force energy, would be purified before going into building his spiritual dimension, that he will start calling heaven. Why not? Heaven is a word connected to the sky, and through this it would be connected to myself and to the Emperor. Words have a lot of meaning in following his theme of naming things after himself and his new dynasty. He couldn't help himself as it helped to better have certain things associated with himself, whether that be people identifying with his Emperor, his spiritual realm or to himself and the genetic manipulations he has done to create new life. He would then go on to explore his current options within the expansion of his empire. For now he would wait for the Republic to retreat from its occupation of Geonosis, which would allow him expansion into another hyperspace lane. There were also other hidden hyperspace lanes that he had learned of from the fat slug named Jabba. He would be putting that information to a much greater use, as he expands his influence across the outer rims of the galaxy. It was the beginning of the end. The end beginning Anakin's temporary, extended stay with the Jedi, that is. Today, I will be imparting onto you my own code. Anakin spoke to the group of younglings for what could possibly be his last time teaching within the temple. Professor, what do you mean by your own code? A student asked him, yeah. Master Skywalker, you said we would be learning about the nature of the light side of the Force. Another youngling pointed out, Anakin had been trying to get the children to refer to him as a professor, or just simply use the term of Mr. instead of Master. Only a few ever did get brave enough to break away from the teachings of the Jedi openly, but there quite a lot of students that kept his teachings to the other Jedi hidden. He had requested of them to do so because the Jedi Council would be way too interested, but at this point he didn't care all that much. If the children were to blab it wouldn't affect him, and may even give him a reason to leave. Master Skywalker, another student questioned him as Anakin was withdrawn into himself. I am sorry, but I was just thinking. Thinking about what? The students were always curious to pick his mind because it was like he had an entire library within his head. Well, technically he did with his memories, thoughts and connection to the Matrix that has now spread throughout Tatooine and other star systems. He did. I was thinking about what is going to happen soon and how it would impact everyone. The Jedi, the Republic, myself, but most importantly the innocent lives of every person. That includes you little ones as well. Anakin spoke his mind knowing that sometimes children can give a solution to his troubled mind. I am sure you will overcome any problem you have, Master. One student said before the rest of the class joined in, to help boost his morale, that should be at a all-time high. He was afraid and he wasn't afraid to admit he is afraid. It would be foolish, incredibly so, to place those feelings within the back of his mind. It might just very well come to bite him in the ass. Thank you, all of you, for your words of encouragement. But what I was thinking about will not be solved by just overcoming it. There is a lot of things happening, and a lot more will happen within the coming years. And I have tried to prepare you all the best I can. Anakin looked at all of them, but there were only one class of the many he had taken over the years. He had developed a mentorship-like relationship to many of these children, and a lot of them looked up to him as some form of father figure. He wasn't against this as children need their parents whether the Jedi dislike to admit it or not. Because he had become a figure to look up to for many children, he would be putting himself and them on the line when leaving. But he had to do so. He just hoped that when the time came, they wouldn't be devastated or feel like he is abandoning them. That is far from the truth, and if he could he would take them all with him. But that would be doing the same that the Jedi had done. Kidnapping children. He would save them from any grim fate they may come across in the future, specifically with the destruction and dismantling of the Jedi Order. He would be there as he didn't want to see children die, not like how the original without a thought slaughtered them. Of course he could always make a case, but he would probably be unable to take any prospective students with him, at least he wouldn't be able to. He has a feeling that a lot of younglings and maybe even Padawans would try and follow him all the way back to Tatooine. He may be able to provide for them all, but he certainly isn't able to divide his attention that much. Well he can, but what he meant was that it would be extremely hard to provide familial love to them given he would be doing other things. What happened when his own family started to appear? Many things were complicated, and because these were young and impressionable people, he didn't want to give the wrong impression or pass down to them. That what he is doing is always right. He had to make sure people, especially the younglings, didn't see him as perfect. It would harm them in the future as it would come to pass. He would not be able to help absolutely everyone, even if he wanted to. I think that we should stop for now. Everyone here can take a break and go have some fun. Anakin said and the children without hesitation all agreed and ran outside of the classroom-esque space, going to do their own things. Sighing, Anakin walked out only to be stopped by one of the students within the class. I know that Master Skywalker is conflicted, but Master doesn't have to worry about us, or anyone else you have taken care of. The little human girl smiled and continued, I believe that no matter what you do, the decision will be the correct one. Anakin looks at the girl and tries to decipher why she had come, but threw that thought to the back of his mind, since the child was obviously just trying to cheer him up. Thank you. Don't worry. I am set in my decision. There will be no going back. It has always been this way. 
and I will continue down this path. Anakin patted the girl's head before walking off. What Anakin was going to talk about with the children was an elaboration of the force code he had recited and told them about. He gave that lesson at least once a year to every youngling he could, just to make sure they knew of the differences, the flaws, and could compare and contrast the meanings, hidden or otherwise within everything. One has to look underneath the underneath. It was something he would constantly tell everyone, every youngling he could to make sure they understood that there is always more. There is no end to one's journey throughout their lifetime, and that their evolution doesn't stop with becoming a Padawan, Knight, Master or even a member on the Jedi High Council. Flowing through all, there is balance. There is no peace without a passion to create. There is no passion without peace to guide. Knowledge fades without the strength to act. Power blinds without the serenity to see. There is freedom in life. There is purpose in death. The Force is all things and I am the Force. This is the full, complete version of the code he had adopted into his order. Flowing through all, there is balance. While the Force did indeed have inherently light and dark sides, and it can recognize that these aspects could not be separated without negative consequences. If the dark side and the Sith were to gain dominance, life would become self-destructive and be extinguished. However, if the light side and the Jedi Order's quest for peace were allowed to come to pass, the galaxy would fall to lethargy, apathy, and eventually fade and die. Both light and dark were part of the Force, and all aspects of the Force had to be studied and respected. This wasn't something that Anakin was the only one to know of, as there were certainly others that had discovered aspects of balance as well. Where the Sith and Jedi fail, Anakin will pick up the slack, and make sure that some semblance of balance is kept. There is no peace without a passion to create. There is no passion without peace to guide. For Anakin, passion was an integral part of life. Without it, what was to stop one from simply meditating on the mysteries of the Force until one's body atrophied? Yet, inner peace was needed to focus one's passions constructively and purposefully, rather than indiscriminate training, artifact hunting, or simple destruction with no ultimate goal. Passion without peace was simple madness. Peace without passion was apathy. Anakin is extremely passionate about everything he has been doing otherwise all of the amazing things he had done. All the good he has brought would not have been able to be made without his efforts. Without his drive to do something. But he had done so from a place of harmony, where he would crumble as his desires burn him from the inside out. He would burn from within if he didn't temper himself properly. Knowledge fades without the strength to act. Power blinds without the serenity to see. Finding truth promoting peace and understanding, these were noble pursuits. But without using the found truths to enact change or improvements in and around oneself, having the knowledge was meaningless. In the same way, power with no purpose beyond increasing itself held no greater meaning. Anakin had many ways to become powerful and become powerful he did, and this is where he needed to have a purpose for this power. This purpose was originally to protect himself and his mother, but that desire has only grown over time. Now he has much more to protect, he wouldn't stop increasing his power, not only for himself but for others, and for his liberation from the Force. There is freedom in life, there is purpose in death. In order for life to exist, there must be chaos and order at an equal level. Level. Sometimes laws needed to be broken and sometimes chaos must be brought to order. However, neither should be ended permanently. The push and pull between the two kept the galaxy alive, regrowing and changing and improving itself. Life is change. Evolution is key to that change, and through this change, Anakin would only continue to grow stronger and stronger. He may have immortality, which should mean he would remain unchanged, but the fact of the matter was that he could change himself whenever, transform his biology and genetic makeup to better suit his needs, or change his mindset to become better adapted to the current culture, religion or way of life. If he couldn't move along with the times, he would only be left behind. The Force is all things, and I am the Force. Light and dark, good and evil, life and death, action and inaction and reaction, peace and war, the Force encompassed all aspects of the galaxy. Anakin knew that to truly be a guardian of life, one could not choose. Life could not be denied its emotions, death had its place, and rejecting or focusing on a few aspects while ignoring others was simply denying reality in oneself. Becoming a complete being and guardian of the Force demanded embracing it all, which is something Anakin had been doing for a long while now. He may like the Force, but he didn't have complete separation if he wanted, and his goal to create his own Force-based energy field and modification of midi-chlorians may go against this tenet. Or, Anakin had done such a good job in interpreting the code he took it literally. He would become the Force and the Force would become him, meaning he would actually and truly be the push, the pull, the negative and positives. He would become death, life and everything in between. The living and the cosmic. Rumors had now been spread throughout the Jedi Order about some sort of faction or order on the outer rims within the Emperor. This prompted people to look into this supposed order of Force-sensitive individuals that were not he Jedi. The Jedi High Council had been informed of this, and all had convened to figure out just what was going on, even though they were just rumors. It could bring about a big change if it happened to be real. Interesting these rumor are. Yoda spoke as they were discussing just what this piece of information is. Master T, have you found out the origins of these rumors surrounding this new and mysterious order? Mace asked Shark as she had been tasked within the investigation, but she already knew about this, so she didn't say anything except an editor truth. She didn't like lying to any of them, as even though she isn't that particularly close to anyone, it still created this burden within her mind to keep things hidden from other figures of authority. I have discovered that it comes from within the temple. That is all. She revealed as this set off another round of discussion about the possibility that the sis is somehow involved in this, when this new order itself and its location is supposedly in the Emperor, a place that the Jedi are allowed to go to, along with anyone else. But that doesn't mean it was where they were needed at the moment. 
The beginning of the Clone War has set off a chain of events that has led them to be strapped on resources, both within the Order and the Republic. Send someone we must to go towards and discover if the rumors are true. Validity of the claim must be confirmed. Mundi spoke being the most zealous of the Jedi Masters within the room. Don't you think we are being too rash here? Deeper questioned. There must be a reason such a rumor exists. And if we find the one who has started it, we can take action depending on what this person can provide to us in information. Master Balaba is correct. Delve deeper we must. Yoda said. We don't have enough time. I am afraid Master Yoda that this is something that would cause a schism within our order. Mace continued. The Republic is in dire need of our assistance, and it would seem that there is no one else here that could help. The direction the Senate had been going in was to make the Jedi Generals of the War, de facto because there was no one else but the Jedi to better represent the Senate and the Republic. They were the most centralized faction a part of the system of the Republic, so of course they would be dragged into the mess. They shouldn't really. But due to a many number of things, events, people pushing and swaying everything within a certain direction, the Jedi can't do much but agree. Of course they could always default back to their monk peacefulness, but that wasn't going to happen and the Jedi would be forced into the front lines. Masters, Knights and even Padawans. The battlefield is no place for a child, but there would be several going there. Has there been any word from the Senate? Mace asked and Plo Koon replied. There has. From their talks with the Emperor and they have not said that there is such an order. They also tried to stay away from this for some reason and even though it doesn't go against the agreement between the Republic and the Emperor and it certainly has created some tensions. Plo Koon finished. Tensions it has created, yes. Chaos within the order even more so. Yoda nodded in agreement. The order was within a precarious state as those that didn't want to be involved with the war might try to leave at the mention of this new order, far away from the problems of the Republic. The Jedi and those within weren't just mindless drones listening to their Queen Bee for instructions, but had independent wills of their own. This only got worse with Anakin's influence from top to bottom. Albeit, it was mostly the younglings and recent Padawans that were influenced by Anakin's involvement in the teaching process. Even more so was the fact that what Anakin has preached to some people before, and his disagreements with the Code, the Order and whatever else there was. Calm those within the Jedi, we must. Bring Anakin we must further investigation need it is. Yoda said as a closing, which lead to everyone filing out of the room. Palpatine was intrigued beyond belief by the fact there was something that called his attention, immediate attention, that could very well be a massive hindrance to his plans, if it wanted to be that is. The Emperor had been a thorn in his side, where concessions had to be made to appease the rapidly expanding Empire. That was ruled with both the Iron Fist and Gentle Palm of Shmai Skywalker. Of course he knew better than to believe that such success was brought on just by that former slave. It was impossible for something like to succeed without the aid of something or someone powerful. Whether that be someone with the mind, force abilities or pure charisma needed to create and pull to put people under their thumbs without them realizing this fact. My lord, I have noticed some movements that would indicate that the Emperor is interested in Geonosis. Dooku spoke over a holographic communication device. What? Angered, Sidious came out from his inner self. Tell me, what else is going on over there? What with the supposed for sensitive order that preaches about the balance? His voice was especially toxic today. It would seem. It is as it would seem, from my correspondence with them, there has been very little mention about anything like that. Dooku replied. Will they be joining either side of the war? Have they made their decision? Sidious asked with haste. Yes, they have decided to not participate and will continue to not do so. But it would seem like despite this, they are willing to step on our toes. Dooku responded, that stupid wench. Sidious even more so angry than he was through stuff around using telekinesis, and lightning rippled around him in his madness, before he recollected his mental state of frame. Sidious was of course referring to Shmai, the current empress who has been getting in the way of his plans on a smaller scale. But if she were to decide to take over Geonosis, it would be a huge setback for Sidious and Dooku. They still needed some way to continue replenishing their armies, and they had also given a sizable chunk of the Trade Federation's wealth, resources and droids. Sidious had been planning to use, or more like he was controlling Dooku, to continue using the Sis, in an effort to make sure he become closer and closer to absolute authority, as the Republic goes from a Republic into a dictatorship, then eventually into an empire where he would rule as an emperor. The wealth, the power, the prestige, fame, glory he would bring to the Sith, and he would be able to engrave his name within the history books as the best and most brilliant Sith to ever exist. He would create an empire, he would live forever, and he would in an effort to emulate his ancient Sith masters recreate the eternal Sith Empire. This time it would be a success. Or at least that was what Sidious told himself, completely sold on the idea he would be forever, eternal, and would never die. Killed by the Force, by someone else. The decay of his body and physical form, all of it would be nothing in the face of his grand design. Master, Dooku questioned as he didn't know whether or not Sidious had calmed down from his anger. Do not worry, my apprentice. It was merely a brief release of my pent-up energy. You wouldn't believe the idiocy of the Republic. Sidious said as he had to hide himself again, which was becoming harder and harder as time passed by. His skin if becoming paler and paler by the day, his skin is sagging, which makes him look old. Very old, despite not being that old for the Republic's standards. Of course, Master. I was wondering if there was anything I could do to stop the Emperor from claiming Geonosis. But I couldn't come up with anything that would be viable without exposing ourselves. Dooku said, That is fine, we will just have to work around this problem. Sidious clenched his teeth as he continued. 
There are many more opportunities, but for now it would seem you will have to ration out some of the droids you currently have in stock. Yes, Master. Dooku's comlink went off, and now Sidious was left all alone with his brewing thoughts and emotions. I will be leaving the Order. What did you say? I said I am leaving the Order. As of this instant, this moment, I will no longer be a Jedi. Anakin, you can't possibly mean what you are saying. Do you even hear what you are saying? The two talking to each other are Anakin and Qui-Gon. Of course I know. Anakin replied, if I was unaware of what I had just said, I would be insane. Qui-Gon with clear dreadful surprise asked as a pit in stomach was felt. Please, you should reconsider your decision. I suggest that we both forget that this conversation even took place. Master, you can't unhear and undo my decision. Do you not understand the things I have gone through to have you join? Qui-Gon asked, what about all of the things I have taught you? I am well aware of your efforts and the efforts of everyone else that has helped me. But that doesn't mean I should stay. Chosen one or not, I am my own person, and my decision is final. Anakin stated firmly. Anakin, Qui-Gon started. I know that you have had your disagreements about the code and with the order overall but you can't just go when you may be needed most. Do you not understand that leaving now could have major consequences? I understand. I don't think you do. There are many of whom would just like to leave the Order. You aren't the only one, and if you go, the Chosen One leaves. It would create a chain reaction within the Order, with many Jedi leaving either to follow after you or go to wherever else they can. Qui-Gon said. Anakin had wanted to inform his masters both of them. First he has confronted Qui-Gon about his leaving, and this reaction is the one he expected. Look, I have had it many times wanted to leave the Order myself. Especially after discovering the truth about spiritual immortality by becoming a ghost. But that doesn't mean I left. I stayed because, by the Force, do I know that I am needed? Qui-Gon explained with a weary sigh and a sagging of his shoulders. Have you not though about why I wanted to go? Anakin questioned. I have. Qui-Gon answered waiting for Anakin to continue. Then you mustn't stop me. I will go and inform Master Window as well. I wanted to give the both of you a proper goodbye, and thanks for what the both of you have provided for me. Anakin said, grateful for the two's guidance, but that's just it. It was just guidance, nothing more, nothing less. Having nothing more to say to Anakin, Qui-Gon could only sigh. Fine. If that is what your decision is and believe that it is the right choice may the Force guide you down your path as it knows, and I know that you will need it. Bowing, but not a full-on bow, Anakin says. Thank you master. Anakin was not bowing anymore. There is something I wanted to ask you however, and that is if you wanted to leave with me. But from your reaction, it would seem that despite considering it and having done so for some time, you are unwilling to go. You are correct in assuming that I would reject your offer. The Republic is now within a precarious spot, and even after the war, I would probably stay. There is nothing more outside of the life of a Jedi for me, Qui-Gon said. Anakin knew that Qui-Gon would stay as a Jedi, and even if you left, he would leave as a Jedi, and he would most certainly die a Jedi. It was within Qui-Gon's nature to be like this. I will now go to Master Windu, and also inform him of my decision before going to the Council. Anakin said, yes, that is for the best. Qui-Gon replied as it seemed he had aged quite a bit. Anakin could have gone off the grid just like Dooku had, and reappear with the Emperor, leading his people into new heights, while the Jedi scrambled to find him. But that wouldn't create the impact he wanted, he needed to make his decision public, at least within the temple. Then there was the girls he had grown close to that would undoubtedly be sad, if he just disappeared out of nowhere, because they would try to follow him as well. How could allow them to stay behind but leave himself, he didn't want to make anyone choose between himself and something else. That was wrong, just as he didn't want to choose one girl over the others, as that would be against him. If he had to choose between who to save off of a cliff and someone had to die, he would go against the options presented and create his own, even if it meant he would die trying to change that fate. If he truly had to choose between the Order and the Emperor, however, he would choose the Emperor. It was the thing he had spent a lot of time and effort on, and while he has tried within the Jedi to create an environment that is better, he couldn't. Now he would have to continue making his own path. Within the Force, his life, the Empire and lives of those within and finally his own destiny would be taken into his own hands, and not placed within the decaying hands of the Jedi. As when those hands decay he could fall right into the decaying hands of Sidious, where he would most definitely try to crush him with all his might. Anakin left Qui-Gon alone within their training room they used to use. Master Windu, Anakin said as he had arranged to meet up with Mace. Anakin, why have you called me here specifically to talk alone? Mace questioned him. I am here to tell you about an important decision I have decided to make. Anakin said as Mace waited for him to continue. I will be leaving. What do you mean leaving? If you are talking about going somewhere, you are a grown adult. There is no need to inform me of your decision. Mace could see that Anakin wasn't talking about leaving Coruscant for a little bit. But that isn't what you meant, is it? Mace finished. No, it isn't. Anakin said with a shake of his head. Okay then. It would seem that is something important. Don't tell me you have somehow broken the code, perhaps. Have you grown attached to something or someone? Mace questioned Anakin. It is not just about the code, Master. Anakin replied. Not just about the code, so you have broken it. What else have you done then? Mace was questioning him calmly, and didn't seem all that upset with his implied reasoning for Anakin coming to him. I am leaving the order. Anakin decided to just drop the bomb. This gets a reaction out of the calm Mace, as he wasn't expecting something like this. What? Mace was now standing from his seated position. Did I hear you correct? I hope you did, your is must be failing you. Anakin tried to implant some subtle humor to make sure Mace doesn't get too heated. No. What do you mean no? My ears are not failing me, of course. 
Mace replied, but continued while staring intensely at Anakin. I meant, no, you are not leaving. I will forget this conversation has ever started or happened at all, leave now before I reprimand you. Strangely enough, Mace was within the same denial that Qui-Gon was experiencing when Anakin had said he was leaving, trying to come up with excuses, reasons to stay. They were both going through the stages of loss, but in a weird manner. Shock and denial, pain and guilt, anger and bargaining, depression, the upward turn, reconstruction and working through, acceptance and hope. Master Windu, you cannot undo my choice. It doesn't work like that, Anakin stated. I will tell you now that I am not the only one who is looking to leave the Order, and I am sure you are aware of the fallout that would happen when I leave. Calming down, Mace sits back down. What is the reason for your leaving? It seemed like he got over it quite quickly. There are many, some you are aware of, and some you are not. Anakin answered, may I know of the ones I am unaware of. Mace continued to stare at Anakin intensely, as if he was trying to see through him, and look into the enigma that Anakin is. Anakin then went on to tell Mace a many number of things. Not everything per se, but enough to inform him of why exactly he is leaving, and that he is aware of the fact they wouldn't change even if he left, but it would still make them reconsider how they have been doing things. Of course, the reason wasn't only just because of the Jedi. There were also his own selfish reasons of wanting to go, and who he would be taking with him. Anakin didn't leave out much of why and he did supply he was going to go back to the Emperor and, and there he would take his place as the new ruler. Not that he wasn't always the sole and only true Emperor of the Prospering Empire. And that is all, at least all I am willing to share. Anakin finished. Anakin, no Master Skywalker. Mace started. It would seem that you have been lying to the Jedi Council since the very start. I hope that you do not take this the wrong way. But I have always had my reasons for joining, and those reasons were inherently selfish in nature. Anakin replied. I wholeheartedly appreciate the teachings, guidance and everything else the Jedi know you and Master Qui-Gon have taught me. Without it, I am sure that I would not be where I am today without you two. Without the Jedi, I would not have progressed so fast and developed in a way I liked, and for that I thank you. Anakin bowed to Mace as he finished. Mace got up and walked to Anakin and placed a hand on his shoulder and sighed. Anakin, Mace paused before continuing. There is not much I could say to change your mind now is there. He said this more to himself than to Anakin as he knew, right from the start that Anakin was different from the rest. Different from his previous students, different from every other Jedi and his thoughts while being more in line with Kui Jin was still skewed away from the Jedi. Not necessarily in line with the thoughts of the Sith but it was still not the way a Jedi would think, and because of this, the Council wanted Anakin away from the temple as much as possible. They have given Anakin the job as a teacher, and his way of thinking had infected a lot of their students. Unfortunately, everything that led up to such a thing and his continued persistence in staying within the temple in the end won out. No, there is probably nothing you could do. Your words will be ignored, and your actions would be taken as a threat to my safety and freedom. Anakin stated, I will call an emergency meeting then. May sighed and still decided to support his former student. An emergency meeting was being held, and Shuck knew that this meeting was going to be a huge factor in deciding whether or not she would leave with Anakin. She was extremely connected as while she loved the Order. Her feelings had at this point surmounted her attachment to the Order and now she wanted him. Especially after his secret marriage with Senator Amidala and her fellow Jedi, Ala Sakura. Filing in, while some masters on the council were not present and had been sent out of Coruscant to help with the war efforts. Master Windu, why have we all been gathered here? And why is Master Skywalker here along with us? Is it something important? Mundi asked as if he had some important business to get to. Yes, tell us you will. Yoda added as he was curious as well. It was not often an emergency meeting was called. Even more so by Windu as he wasn't the type to talk things through, and would rather solve problems himself immediately by taking action. It was seen throughout how he did things, whether that was from teaching to missions and other things Jedi do. At least he could be calm enough to meditate. It is not I that has something important to say, but Master Skywalker that needed everyone's audience. Mace answered as now everyone looked concerned because there was something within the Force, telling them that something of grave importance was happening at this moment. Shark was the only one who knew what this meant, she has been an active participant after all. When it came to fostering Anakin's desire, to leave. It didn't help that how she had become connected to him in a more intimate manner. Well, what is it then? Yaddle spoke as she was somewhat close to Anakin, because he had some interest in the species herself and Yoda are. I have come to all of you today to say Anakin left off to create some dramatic effect. I am leaving the Order. This sends the room into some chaos as every so often the Masters would talk over each other to question Anakin. Why he was doing this? How could he do this? And many other things were said. Anakin with his superior hearing was even able to pick up a... Eh? Well, it finally happened. Silence. That got everyone's attention as Yoda now commanded the room. Enough this is. Young Skywalker's reasons he must explain. Anakin then went on to recount everything, all of this reasons, conveying his disappointment that he was unable to do anything to change their fate, which raised a few eyebrows, physically for those who had eyebrows, and mentally for those without. He didn't go into as much detail with everyone here as he did with Qui-Gon or Mace. But he still said enough to make sure that they knew that he wasn't the only one going to leave. He would be leaving with Barris, Ilar and his now new apprentice Ahsoka. Something of which should surprise him, as he didn't think Ahsoka would still become his apprentice, because of the changes he had made. 
Hand over your lightsaber, you must. Yoda didn't give an argument, and just asked Anakin for the saber he had with him. This was one of the reasons he was not all that fussed about what lightsaber he would get as lightsaber are lost all the time. He knew that he would be returning it. It was a feeling even if he left secretly, he would have still left the saber behind. It wasn't perfect, and it certainly could have been done with much more effort creating something truly unique for himself would come soon enough. But Master Yoda, dash no, silent everyone must be. Skywalker's choice respected it will be. Yoda said as Anakin needed to hand over his saber, but he did something with the crystals within, because that could be dangerous. He manipulated the force energies of both to completely mix with each other causing both of the crystals to become full on purple. After everything had been settled, it was now time for Anakin to leave, but Shark had something to say herself. Wait, wait, Shark T's voice was heard throughout the room as everyone was just lamenting Anakin's decision. What is it Master T? Deepa Balaba, one of the council members questioned her. I also have something to say. She paused as she gathered her bravery to fully exert it in this instance. I will be leaving the council and the Jedi Order as well. This sets of another round of people talking over each other is seemingly out of nowhere. Another one of their Jedi members were leaving, and this time it was someone who was sat upon the council. Reason tell us you will. Yoda spoke which had the room quiet down. While Mace was silent throughout the entire ordeal. I, I have to go with Anakin. She spoke and then continued. But I am not just leaving because of him. I have enjoyed and appreciated my time here within the temple. It is just that it is now my time to leave. And there is nothing else here left for me. You like Saber you will return as well. Yoda replied not fighting her over this decision. Of course. Thank you master. Shark bowed to Yoda before getting up herself and moving towards Anakin. This time Anakin was now joined with Shark as he could now leave. And he wouldn't have any massive farewell. Or at least that is what he believes. His students that caught wind of his soon to be departure and everyone else affected by his actions, would be there when they left. Anakin along with Shark, had rejoined Isla, Barris and Ahsoka, all of whom were within the training room awaiting the news of what was happening, and knowing that they would be going as well. None of them really had the courage to say they wanted to leave themselves, so Anakin had to take things into his own hands. Of course this was just a way to avoid responsibility if something goes wrong. It is an instinctive thing to do. Has it been done? Barris rushed up to Anakin and questioned with some fear leaking through the bond he shared with her. It has. Anakin replied, and, Ahsoka was the one to continue here, and, we can go. Anakin continued for her. Just like that? Isla questioned. Just like that? But you three will have to return your lightsabers as well. Don't worry about that however, we can always make new ones. Anakin replied. Anakin didn't take their lightsabers with him because they were trying to dodge the responsibility of their choice to leave with him. So they would have to confront the masters as they hand in their lightsabers as they leave. He can't be acting as a shield for them all the time. Accountability is something important to building character after all. The group had built up a lot of tension the past few days. Because even they were all prepared for the potential fallout, they didn't want to have to go against the Jedi. Despite how strong everyone here is, especially the girls bonded to Anakin through the dyad, and not to mention Anakin himself. It would be extremely hard to fight their way out, of course they could have snuck out, and that was what everyone would have done. But now that they don't have to do something like go on the run, then everything would be just fine. You guys can go and pack your things while I deal with sorting my own things out, Anakin stated. Ahsoka was the first to go as she was the most excited at the prospect of moving to a new place, somewhere that wouldn't be the same four walls she had to stay in. She had been within the temple her whole life, and had not once been given the chance to leave, and she knew that even though she had visions that showed her a great deal of things, it wasn't enough for her. She wanted to go out there to experience these things herself. I am already ready. Barris inserted her own progress, which was already done. Which is what Isla and Ahsoka should have done, and Anakin didn't really include Shark within this, as she was undecided in leaving before that point. Already ready. It would seem that someone is able to listen to my instructions at least. Anakin replied nodding his head. Barris is probably looking forward to being able to spend more time with Anakin or more time with Shmai back on Tatrine, as she rather liked Anakin's mother, and knew that if she wanted to have a relationship with Anakin, it would probably be prudent to approach his mother. She was in charge of one of the most prospering and fast-growing empires in the galaxy after all. As everyone went off to do their own things, Anakin would have to reveal to Barris now that she was probably going to be his third, or maybe even fourth girlfriend at this point, because he had gotten married to both Isla and Padme. Well, how do I explain this? Anakin looked towards the witness, Shark. Don't look at me. It is you that has some explaining to do, not me. She replied leaving him out, cut and dry. Sighing, he replies. Okay? What are you guys talking about? Barris was naturally curious as it involved telling her something. Well, you see Anakin would then go on to explain what had happened on Naboo. What? Already. Barris seemed distressed, so Anakin just gave her a hug to make her mental distress go away. Of course it doesn't work, but it does at least calm her down. Why? She questioned him. You know why? Or at least I have told you why Anakin started. I mean, why not me? Barris said as she continued to embrace Anakin once he did wrap his arms around her. She heard the four beats of his hearts. They created a clear rhythmic tone that lulled her mind. Why not you? You are also aware of the reason as well. Anakin replied. She hugged him as tightly as she could. I know. Barris said in a depressed tone. I still want you. So become mine. Anakin continued before being interrupted. Someone coughs, which interrupts this moment the two share. It was Isla who had now come back with everything she had while standing next to Shark, who by now is used to displays of affection like this between Anakin and his loved ones. Ahsoka came by only a few seconds later, and could tell that there was some awkwardness within the atmosphere. 
but didn't put much thought into it as she said, Okay, I am ready to go. Great, let's be off then. Anakin said as he had now become detached from Barris. The five of them left as Anakin told the droids to move on out ahead of time. He didn't want to leave these things behind after all. They all went towards the main entrance and exit of the temple, and were surprised at the should-have-been-expected event. Master Skywalker, many younglings and even young Padawans, had come to the entrance in preparation of him leaving, while some of the more brave Jedi had already left the Order without telling them. The more honorable ones stayed behind to give a proper leave and goodbye to the Order they would have given their lives to. What are you all doing here? Anakin questioned the crowd as he used a voice amplification module within his nano suit. Someone from the crowd comes and walks closer towards him and the girls. It was the human girl the youngling that had tried to reassure him after his last class. Master Skywalker, we are all here to give you your farewell, the girl said. Looking at everyone Anakin felt some happiness, and it showed as his face started to smile. Seeing the faces of those he has taught or those who were learning from him, it certainly brought a smile to his face, but he couldn't bring them with him. Some other time, for sure he would bring as many as he could back to his empire. He would have to find everyone here a family to adopt them, and that would take time. But even then, by the time everything should be over, they would all be adults or close to being adults at that time. I thank you all. From the bottom of my heart, I am both proud and grateful for being able to pass on my knowledge and wisdom to all of you. If anyone else that has been taught by me isn't here today, then you guys will be tasked with passing on my message. Anakin stated, My message being, You are all welcome to come to the Emperor, the place I originate from. The Empire I take pride in being its prince and future leader. Anakin continued, I will not regret my decision here today. And you too should not regret coming to my new empire if you so choose. The Jedi are not perfect, but that doesn't mean I am perfect as well. There are many things that are changing and are still changing, but the Jedi, for me is a dead end. A place that I will be grateful for, but my time here is at an end. All of you here should not follow me. This decision is something that would last a lifetime, something that would change the course, fate and destiny of yourself and those around you. Anakin still continued on. I hope that you all will become excellent Jedi, if you so choose, or a force sensitive that is able to maintain balance. Or you may want to do something else with your life other than being a part of the Jedi Order. I will accept, no, the Emperor will accept all of those willing. This is my message. Anakin finished. Anakin would then go on with the girls and leave, but not before having the three, Isla, Ahsoka and Barris return their sabers themselves. Once going through with this they learned that taking accountability for their actions wasn't as bad as they thought, and in fact relieved them of this uncomfortable feeling. That feeling being guilt. Guilt that they couldn't live up to their decisions, that they couldn't remain true to themselves, and unsure of why they left with Anakin. By doing this it reassured and reaffirmed their desires to leave, because it came from themselves, within, and there was no room left for hesitation. Now that everything is ready, they all boarded Anakin's ship, Jabitha, and headed towards their new life. What could it possibly be however is an entirely different matter. One thing was for certain, however, they knew they would at least experience happiness as long as it is with Anakin. He would make a great father. Shark and Isla had the same thought as they reviewed what had happened at the entrance of the Jedi Temple. It would seem that he was well received, well liked and maybe even loved by the children as a paternal figure. What are you thinking about? Qui-Gon was approached by Mace as they had seen from afar Anakin's speech and message to the younglings and Padawans. That had a mass for his leave. I am thinking about why exactly Anakin is leaving. What he had brought up to me is worrying, as I am able to see his reasoning. Qui-Gon supplied. Really? Mace said as he asked. He asked me to leave with him. Can you believe it? Qui-Gon asked a rhetorical question I do. While I wasn't formally invited like you, Skywalker did subtly imply he would like for me to join him along with those girls he left with. Mace answered however. Yes, intriguing that he is able to pull such support. Even from within the council itself, Qui-Gon said as he was still in disbelief over the matter. The boy? No he is a man now. Skywalker is a ladies man. It would seem he has managed to seduce members of our order to join him. Mace said. From what I understand, they were forced to hand in their lightsabers instead of having Anakin do it for them. Qui-Gon replied thinking about that. It would seem that they had their own reasons to leave as well. And it was just that Anakin is the catalyst. Yes, we now must prepare for a surge in Jedi members leaving. Mace said thinking about the fallout as it had already begun. While there wasn't a massive spurt as soon as the news spread, Anakin's leaving did get around. And those within the temple and members outside of the temple within other Jedi divisions were starting to leave as well. Of course this wasn't right across the board, and they would still have thousands of members easily. It was just that they were now within a time of war. And any members, especially those of whom are actual knights or masters are needed. Yes, I fear for what is to happen. Qui-Gon replied, fear not, you must. Dark side has fallen. Yoda came into the room of the two masters. The Clone Wars has begun. Dangerous it will be, members we do need. Count Dooku made movements he has, but the Emperor has as well. What do you mean, Master? Qui-Gon asked. Gotten word I have. Emperor settling on Geonos as they are. Set back to the Sis. This is. Yoda said. That is right. It was only a few days since the Republic had withdrawn, and Anakin or his mother had already gone about to conquer new lands, opening up a new route for them, and helping secure their spatial borders. Geonosis was now under the control of the Emperor. That is fast. Mace questioned. Thankful we are did not join the Sis. Yoda replied. Taken they have no time 
time to retaliate Doku had. That is good then. Mace said. Good. Meaning is still to be determined. Good. Bad. In between. No not but with time we will. Yoda continued. While this was going on, Sidious had come to the conclusion that it was Vader, that reclusive and elusive general to the Emperor, behind all the events that were happening, and that have happened. How else would all of his plans be swayed and turned into a different direction, if not at the hands of another aggressive but passive player within the game of chess? Vader and Sidious were fighting each other mentally, and trying to outdo each other, and Vader seemed to know of his moves ahead of time. Everything that was happening indicated to Sidious that Vader was at least force sensitive and remembering his time conversing with Vader long ago. He is cautious. Cautious because Vader could hide his false sensitivity from him as well. Just like he had been doing with the Jedi for a long time now. I will find out your identity. Sidious wanted to claim the Emperor, but he was getting ahead of himself and needed to assert his dominion and control over the Republic first, before he could set his eyes on other things outside of the scope of his current mantle. It was probably a misplay on Sidious's part on trying to make the Emperor annex control over towards the Republic as now. They had leeway when it came to many things, meaning that it would be harder to go against them politically, although any sort of intrigue. The publicity would be awful if he did anything that tried to harm an innocent bystander within the war that had started. Soon Sidious finished thinking to himself. Squealing was heard from within Jabitha as we rejoined the group now headed towards Emperor Space. There was one place in particular that Anakin wanted to return to as he was to deliver the good news. There were many people waiting for him on Tatrine, and it would be remiss of him not to meet with them again. Ahsoka, why don't you come down? Isla called out from where she was seated. No one was piloting the ship as Jabitha was fully capable of handling herself. Ahsoka was just having too much fun within the ship. She had never been on Jabitha before, and was extremely interested in what exactly Jabitha was. Living, the ship is living, and Ahsoka is hooked on the fact that she is living and connected to Anakin through a special bond, not like the one he shares with the others. But it was something different in nature, and because of this Ahsoka wanted to know more about it. This is so cool. Ani, why didn't you take me on this ship? Ahsoka asked as she came around. Well, now that you are my apprentice, I believe that if Jabitha allows it of course, that you may use her as much as you like. Anakin replied. Aboard Jabitha, they were all doing their own things, and from time to time would converse with each other as there really much else to do other than watch things. There was however, the stuff Anakin had installed into Jabitha because he didn't want to be bored himself when using Jabitha to travel to places. She may be fast, but that doesn't mean she is absolute, meaning that, that there is always room for improvement. But he knew that if Jabitha got any more faster than she was now, it could start to break down space-time around them, moving so fast that she would create breaks or wormholes within time and space just by her speed, which would be dangerous if the exterior of her hull is unable to resist such a force. Really? And how did you know that Master Yoda made me your Padawan? Ahsoka had this curious look on her face. I don't know. Maybe I can read your mind. Anakin replied. You can if you want too, but I know that you wouldn't, Ahsoka said in full confidence of his moral standing. You are right about that, Anakin replied. I think that now you are my apprentice, it should be around the time I start taking your training seriously. Are we what? Ahsoka stammered. E, but I wanted to go play those virtual reality video games. There is no time to have fun with that, come. We will use the training sabers I have. Let's see just where your lightsaber combat abilities stand. Anakin stated as he started to walk into another room. But we don't even have proper sabers to use anymore. Ahsoka was starting to question the sanity of Anakin as she followed after him. Isla, Shark and Barris were within their own worlds as they had full access to the ship as well. It was hug enough to house all of them with separate bedrooms and all. In fact, Jabitha had six rooms, and Isla had taken to going to Anakin's room during their short trip to the Emperor. While Anakin and Ahsoka were within the room that had been temporarily remodeled into somewhere everyone could train, because they now needed to reacquaint themselves to combat without lightsabers, at least for the time being, Isla and Barris were having a conversation. A conversation that wasn't heated, but because Barris was slightly sad and jealous due to Anakin having already gone ahead and married Isla and Padme, she wanted to do so as well. Hey Barris. Isla greeted the slightly downtrodden girl. Yes. Barris didn't hate or feel angry at anyone in particular, since she knew the situation, and was well aware of what could happen. She more so mad at herself for having waited this long, and now another woman has entered into a relationship with Anakin, without being bound by the diet. Don't worry. Isla said as she patted her shoulder. That's easy for you to say. You are the one married to Arnie, having sex with him. Barris gave Isla a pointed look. Ha huh, H, how did you know? I thought no one could hear. Isla whispered the last part to herself, and was surprised to discover that the interior of Jabitha isn't as soundproof as she thought. Jabitha, I thought you could cancel out the sound. Isla spoke out loud, and Jabitha replied mentally to Isla. I am though Jabitha said though telepathic communication. Of course we could feel it. Barris started. Feel it. Isla questioned now feeling very confused. Through the bond remember, we feel everything Anakin feels if he doesn't block himself. Barris said thinking Isla had gone a bit blank within her mind. E, but, I thought could. Isla stammered as she was trying to come with a reliable answer as to why this has happened. I thought so as well. Shark came into this situation as she had also felt Isla and Anakin's passionate time together, which also happened to allow them to feel that same pleasure and release. Shark continued with a little blush. I believe that from how I understand it is that because of the closeness and vicinity to each other, we are able to feel it. That is right, the Force Dyer becomes stronger and stronger and at some point becomes so strong to the point it would be unbreakable throughout time and space. How does this relate to the inability to block out the bond? Simple. 
While Anakin was extremely powerful and had developed his mental capabilities to be able to stop most of the transmission of feelings, the strength of the bond, or more in particular, the strength of the invasiveness of the dyad was strength in the close, the bonded are closer to each other. While Anakin could stop memories and thoughts through the bond while in such close proximity, when it came to the act of making love, Anakin had very little control in such transmissions of emotions. That is right, when near each other Anakin and the girls should be able to sense each other's emotional state based on the bond. The further away, the harder it is to sense those emotions, but because of such strength, if someone wanted to know what they were feeling, they could do so. This is quite embarrassing, so you all felt what Anakin and myself shared. Isla asked for the blush of her own. Yes. Shark and Barris both said at the same, with Shark just giving Isla a deadpan, while Barris bore holes into Isla's head. Whoa, calm down there, it isn't my fault that you haven't approached Ani yourself. Isla said as she saw Barris's look. Barris looked away. I know that. She harumphed. Stop being like that, you know how Ani feels, and you also know how you feel. So what is stopping you? We are not a part of the Jedi anymore. We are free to do what we want, however much we want with Ani. Shark said as Barris was being a grum. I don't know. Barris said more to herself rather than the others. Okay? We are here. Anakin stated as he exited the ship. He was excited because he could finally put to ease the uneasy feeling of staying with the Jedi, as he knew this was from the Force telling him that it would be bad to stay any longer. He knew of this fact himself. But it great to know that the Force is starting to more and more let him be and do his own thing. Without trying to direct him, of course it would still do so. But that is par for the course about how the Force is. The reason he could put to why the Force was not acting on getting him to turn to the dark side and destroy the Jedi, then return to the light and destroy the Sith is probably because of the massive progress it had made in balancing its energies on Geonosis. So this is your home planet. Ahsoka asked as she was beside him. Compared to him, her height was quite small despite her age of 15, which made a stark contrast between the two. Of course, Anakin still had a stark contrast between himself and most other people or species due to his height. But that didn't get in his way. He still kept his nimbleness, flexibility and everything else that would could with the territory. Even the problem of the chance of dying younger due to being taller isn't a problem to him. Now with his advanced healing factor, immortality, biological and cellular repair and recycling of materials within himself. Yes, this sand-filled, torturous heat and double suns you see in the sky is par for the course here on Tatooine. And it can answer Ahsoka. It isn't that bad though. Ahsoka said as she stared into the sky, through the glass-like dome covering the city they had arrived in. That is because you are protected by this biosphere. It creates an artificial environment with meaning that everything here is controlled to work properly. The heat, the wind and the rain. Everything. Anakin said as the other girls exited the ship. That is quite cool. Ahsoka said. Yes, it can even control the weather and even simulate the passage of time. What I mean by this is that those within will experience seasonal patterns and as time passes they could get used to this. There are other things, not about the biosphere, but within the homes constructed to replicate this effect however. Anakin said, now being rejoined with Isla, Barris and Shark with everything they could or would take from the Jedi Temple. Why is that? Ahsoka asked before adding. I mean, why would anyone spend resources for even the homes to have the same or similar effects? Because humans aren't the only inhabitants throughout Tatrine, or even throughout the Emperor's space. Anakin said before continuing, the people here can live within an environment that is best suited to their species, otherwise it might be harmful. Of course there is the fact natural evolution is a thing, and over time species would adapt. But that doesn't need to happen, as they could evolve in different ways to compensate. Technology is a beautiful thing. Anakin finished. You say that because you love anything to do with technology. Barris stated knowing full well how much time he spent on anything to do with engineering, mechanics and other forms of advanced technology. You are technically correct. Anakin replied as he continued. We should start moving now. Jabitha will be just fine if we leave her. She will come to an undisclosed area. Anakin said. So Jabitha will go towards an area while cloaked. Ahsoka asked as the group started to walk with all of their luggage. Yes. Anakin answered. The group as they started in the day was basically between starting and in the middle. Were greeted to the various people that lived on Tatrine. More specifically the city that used to be called called Mos Espa, is now called Sky City. Why would the people like the city's name that was still the same after some time? Most of the citizens on Tatrine were originally either normal people who were crushed by the oppressive dictatorship of Jabba, the hut of slaves, that were a part of the slave trade that Jabba allowed. Why is everyone staring at us? Ahsoka questioned as she started to notice more and more the people were starting to gather around and follow the group. That is because our Arani here is the prince of this emperor. Remember, Isla answered Ahsoka's question. I knew that. It is just that I didn't think the people here would even know all that much about him, since he has been away a lot. Ahsoka replied. That may be true. But you forget that he is a public figure with some level of fame in the Republic. Take that fame and multiple by about a thousand times. That because of the many things he has done, he has done for them. Or at least there are a lot of things that he has done for most of the people. Isla continued. But isn't this level of fame still insane? And why does no one actually approach us? It was Barris that questioned this as even though she along with Isla and Shark had been here, she didn't know all too much. The person with probably the most information about Anakin's social status within the Emperor is Isla. My prince. A mechanized voice called out from the distance, and the ground started to shake a little, which caused the group to be shocked at what was approaching them. All except the denizens of Sky City and Anakin himself. It was a group of droids that had come to escort the group to the palace. 
Anakin had hoped this coming to be a surprise for Shmai, and hoped that it wasn't her that had the droids come here. In fact, he is also thankful for the droids, because he was just about to call them over anyway, because the people here were being a bit creepy. They weren't totally silent or anything, but they did keep a distance, and as if both scared, respectful and fervent in their approach they didn't want to leave. Thankfully they weren't stands. No doubt he probably some. He would have to deal with that now that he was back. Another thing to think about was how much the people knew about him. He didn't think they would be this devoted, or whatever other feelings he could sense. It was also starting to make the girls uncomfortable by the amount of attention they were receiving for being next to him. The life of a celebrity is not as fun as a lot of people would have liked to have. There was just too many problems for Anakin to even consider being such a public figure, but he couldn't avoid it because of the choices he has made. Now he has to deal with those consequences, but he would also enjoy the benefits, whatever they be. At least the droids know not to use the title of Emperor willy-nilly. He thought to himself, My prince, why didn't you call for us? We shall escort you. Enjoy the commanding droid looks at the girls before continuing. Consorts. That gets a reaction from the girls as they exclaim that they aren't his consorts. But Isla does say she is his wife while the others are friends. Yes, friends. I apologize, my mistress. The commanding droid tries to bow, while the other droids also bow down, because they must follow the lead of their commanding officer. It is a small mistake, but please don't mistake me for a simple consort. Isla says while the other girls had come down, with Ahsoka being a little shocked herself that her Anakin would out of nowhere be married to Isla. That conversation would have to wait however, as they were heading to the palace. Anakin was going to make a grand entrance. Shmai was having a fine day. Not the worst and certainly the best, but it was alright. Everything was working and going fine, with a few problems popping up now and then. But the artificial intelligence took care of most of those problems, without the need for her interference. She usually spent a small amount of her time within the palace's throne room, meeting up with the elected officials, and that was a boring exercise. When it came to politics there was usually a lot of political tape to shut down a lot of things. But that wasn't what is present within the Emperor. By being the Empress, she had full and total control over the lives of the people. But that didn't mean she was a dictator, as the rather unique political system here was strange. There were elected officials for planets, continents, regions and cities. There are even reserved seats for specific species in particular, because they were either natives or had natives for various planets they were a part of. Meaning there would always be a representative for a native species for any and all planet while other seats were up for grabs. The one seat that was off limits however was her own. The people had elected to have her have a permanent position, and she complied, then her position was elevated. Of course she wasn't the only one to have this permanent position as Anakin would come back to take it. That was the main purpose of the people's reasoning, and as more and more planets were brought under their banners, the more she could see just how different the current denizens of the Emperor compared to those on the outside. There is a fanatical belief in that Anakin is some kind of savior and those brought into the Emperor and started to adapt and change to those beliefs. Empress. A melodic voice came from the center table that was feminine in nature. I have the new reports on the progress of suppressing the rebellious forces from General Grievous. Thank you Siri. Shmai was quite surprised to find that her son had gone so far to modify the artificial intelligence to make it more feminine and capable of playing sound, or more specifically, when it comes to vocalizing words from different languages. Even more peculiar was the name, since it wasn't a part of anything she knew of, and her son just said it was something named after a distant memory. My son seems to be especially enthusiastic when it comes to girls Shmai had worried that he may have been unable to get married. But after revealing to her that he would be leaving the order, she was especially excited. She knew her child had a lot of love interests around him, and that she would be able to have a big family. Not that she doesn't like just having Anakin, it would be especially beautiful, at least to her to look after and care for his children. She knew that he was to lead the Empire in the future, and he may not have as much time on his hands to give love and affection towards his children. At least she was concerned about that until Anakin assured her that, that would never happen. He promised her and she fully believed in her son's decisions. So far, he has been correct in doing a many number of things, and barely anything went wrong, except Except for the common problems that come along with different decisions or choices. Siri, can you transmit the song my son had made, please? Shmai asked politely. Of course. Siri replied and started the song she was non-stop listening to. Who knew her child had quite the lovely voice capable of vocalizing beautiful sounds, and being able to transmit emotion. Strangely enough however was the music was unlike the stuff she has heard of, and it was only meant to be of use to her or to himself and others, he decided to release it too. He called the song, Samsa Her. Not that she knew why he had done so. But it was supposedly connected to his memories from a distant past, and the artificial intelligence he had created. Empress, there seems to be someone approaching the palace. Siri called out Shmai from her thoughts and enjoyment of the rather basic but interesting song. Who is it? Shmai asked the AI. Empress, I believe it is best that you go out to meet the person being escorted to the palace outside. Siri replied and didn't answer her question, instead choosing to make Shmai go outside and investigate it herself. Shmai was curious as usually. Siri would answer her questions with perfect clarity, and would leave no room for doubt or question her authority. Shmai got up as Siri deactivated herself from the throne room's display center and viewed everything from the cameras at the front. Shmai, approaching the palace hallways that connected to the entrance, slowly made her way through them, and was coming closer and closer, while being informed of her visitor's progress and making it over towards the palace. She was informed that the person was in fact a few people instead of just one person, which only made her all the more curious. In fact Siri would tell her of how the people were reacting within the vicinity, 
Which lead to be even more surprised. The fact that the citizens of her and her son's empire was reacting in such a strange manner told her that it was someone who held a significant amount of fame. So much fame that it was transmitted all the way from the Republic to the Outer Rims, and there were not a lot of people like that. Sure, there are celebrities that have popped up on the Emperor and television channels, and various celebrities that have started up, since their secure Ethernet connection had been established throughout their planets. But none of them would be to this extent. Not unless the entire group was full of such celebrities. But why would the droids escort them? It is not like any of the droids have any directives to make sure celebrities are to be escorted any. And everywhere they went, while the populace had their own thoughts and opinions on whatever new celebrities that rose to the top in terms of fame within the Emperor. That didn't mean the people are not well adjusted to the society built and created for the Emperor. In fact, most of the people are actually quite sensible, and aren't so nosy to get in the way of a celebrity's private because of some form of fanaticism. However, the people did hold a special place within their hearts for Anakin and even herself, the Empress. It came with the territory. After a while, the reports sent by Siri were now minimal, and only explained the progress this group was having in getting here, and they were taking their sweet, sweet time in coming. Shmai was a little annoyed by this as she wanted to get back to having more free time. Not that she doesn't already have a lot of, but she had gotten used to the life of luxury by now, and it could be seen in the way she holds herself. Her stature, her bearing, the very way she moves and talks, spoke volumes to her progress into becoming a proper empress. A proper leader for the people, graceful, tender, soft but strong in most if not always in regards to the emperor and the safety of her people. She was greatly admired by many young women and young girls growing up on the stories of how Shmai was the kindest, most patient and wisest of women to be known, and that she should be something to be looked up to. It wasn't just Anakin that was used as an example, but Shmai as well. Of course, it was quite impossible to live up to the standard society sets, and despite Anakin having put in time and considerable effort to make sure he is seen as flawed, the people conveniently forget or overlook these factors. There were just too many amazing things he had done throughout his life, which made it harder on all men within the Emperor. How unfortunate for them. Shmai thought to herself, but that only meant that the men had to work extra harder to prove themselves. Anakin didn't want this. But it had happened, and he may have accrued some annoyance from these men even when they too worship him as well. At least his super serum made everyone much more capable than they were before, meaning that are able to at least live up to the normal standards now set within the society. While conflict is normal, without order, or at least some boundaries within this conflict, then it would only spiral out of control, until even Anakin wasn't enough for the people to look up to. Shmai was now outside of the palace, right at its entrance, and with her superior vision and other senses, was keeping a hawk-eye view of the area, waiting for her mysterious visitors. She's still trying to distinguish whether or not she should really be here. But Siri would not have told her to be like this, without knowing she would have questions. She could start to see the outline of five people holding luggage, meaning that this group was not coming for a temporary stay. And she is sure that there is no one she would have lived with her in the palace. Shmai still couldn't put all of the pieces together, even though she had also been in injected with super serum, with which increased her mental and physical capabilities to a level way better than baseline species. Wait a minute, she thought to herself as she started to see more and more the features of those approaching. There was one human male that had very good looking features, the most alluring of purple violet eyes with dark blonde hair, and was tall. Like very tall compared to his female companions and most other if not all other men within the area. It couldn't be. While Shmai had gotten used to Anakin being absent, that didn't mean every time she wasn't surprised or happy to see him. This time however, she knew that he was coming home for real. For a very long time of possibly not forever. Alongside this male human were all females, one younger than the others, and these were two Tegrutas, one Twi'lek and one Marilyn. Shmai had an idea as to who three of them were, while the last one was younger, but a part of the group nonetheless. My son. Shmai smiled inwardly and outwardly but didn't have an outwardly overly surprised reaction like she would have before. No, she had gotten used to his surprise visits. But that didn't mean she wasn't any less happy to see him well and alive. She just waited, knowing now that her child was home. For good. She didn't run up to Anakin or anything like that, she just waited. Waited for her child to hug her and awaited to hear the reason of why he had brought so many girls and was half expecting him to introduce all of them as his girlfriends. After a few minutes, Anakin had finally reached the palace and saw his mother outside, seemingly waiting for him, as if she always knew he was coming. Of course, she just gave off this aura, and in fact never ever knew. Not until he told Siri to make sure to tell her of his approach, but don't say it was him. He had hoped she would show some more surprise, but he guesses that, that is only normal because he has been doing things like this for a while now. However, he did sense her emotions of happiness, pure joy, and he could also see her expression as well. Mother. Some people may be confused because of his address of his mother, but this was just how he liked to address his parents, as he would do the same for his father as well, and call him father. Of course, he didn't want to impose this pattern of speech on others or even his children in the future. It was just something he had kept from his past life. It was not like it had really affected his relationship with his mother in any way because he still loved her just as she still loved him. It was easier that he was his mother's first and only child as well, because it would seem normal to her for him to speak this way, and wouldn't cause distress. If she tried comparing him to other children however and how they spoke to their parents, she would have probably seen and heard the difference. Arnie, welcome back. Shmai pulled him into a hug. He didn't mind this display of affection between himself and his mother. He had nothing to hide from the girls, and he didn't consider it as weakness like some other men may think as. It should be perfectly fine for a son to hug his mother within the presence of family, loved ones or even in public. Well, I am back, 
Anakin disengaged from the Hargaz even though it was fine. That didn't mean he wanted to spend all of his time just embracing his mother, especially in public. He still would rather keep displays of affection in private. But if he really wanted to had to, just for those he loved, then he would gladly do so. With no hesitation, or maybe a little. But that is just his own sensibilities talking within himself. And, who are these pretty ladies? Shmai directs her eyes to some of the women of which she has seen before. She was confused that her son had never brought over some human women, considering that it was only possible for him to have children with other humans. At least that was what she thought and she wanted grandchildren. Not that it's bad to have a girlfriend or multiple from various differing species. Shmai didn't really mind all that much save for that one factor of not being able to have grandchildren. Again, she doesn't know that he can with other species if he wanted to. But he wouldn't just reveal this out of nowhere. Mother, this is Isla, Shark, and Barris. As I am sure you are aware of who the three of them are. While the youngest here is my new apprentice. Anakin reintroduced and introduced the group. While Barris, Isla, and Shark were comfortable in Shmai's presence. That didn't mean Ahsoka was or even ever had the chance to meet her. So obviously she was a bit nervous. Ahsoka bowed and greeted Shmai. Hello, Empress. Shmai giggles here before replying. Well, aren't you just cute? Shmai doesn't hesitate to start pinching Ahsoka's cheeks. But surprisingly enough Ahsoka was not that far off from Shmai's height. Why doesn't everyone come inside? I am sure we discuss things in more detail inside. Throne room, Sky Palace, Sky City, Tatrine, within the Emperor. Anakin goes over everything that has happened with Shmai and goes so far to reveal his secret marriages, which both doesn't and does surprise his mother. Married, you are. Shmai question looked at Anakin first for his answer, before moving her gaze over to Isla. Yes, Anakin confirmed. But Shmai wanted to know from the woman who was standing just behind, but beside his side. Shark, Barris and Ahsoka had all gone their own ways, escorted to their rooms, permanent or otherwise temporary, until they all find their own places, if they so desire. Anakin, Isla and Shmai stayed behind however as she was immensely overjoyed, but was a little angry that she couldn't attend this event nearly any mother would have wanted to go to. Yes, your majesty. Isla answered with politeness. Well, Shmai smiles as the girl didn't look into her eyes, seemingly scared of being rejected by her. But what right does she have to meddle in her son's choices in romantic partners? That is his decision no matter how much she would have tried to set him up herself, she is glad either way. Welcome to the family then, and you don't have to call me your majesty. Technically, since you have married Arnie, you are now considered the princess of this empire. Shmai continued. Thank you. Your maj I mean thank you, mother-in-law. Isla said in a questioning tone at the end of her sentence. That is fine. But you could always just call me mother. Do as Arnie does. But if you still feel uncomfortable doing so, then you shouldn't force yourself. Shmai replied, giving some emotional support, as she could see that Isla feared her rejection. Of course, mother. Isla was able to reply without a mistake or stutter this time. Now that my daughter-in-law and I have settled the business, Ani. Shmai started. Yes. Anakin replied in a questioning tone. You should have at least told me about this before just bringing it up when you came. Not that I am all that unhappy, mind you. I would have liked to have seen this marriage ceremony. Shmai spoke her about her feelings on the matter. I am sorry that I hadn't informed you. Anakin replies. You should be, because I think that we will be holding a proper marriage ceremony. I also assume that the the other women you have brought with you are going to somehow be involved as well. Am I correct to assume that somehow you have gotten yourself into quite the special situation? Shmai questioned as she questioned him. It is complicated. Anakin answered. Well, I have all the time to learn and explore just what has happened over the years without me knowing. At least when it comes to your love life, it would seem you have left me out completely. Not that I would control it or anything like that. Shmai added. Of course, mother. I know that. Anakin replied before continuing. I do also have to add that I am not only married to Isla here. Oh, Shmai was not too surprised at this point. Because she knew her son was interested at the very least with the other women who had come with him. They seemed to have some interest as well. No, not simple interest, but some real feelings and emotions. She saw the look in Barris's and Shark's eyes when gazing upon her son, and she knew that even though now married, there were probably more women were going to be seduced. Not that she minded. She had always known of Anakin's desire to have a large family, and it would seem he is going to achieve that very goal. She didn't know where this desire originated from but just knew that it was a part of who he is. Yeah, you know about that alliance proposed a while back with the then Queen of Naboo. Anakin started. Yes, I do. I quite like Padme and would have loved to have her as a daughter-in-law. Shmai smiled and continued. We still do keep in contact with each other. But she hasn't told you. Isla questioned Shmai here now having some more courage to converse with her. Told me what? Shmai didn't seem to be able to connect the dots. Well, along with myself, Padme has gotten engaged and married to Ani as well. Isla continued. Really, Shmai was now surprised again. And she felt she was going through a roller coaster of many emotions. But she didn't tell me Isla suggested. Maybe she is like me. She feels that it would be best to keep it a secret until later on. Which should be revealed now. But I don't think she knows Arnie has left the order yet. That is possible and now that I think about it. My communication skills seem to be lacking as I should have told her. Anakin said out loud. Really, Arnie? Isla started. You haven't even gone ahead to tell her. She would be extremely overjoyed. Isla looked at him funny. Yes, yes. You can stop nagging me now. Anakin sighed with some exasperation. That is my job after all. Shmai continued right where Anakin left off. The three would then go on to contact Padme about Anakin being relived of his duties to the Jedi. Which would then prompt Shmai to now have hope that she would have some grandchildren. Of course she was unable to even understand what Anakin had done for himself and his loved ones. Because he knew that by nature. 
nature, women in general like children. If he couldn't have one with them, they would be extremely saddened. Not that is their only goal in life or anything, but is an immensely important part of a woman's life, if she so chooses to start a family. He didn't want any of his wives to be saddened by this fact, even though they would so her through this emotional pain. He just wouldn't allow it. Padme would be coming to the Emperor and as she could retire from her position of being a senator. Everything had already been planned out which would result in a proper alliance between Nabu and the Emperor and through his marriage. Once it becomes public of course, which it would within a short time frame as gossip like this is hard to pass up within the press, and soon enough within the Emperor as well, would many girls wanting to see if they could become the wife of the prince would be disappointed. While everyone liked and even would go so far as to say, love Anakin. That didn't mean that most girls are willing to accept the coming one wife out of the many he would have. There are some that would still stay true to their misguided feelings, but that doesn't mean Anakin would accept them because of certain reasons. Those reasons being the diet, as if he didn't have one with someone, there would have to be some extenuating circumstances where he would be allowed to engage with another woman in that way. He was not such a scumbag that he would just give up what he had for something he didn't, because that was stupid within his own mind. Anakin had brought Isla to his royal palace room, as she would be staying and sleeping with him for the time being. She would fully monopolize her time with him, and after he explained to her that it was possible for the two to have children together, she was excited. Beyond exited as this meant she could start a family with her lover, the lover of her life. Her husband's significant other, one and only and whatever else she would attach to him. But now, he could be the father to her children, and their children would also become a part of this empire he has built from the ground up. Anakin and Isla were within his royal bedroom. Arnie, do you want children? Isla still had to ask, as she knew that he had modified himself because of her and her desires. She was sometimes selfish. And he was as well, and as long as they both give their all to each other, then nothing would come in their way. Of course I do. Why? Did you think I would change myself only to satisfy you? How incredibly arrogant you are. Anakin said with a smirk on his face, both of them laying down on his bed after an exhaustive round of exercise. No, of course not. Isla explained herself. I like this. But I just wanted to know that my want and desire didn't influence you. Well, going from the bond we share, of course your desires would influence me. Anakin continued to joke around with a smirk on his face. Stop it. Isla only threw her pillow at him, but didn't let go of her embrace of Anakin. Good night Arnie. Good night Isla. Anakin replied as she slowly was drifting off into sleep. I love you. While Anakin doesn't like saying I love you much because he believes that saying it all the time diminishes the meaning behind the words, he would still reply. I love you too. How was the vacation general Grievous? Anakin asked as he knew about the strange relationship Grievous had developed with Talzin. Oh Lord Skywalker. When did you arrive? Grievous was surprised, especially so as he didn't know that Anakin was coming back so soon. He knew of a lot of Anakin's plans. But that didn't mean he knew everything and didn't mean he knew exactly when these designs were going to be executed. And how did you know about that? Grievous questioned again as he was again surprised by Anakin's ability to know next to everything, at all times. You keep questioning my methods, don't you? Anakin said in a questioning tone. I don't mean anything by it. I am just amazed at your ability to well do anything, Grievous replied. And Grievous is but Anakin was not exactly here for a social call because he has heard of some dissenting voices from with the Emperor and how could the paradise he has built have problems? It does because he has allowed it to exist, not because he wants to dismantle everything he had built up as that would be pointless. To create just to destroy is incredibly stupid and pointless. The rebellion faction wasn't actually created by Anakin, but he allowed for it to be fostered to a certain extent, so he could pull out the true cause or person behind this faction within the Emperor and, well, I ain't here for a social call. I wanted to know about those rebels. Anakin said in a questioning and commanding tone. Grievous just gets to the point as soon as he sees that Anakin doesn't want to chat about his private life anymore. From what I can tell, they are based on the outskirts of the Kemal Station system, so they have decided to hide within the secondary trade center. They must have a supplier for the resources they could acquire. Anakin postulated, we have not exactly located where they are, but because of the less strict measures on Kemal Station, they have been using this to their advantage. I suggest we increase security dash. Grievous was interrupted. No, there is a reason for that, and for now you will just have to let it go. Anakin interrupted him. May I ask why? Grievous was not mad and was used to just taking orders without knowing what exactly was going on. It wasn't like he needed to question Anakin's decisions all that much even when encouraged to do so. The reason being is because Grievous has seen so much good that it started to touch him, and it increased his faith in Tras and Anakin to high levels nearly comparable to the droids. But he still kept his sanity. Anakin didn't want mindless drones that only listened to commands and needed someone, at least one person to make sure he is challenged. Again, without conflict there is no way to tell whether or not he is in the right, and should continue with his decisions. The reason is that I want to lure the snake out of its hole. That is the only reason this descent exists. But I guess it is also a way for those who feel disenfranchised with the Emperor and can gather and allow me to see what concerns them. Anakin said, There is no telling as no system is absolutely perfect. I very much admire that trait about you Lord Skywalker. Grievous said with some reverence, Thank you for the compliment. But I do believe that you could set up some agents on Kemal. Anakin replied. Anakin and Grievous would then go on to plan out their next steps. 
There would be minimal droids being used as it would alert whoever is in charge of such an operation and would set back Anakin's progress in seeing who exactly is against him, whether that be someone from within again or some outside factor trying to wiggle itself in like the worm they are. The Agent Academy set up on the Abana system's asteroid belt was going just fine, and was well on its way to becoming one of the Empire's greatest asset. While Anakin had been playing around with the Jedi, the Academy setup has become one of his greatest assets, where they could be used in espionage and intrigue-based events. The better they became with training and various other things, the easier it was for him to outright insurgences. There was no need for dissenting voices that were not within his control, because if the chaos was set free, it could spell the downfall of his work. The agents were taught many things from basic physical exercises, meant to keep up their physical health and capabilities, basic medical knowledge to assure that they have some level of survivability. More of what they were trained in of course included basic thievery, assassination techniques and various ways to better conceal oneself. There was another interesting thing Anakin had his eyes and ears on the lookout for. It was what Talzin would do to further integrate herself into being somewhat allies with the Emperor. She has surely heard of the development, no matter how backwards their society was, the advancements he had brought was more than enough to convince her of needing him. What she would do was up to anyone, but Anakin had a feeling that it would probably include having him introduce us to a Dathomirian Zabrak female, specifically to become one of his wives as she probably wouldn't have a woman be anything less than that. How she would react to him already being married and now having many wives, and that too going to increase in the future as well, at having more than one. She would already be making a big give because she wants him, not in that way. But that didn't mean she would forego her own cultural and religious background. Well only time will tell. Anakin did see a few future points that include Ventress, but there was still no telling what way it would go. On the Kemal Station, the Resistance, the Freedom Rebellion, or movement they call themselves were having problems growing in numbers. Many of their members were just normal disillusioned people of the Empire, that were radical enough to join such a movement. Then there were others of whom were criminals within the greater galaxy, and had come to the Emperor and believing they could manipulate the system in place. It is a new and rapidly developing system after all, and there were sure to be cracks to exploit, just like there were cracks within the Republic, or even within the huts, where it was one massive crack exploited every day, and every minute there was. Corruption was rampant throughout the galaxy, and people wanted to corrupt this glorious empire as well. Like Moss to the Flame, as great power has great responsibility, but it also means that great power usually has great corruption. Most of the time power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. The Kemal Station had become a base of operations for the dissidents. Because of such low restrictions and surveillance, they could successfully stay here. The resistance was just surprised about how there was so little activity within this station. Wasn't it supposed to be the secondary trade center of the Emperor? Whatever it was however, they were trying and were only successfully taking a few profits from those here. Not that they could overly harm those who decided to set up and live here to live the life of a businessman, trader or salesman. Have you got the goods? A person within a hood asked. Of course I have the goods. I don't know exactly what you want this stuff for, but it is your funeral if you're found out. I don't want anyone coming to me when you're found out. A man with a grimy and dirty face responded while a droid behind him was holding something. A box of some kind that was extremely heavy. Heavy enough for the grimy man to be unable to lift it. And is it stable? The hooded figure asked while gesturing with their hands in a strange manner. Are you stupid or something? The grimy man asked and then continued. Of course it is stable, otherwise I wouldn't have even brought it here. This stuff is dangerous and if it gets in the wrong hands, yes, yes, yes. I don't care about that. I want it now. The hooded figure was probably a man going by his voice type, and he reached towards the droid but was stopped by the other man. Hold it right there. He grasped the hooded man's hand before saying, I haven't received my pay yet. I know you Emperor and folks use Skycoin, and I have heard that it is quite the useful currency. It has become quite common in use among those within the Outer Rim. That is right. Skycoin, stylized SC was quite the well-known currency at this point, with all of the citizens within the Emperor and using it as their currency. Something strange had happened however that elevated the currency's value to extremes. When it was introduced to people outside of their borders, it took off. Like Bitcoin, it started to just take off with people buying it up and down, which was the result of many things. But Anakin thought of people as weird, because they put so much value on something that isn't even real. But if society at large decides together that SC is of value, it would be valuable. Disgruntled, the hooded man violently pulls his hand away from the dealer. You stupid mongrel, how dare you touch me? He goes in to bitch slap the man, and successfully does so because his droid was currently still holding the extremely dangerous product inside. Abu, what are you doing? The droid was trying to put the box down to come to the aid of its master. You fool do you not know who I am a part of? I don't care. The hooded man stated before pulling out a weapon with which he used against the fallen smuggler. Now die. A blast around is heard as the smuggler is killed. And the hooded man aims his weapon towards the droid as well. To finish it off as it has now placed the box down fully. Unfortunately it was too late to help its owner. And its master was not smart enough or too arrogant in believing that he was completely safe here. Hee hee hoo. The hooded man laughs in a strange manner. Cackling to the sky above him within the desolate and isolated street he was on. With no one in sight he had complete control over the situation. The hooded man after doing a crazed celebratory jig of his own moved towards the box and tries to lift it. This is heavy. 
The man whispered to himself as he put it back down now, knowing that he would be unable to take this with him without some aid. Something to end it all. The man then opened his comlink and connected to someone, and called in for some help to come and collect the package. The rebels were actually against droids, and everything droids are because the Emperor uses them all the time for absolutely anything. From the medical sector, police work, administration, everything in these believed that the droids somehow stole whatever jobs they could have had. What a way to go and complain about the lack of work when there was an ample amount of things they could have done. Whatever skills they had before may be useless, because the droids could do a better job. But that doesn't mean that couldn't learn anything new. Most, if not all at this point had gotten the Super Serum, which should make most people better in regards to their intelligence levels or even physical abilities. Unfortunately, they had gotten their hands on the serum, but could replicate it because of Anakin's methods of protection. Sith alchemy was really good when it came to things like this, and Anakin had employed the use of such knowledge in the creation and modification of the super serum. A few men came over, cloaked and having hoods covering most of their features, and their heads were lowered, and they put in the effort to lift the box. They successfully got this thing out of the area, and did so without anyone surveilling them. At least that was what they believed. But Anakin had his agents prowling and stalking as many people within Kemal Station. This station of trade was important, but it wasn't so important that Anakin didn't mind using it as a place to cultivate those who would go against him. It was much easier having an enemy that you know of rather than an enemy that you are unaware of, and Anakin didn't like being unaware. Hurry up. Move it along. We need to get out of this area before some of the Emperor's worthless buckets of scrap arrive at the scene. The hooded man that was crazed ordered those around him to hurry up and get on with things in haste. There was no telling, at least for them whether or not they have attracted the wrong attention. They have been living the good life for the past couple of months now and were growing in strength. Their benefactor was all too gracious in providing them with all the necessary things they needed, and they were all working hard to a future, where there would be no droids to get in their way of life. Estranged from even their own homes for their radical views, they had no choice but to join a movement where they felt they belonged in. Most intelligent species were or a social and communal species, simply because that was how evolution worked. Especially in regards to intelligence at the level of humans and others where language is prominent. Feeling as if you belong somewhere would no doubt create a greater sense of belonging, and some would start to feel as if the place or people with whom they become a part of, are something akin to family. Whether that group you were a part of was seen in a negative or positive light, as long as you stand firm on their side, it would create chaos. Why couldn't some people see that what they were doing was detrimental for themselves and possibly everyone around them? The communities and societies they are a part of was beyond some people, but it was exactly that. They were lost, and in their lost state any information they absorbed was a big part of their initiation and indoctrination. Hey! Do you think the prince has an actual proper plan to dealing with these rebels? A man within a suit designed for stealth asked another person beside him who was actually a woman. Are you questioning the intelligence and divine plan of a prince? The woman spoke back as they were keeping an eye out on Kemal. Kemal's trade had taken off even since under the influence of Anakin and the Emperor, just as it would have taken off originally within the future as it would become a place for smugglers and all sort of people together. The outer rims were not a good place to stay, especially within its cardic nature, but the Emperor was finally putting some order within this chaos. Slowly but surely it wasn't as happening. The agents, both the female and male, were scouting out one particular area that was known to be one of the locations on the Kemal station for the hideout of those going against the soon-to-be emperor. The agents weren't trained from a young age or anything like that, but specific individuals with the right men's at personality and character traits were chosen to become a part of this division. It was specifically made to deal with situations like this information gathering, scouting out the emperor's enemies and other tasks. They are handsomely paid. The life of an agent is a dangerous one, and they would be using any and all of their skills that was learnt throughout their lifetimes to make sure they survived missions they went on. Anakin usually disliked sending people to their deaths, and was much more comfortable with sending droids. But work like this needed a living person's touch. While Anakin was still working with the Kaminans to create his synthetic army, that didn't mean they were ready, and that didn't mean that they would be good agents, considering they would be genetically modified not only using the super serum he had created, but also the genetic implants from the holocron he had gotten from what had seemed like so long ago. Targets acquired. A voice spoke through the comlink, connecting the man and woman agent to those already within the building they were stalking. Someone was undercover and they were moving in to make sure they capture their target. Why kill someone when they could be used for information? Information that Anakin wanted to know and his agents knew that he wanted to know of certain things. Their characteristics and personalities aside, they all have one thing in common, and that is undeniable loyalty and trust within those above them. This made it all the easier to exploitation, that was if Anakin had put normal people in charge. But he had gotten some droids to do the management and administrative work. Most of everything was automatically completed by the AI known as Siri. Target is leaving the building. The building being a stripper bar as Anakin didn't all that care about whether a woman or man wanted to become prostitutes. In fact, he had legalized it in a lot of places, simply because it was the choice of the people participating in such a business. Of course, he had to make sure some form of regulations are in place, as he doesn't want his people catching or creating some sexually transmitted diseases. That would be bad for the population throughout the Emperor, because who knows what types of viruses could be made. His super serum may be powerful, but it doesn't grant someone imperviousness to absolutely every disease or virus, intent on destroying and sucking the life out of someone. I have a clear shot, the woman agent said through the comlink. Take the shot. A mechanical, synthesized voice replied over their connection. Copy. 
The woman replied as she prepared her own weapon meant to knock people unconscious, even those enhanced through the super serum. Anakin wouldn't just give out enhancements to the people without creating countermeasures to a lot of the abilities people would be getting. It was simple enough to create new various chemical compounds, capable of becoming new sedatives for these enhanced people. 1. The woman started mentally. 2. She continued within. 3. Fire. She gave this final thought before firing the tranquilizer with which went at faster speeds. Then what would usually happen? The target they were after noticed the dart, but was not able to react in time, because he was drunk beyond measure. Of course he wasn't only drunk, otherwise his enhanced body would have neutralized his effects. He was also subtly introduced to a poison that would slowly cripple his agility and strength. Are we what? The man gasped as the dart landed directly in between his head and shoulders, on his neck. He fell down as the man that was with the woman agent came around from the corner and gently put the unconscious target on his shoulder. Acting like they were friends, he was quickly able to get out of there, while telling the driver waiting just outside to take them to a specific area. Everything went according to their plan, and the agents had proved their usefulness once again in a situation like this. Anakin just knew that if he were to try and make a synthetic person who was once a droid try this work, they would give themselves away. Their large frame and massive stature would definitely give it away if their ability to talk wasn't going to be stuffed. Good work. Someone said over the comlink as everyone went back their own ways. Whether that be awaiting a new mission or praying to their divine being within mortal form, Anakin. At least that was for sure what the woman agent is doing. She was one step away from pleasuring herself to the though of being taken by him, and if Anakin were to see this, he would be disturbed, and maybe even turn on. This may have not been what he wanted, but it was certainly what he got, and he would have to deal with it. Not that it was all that bad however, as it only made it easier to command and control those under him, under his chosen generals and anyone else within a position of leadership. My lord. The woman's voice echoed within the room she was in as the curtains draw to a close on what would happen next. Interrogation, the action of interrogating or the process of being interrogated. This process was usually slow, meticulous, tedious, and usually didn't come up with any results as people scrambled, lied, acted, told half-truths or just straight up, admit to something they have done, but are still able to get away with things according to the law. Unfortunately for criminals within the Emperor, they didn't have an easy time. They didn't have an easy time at all, especially those who ended up being taken by higher forces within the government that were not a part of the police system or judicial process of the Emperor. There were many ways to make one talk, and it was made all the more easier with Anakin having taught those of whom are for sensitive, the ability he had developed for himself. It regards the telepathy, empathic and mind reading techniques used through the force, with which allows those who are force sensitive to be able to see through the minds of others completely. Of course they didn't a way to protect themselves as well, just as he had started out all those years ago. The living droids had taken an extremely potent liking to these various techniques for two reasons, one being the most important. It was taken as a divine gift to them, a divine gift meant to be used against those who would want to do harm to Anakin or others around him. A gift to protect themselves, basically a power granted to them through his grace, and they weren't exactly wrong as through their bond to him, he is able to transfer some knowledge to them if he wants to. His own integrated interface works like a way to better connect him to the living droids, which of course only increased their devotion towards him. Anakin feared what they would do or how zealous they would become. Once the creation of their synthetic bodies are done, the target, now that he had been captured was chained and brought into the asteroid belt of the Abana system, where the intelligence division or department was located. No one knew exactly where their headquarters were, not even the citizens knew. But they knew that the Emperor had such a department. It was meant to keep out an eye for both internal and external affairs related to the safety of the people. The target, now prisoner was being brought in with metaphor chains, as the technology this galaxy had access to was far more potent and efficient than simple chains. The use of chains would be cruel as well as it could create physical damage to one's body, not that an enhanced person that has gone through with the super serum couldn't easily handle. For now this person will be referred to as the prisoner, because his name has still not been identified. The prisoner was adamant in not giving anything up, and had even gone so far to cut his own tongue off. It was a gruesome sight to see, but the agents had been mentally and emotionally trained for such events, and it helped that they were predisposed with distinguishing traits. That made it all the more easier to stomach such radical behavior. The prisoner now having his tongue bitten through and damaged, would be incapable of saying anything even if they tortured him ruthlessly, not that they were even going to do that anyway. Grievous would be coming in to make sure he knew nothing, or if he knew something that would lead to the goals, desires and designs Anakin had in store for them all. One such goal is to make sure conflict is there, as without it the Emperor could stagnate, and he wouldn't want that. There is a reason humans within his past life even still fought in wars up to the day he had died. It didn't only bring in advancements in many fields, but it also brought along with them various amounts of valuable resources. Here however, Anakin's valuable resource he is fighting for here, is the prosperity of the Emperor in itself, because it is a threat from the inside they are taking care of. He can't let corruption exist even though there currently really wasn't any real form of corruption from within. Other than himself of course, but he believes in from the results shown to him that he is doing a great job. From his position however it is all too easy to sometimes think about people in terms related to numbers, and not just think about the people themselves. This is partially why he allowed such radicals to exist in a suppressed manner. 
that wouldn't lead to many harmful acts. They had not killed anyone, at least anyone from within the Emperor, because they seemed to know that if they took it to that level, they would be thoroughly annihilated. Insurgents to fight corruption and make sure he is given a wake-up call every now and then in relation to what the people want. Of course, he won't just take the words of radical people into account as their views were too extreme, but they could point out to him from where those views originated. He could then enact laws or remove laws that fostered such a sentiment. The Emperor was within a constant state of flux, just like it was for any living being, evolving and ridding themselves of the old while trying out the new and improved bits and pieces. Whether it worked or didn't all depended on how well this evolutionary path adapted to its environment, and Anakin was all for that. Now that I have you alone prisoner, it would seem that you have made it impossible to communicate with you in a normal manner. Grievous stated as he paced around in the room the two were in. Since it was only Grievous really capable of talking, and he had time to spare, Grievous decided to play around a bit with the prisoner's mental state, not to torture him in some way but to make sure his mind is rattled up enough for him to go in and read the man's mind. He is a human and a man, enhanced by the super serum at an unknown point of time, and whatever records they could have had were not there. Meaning identifying this man would have taken a bit of time, because it would seem the records didn't include this man within their system. It was quite foolish of you to become like this, and it even seemed that you had go so far as to remove any and all data of your existence, which should be impossible. Grievous trailed off thinking about the artificial intelligence known as Siri. She is scary, and she is. She is entrusted to the various amounts of information provides, and even retains within his head himself, she is directly connected to him that way. He did create a semi-spiritual realm for his living droid's consciousness to exist, and Siri is the moderator of that virtual dimension. Your dissidence has been noted now and we have re-recorded your information. Now we are just missing the more important things. We do not need the times you have gone to the bathroom, or what you have to eat. Grievous said before continuing, the man just kept a blank face and was quiet. Before he was quite the mischievous prisoner and an annoying one because after mutilating himself, he had decided to cackle in his new mutilated state. We are not a greedy corporation that would pay for your private information through the use of an Ethernet account. Grievous continued, no, we don't do that as that is incredibly invasive, and you have even gone so far as to make sure you don't speak no matter what we do. The prisoner seemed to be smug, and nothing was there to cover his mouth, as he made weird laughing sounds. At least that is how you think about it. But you miss a lot of important information. You and the dissidents aren't the only ones capable of withholding information. Grievous said in quite the ominous tone that started to set the atmosphere. You are in a lot of trouble, and your punishment will probably be not easy, depending on what information you have, what you have done and various other factors, once we discover who your family is and everything else. The man seemed to be shocked here at the mention of his family, not knowing that Grievous didn't have that information yet, and was only implying he would gain it. The man however had this tidbit go over his head, as he panicked now knowing his family is on the line as well for his stupid decisions. Don't worry, we won't go after your family and those not involved will not be punished at all. That is just stupid. Grievous continued his mental manipulation without the aid of the Force, to make sure the man is emotionally in the right place, making it easier for him to invade his mind. It would seem that even crazed radicals have their own families as well. Grievous didn't know how he should feel for the man's family, whether he should grieve for their stupid son, be angry the man would put his family at risk, or lament that he wouldn't be able to have children on his own. If only there was some way to restore his body completely anew. Not that he disliked his new armaments and additions to his now mechanized form, it was just that it still wasn't the same. Even with the force he was starting to notice that while at a higher level, it couldn't act as a proper replacement for a lost limb, or multiple. The feelings were different, and Grievous was starting to miss those feelings now more so than ever, as he couldn't even get it on with his lover. Not that they would or should be even allowed to considering both of their ages at this point. The prisoner makes a strange noise like he was trying to say something, but was unable to which brings Grievous out of his thought, and brings him back to the present situation. I am sorry about that. Of course, I didn't forget about you my friend. I think I've had enough talking for now and with to proceed with the real interrogation. The man seemed confused and if he could he would say something like, and how the hell would you do that? And Grievous responded to the man's thought as he could read clearly his thoughts and sense his emotions to the full extent at this point, because of communication. Being sociable is a scary thing, and would lower the guard down of anyone, knowing that a person wouldn't be doing anything harmful to you. It became even more so real for the prisoner as Grievous just paced around the room, which did create some feelings of fear but only for those very mentally challenging emotions released who protected someone's mind were put to ease by Grievous. It was not like Grievous had a special way with words, or that he was all that charming to the human. No, it was through simple psychological pathways to get to the root of the man's mind, and then subtly entering without his knowing. It is a complex process that took Grievous a long time to learn, but now that he has it, it opened up much of the world to him. Which is why he was feeling the need to want limbs again now knowing the thoughts and emotions of people looking at him. While tolerance is high for all kinds of people, especially those that had to become synthesized or otherwise mechanized because of the people's love for Anakin. That didn't mean they still wouldn't get scared by his appearance. Now being able to delve into the man's mind, Grievous did so slowly as while he had finally gotten it down. That didn't mean he would be totally unable to avoid harm to either himself or the person he was trying to mind read. 
there have been reports of things like both people, specifically living droids, as they were the only ones really not prohibited in its use. The initiator and the other droid being mind red were both killed, their consciousness totally and completely destroyed, but they were lucky to have a backup stored within the Matrix. Careful now Grievous, your training, remember your training. Grievous thought to himself while simultaneously trying to unravel the depths of the man's mind. His name was quickly and easily identified as Trevor Isinghold, a strange name. But Grievous didn't discriminate, as he had a weird name himself. It was as if the person that was riding the fate of this universe was having some delicious cake that was absolutely covered in creamy chocolate icing. Delving deeper, Grievous ignored a lot of information trying to assimilate itself into the probe sent into the now-identified Trevor's mind. Many problems are identified in this technique, but even though the problems are said to be problems, they are just the baseline risks to developing such an ability. It was extremely influenced by the dark side, and as a result, it would try and cause chaos for both parties involved. Please refer back to the example given above where two droids were destroyed in the process but were only able to survive such an event because of Anakin's Matrix. What Grievous wanted was everything included in the procedure, information that relates to the rebellion currently going on, resources their bosses, various locations and bases spread through Kemal, and otherwise outside of the Emperor. The higher ups and bigger, better positions that could be held onto and many, many other things. Now this is interesting. Grievous had come across who the man's family is, and they were in fact normal citizens within the Empire, and they had no relation to the dissidents, other than being unknowing and connected to him. A wife, three daughters. My god, this guy has been living the life. What could have Grievous was starting to complain about how the man had it better than him, with a wife, a real body and a family of his own, while he had nothing. He was interrupted in his though process by two things. First is arguably the more important one, which included information about a weapon the dissidents were trying to and have successfully gotten. A explosive device of some kind that would cause a lot of damage if unleashed, and why the man had joined this radical group. It was depressing. What had at first seemed like a normal life and setup, the man was cucked. But not cucked in the traditional sense but cupped by Anakin indirectly because his wife was, let's just say, very interested in him. To even find out his daughters were smitten with him as well. It certainly didn't do wonders for the man's psyche. Then there was the depression over not being able to work anymore. Not that he couldn't find work elsewhere, but most of his skills were within jobs that droids had taken over. That is depressing maybe I don't want what he has after all. Grievous thought to himself as he retreated outside of the man's mind. Of course, Grievous still did want a body. A wife and a body that he could use. But the events within the man showed him a problem. A problem at which Anakin could start to work on within the coming few days to weeks. Using the information collected from the prisoner identified as Trevor Isinghold, they would go on to do what must be done. Trevor wasn't executed himself as there was no evidence, at least within his mind, that showed he was some sort of killer or anything like that, and he had gotten some medical treatment for his idiocy. Not that Grievous would all blame the man. It was his wife that was incapable of keeping it in her pants, and she doesn't even get to see Anakin, like ever. She wasn't close to him had never even had any intimacy at all with the prince, but it was still more than enough. Anakin wouldn't like this as he didn't like the idea of stealing away another man's woman, as he would also dislike having the women he had grown close to, and even started to love go behind his back, and make love to another man. He didn't just dislike this, but hated it. Whoever would be the deliverer of this piece of information may have to face some spiritual pressure from Anakin as no doubt he would get mad at this fact. Enhanced by his own greed but also kind compassionate nature, it would fuel his anger. And even though Anakin shouldn't have that many things to be angry about, there was a considerable amount of pain that he had retained within himself. Some things built up from his new life, but also some unresolved traumas from his past life. Anakin had probably already found out about the man's memories as Grievous reported to him everything even that tragic fate the man known as Trevor had to go through. Trevor was under surveillance, be given a sentence and be imprisoned until he reforms from this sort of behavior. Anakin was not cruel. Anakin is within the royal palace of Tatrine, and was having the time of his life. He was finally free from the Jedi. Not that he was all that held down by them, and he didn't follow their rules, but it felt restricting. The feeling that the place was slowly trying to suffocate him and it didn't feel good to him, and he had also been told by the girls that they felt this as well mainly because of their relationship with him. But that wasn't the only reason because there was already many problems within this organization. So, are you going to get into a relationship with me already or what? Anakin asked the shy Barris that had decided to try and gain some alone time with him. He knew that he shouldn't probably, maybe be so forceful in getting her to answer, but he was not the most patient of people, and he would even go so far as to say he wasn't patient at all. If it seemed like he is, that is only because the thing he wants, desires, or whatever else isn't ready yet. The conditions haven't been fulfilled for him to make his move, but with Barris, he believes he has given her ample time to work up the courage, but it would seem time isn't enough in this instance. I know. Barris has her head down before she felt someone touching and lifting her head to look into the purple, violet colored eyes of Anakin. One could say every one time she looks into his eyes there is something more to him that she is yet to discover. Just like there is always something more because everyone has their secrets. I wanted a lot of things. Barris begins. I wanted to tell you about how your walk mesmerizes me, to the way you talk comfortably with me, to the look in your eye as you gaze upon me. I wanted to tell you about all of the little things that has thoroughly grasped my heart, but there is so little time for so little things. Barris continued, I just want you, even when I know that you would have others. I want you because I desire to have you. I desire to love you. I do, Barris said as she stared into him. It would seem like you are becoming more and more like me. 
That sounds like something I would say. Anakin had a smirk on his face that was quite cheeky, but Barris didn't seem to mind him teasing her in this moment. It was hers after all it is. She had a small smile of her own before closing the distance between the two. Anakin likes this in response. He doesn't want to be in a relationship with passive women who do not know what they want. And it is always better for it to be this way. He likes the aggressiveness because it means they are willing to give it their all. He had a motto when it came to things like relationships, and that was if he gives 100% he expects 100%. If he receives 100%, then he will gladly respond by giving 100% as well, because romantic relationships aren't just 50 50 -ths. That is a lie. It was never 50 50 in the first place because where the hell did the other half of you go? Barris had finally worked up the courage to confess and officially start a relationship with him because of many things. The prime or foremost thing being their departure from the Jedi as Barris was actually quite strict in following the code, even though she wanted something else. Something more with him. That was just as she is, and Anakin doesn't blame her for upholding her morals. Or that she had to do so, because that is what she felt like. He couldn't force anyone, absolutely anyone, he couldn't force to be with him in secret just because he wanted it. He may be a greedy man, but that didn't mean he had to be a unscrupulous greedy man, by taking what he wanted when he wanted. No, he had self-control, and why would he do so when his greed didn't even really apply to this? Wanting more is a part of him, but he much more valued the things he has more so than the things he doesn't. Anakin lent in for the kiss and made she Barris felt good in doing so, while they had their little romance. He does this mean we are a thing now? Barris asked after the kiss was over. It was innocent, well not really innocent, but it wasn't a kiss filled with desire and passion, but of love and tenderness. Yes, I guess it does. Anakin says as he goes in to embrace the cute thing, she was still shy, and it would look like it would be a little while, before he could do certain things with her, that he had been doing with Isla as of late. There it was, his desire to procreate acting up again. It was only natural for him, and some might ask what is the point of having children when you are immortal? Evolutionary-wise, if someone is to become immortal or a species is to achieve something like immortality, then why have the ability to have children, when the continuation of your species would be dependent on you, not the passage of your genetics? And Anakin would say it is because despite having eternal youth and immortality, that doesn't mean you still can't die. It is still entirely possible for something like that to happen, and an example of such a things within the galaxy was within the other timeline, where Anakin went to Mortis and met the Mortis gods, where Upon multiple things happened, but the daughter and a mortal force base race died. Barris just hugged Anakin back, very, very tightly that Anakin was starting to believe she knew exactly what she was doing. She was rubbing against his well-endowed appendage below igniting his desires, that she let go. What a tease. Anakin thought to himself as he and Barris would spend the rest of their time together alone within the very same day. This would elevate their relationship to the next stage, and would have her closer to becoming his next wife. Right alongside Isla and Padme, of whom was rushing as fast as she could to deal with some politics on Coruscant, and then to leave and rejoin with Anakin. She would abandon her dreams of becoming and helping the people for him. This was a stark contrast to the original who wouldn't abandon everything for the original Anakin, but would do a lot for him. The Anakin now was much more enchanting, alluring, and she loved him much more than what the other Padme did at the start. From start to finish she would stalk him, unknowingly to him, and would see herself married to him. He may have been young for her at the time, but that didn't seem to diminish the fact she wouldn't have minded getting together with him, if she had the chance. It was only natural as if was meant to be, but this time much more intense and unusually much more passionate. Here it is. The New Order. Anakin spoke as he had brought the four girls, Isla, Shark, Barris and Ahsoka, to the newly constructed building that wasn't like a temple, but had similarities, and also had many facets that were different. It wasn't as big as the temple on Coruscant, because this wasn't meant to be the be-all, and all of where Anakin wanted the main stay for his Force Sensitives to stay. In fact, he wouldn't really have the many Force Sensitives at the start anyway. Why one may ask? He doesn't intend to start looking for babies to steal away from their parents and brought into the temple. No, he would include and introduce into his education system for the Emperor and a basic standard testing procedure for everyone. The children will live throughout the entire of their lives, not becoming a force sensitive a part of his new organization. They could choose themselves once they are adults within the eyes of the law, whether to join or not. And it wasn't like he would hoard all of the knowledge. Someone could participate in the basic training methods as they develop and grow, if they are to be found as force sensitive. This would give them a semi head start in their progress of becoming someone great within the force. He didn't want people to live the monk lifestyle. But if they wanted, they could do so. Then there is the problems in relation to force alignment, which was a thing he has come to discover is a very prominent thing, and is hard to keep balanced to just for both dark and light sides. For example, himself. He was balanced both physically and spiritually or mentally, and this showed in his powers becoming more terrifying. But this was not something so easily achieved and took him, at this point of time, the entirety of his life to achieve. Of course, now that he is immortal that doesn't matter so much. But it doesn't change the fact he has worked hard to get to this point, and did so without doing too much damage if any at all to others along the way. So, this is the place huh? Shark whispered to herself as they all walked to the building. Everyone liked the place. You guys don't have to join up or even come here all that often. This place exists for those within the Emperor that are found to be Force sensitive, and if they want can join to further themselves within the Force. Anakin explained. So no abducting children. Isla questions. Nope. Anakin answered in an affirmative but deadly serious tone here. I may, no, we may have all come from the Jedi, but that doesn't mean we should follow exactly in their footsteps. This place is only meant to allow the people a chance to do something. Anakin said before continuing, they won't be guardians and protectors unless they want to. 
they won't be a part of some council, and have to achieve some rank that is benign. This place is only meant to help those understand their abilities, and to practice or use them within a safe environment. And it can finish. So, it is a school. Barris question here as Ahsoka was taken by everything. There were multiple rooms and large design, meaning that it would act more of an university. Anakin hated universities from his past life. But that didn't mean he doesn't know the usefulness of advanced education. It was just that some things were pointless to study extra for, and should not be institutionalized. If one wanted to study the arts, then they won't have something to exemplify their merits or efforts, other than their ability to make it big themselves. Of course, that doesn't mean Anakin would stop the development of schools made for the arts, music and all of that. It just meant that they wouldn't be government funded where the taxpayers had to give money for stuff like this. For stuff like science, engineering and other things related to stuff like this however would be funded. Anakin couldn't spend enough on these because of their usefulness to not only him, but for the rest of the Emperor. The institution he has made is like that. It is in a sense. But it is much more closer to a university type organization. Funded by the government of course. Anakin stated as they continued their tour around this building, inside and outside. You guys don't need to join or anything, but it would be nice for some force sensitives. That have some practice or experience to come and teach. I will be doing so every now and then, teach I mean. Anakin stated. Out of the group, the only two people within the group that knew how to teach someone was Shark and Anakin, and Shark didn't really have the best methods before meeting Anakin. Her pupil she had taken on, her second one was now a proper Jedi and still alive. She doubted that she would stay because she had been influenced by both herself and Anakin, and her influence was influenced by Anakin as well. Which only meant that she would probably be coming here after she finds a way to leave the Jedi Order. So that means we can become teachers here if we want. Isla had a thoughtful look on her face. Yes, Anakin replied. What if I could teach some children? Isla asked this as she wanted to gain some experience with children both young and a little older, because she was expecting to have a child if not many with Anakin in the near future. She had been told about him changing himself to do so after all, and was excited at the prospect. She didn't want to become a mother too soon, but by gaining immortality and eternal youth, she would never have to worry about not being able to have children. It is possible. Anakin nodded. That is great then. Isla had a smile on her face, as she would be able to get in some experience before the real deal begins. My lord. A voice echoed as the group came to a stop, realizing that there was a another woman, no, an entirely new group of women that were coming towards them. One in particular seemed especially enthusiastic for a lack of other terms or words. My lord, my prince, you are here. This prompted the girls that Anakin had come along with to look at him funny, as there is now another woman, or multiple more women, that seemed to have a close relationship with him. Hello, Anakin replied as the other group had gotten close. It was Renala who was once a professor from another educational institution who was a duck side enthusiast, but has now become an Anakin enthusiast. Next is Anna, the ancient Sith who had been revived by Anakin, and connected to him through a diet. Of course those who were connected knew of her, but didn't know what she looked like or where exactly she came from. Her origins are mystery, but now they know that she is at least a Sith, or at least someone who has a dark side alignment. Anakin doesn't want to or even bothers to go into much deal of information concerning those in a dire bond to him. He wouldn't share private information, or at least perceive private information with others even with his own loved ones. It was not his information to share, and if he happened to know or learn of such things, it would probably stay within his mind forever. Never to leave without the consent of the person, or if the situation pertains and relies on such information being revealed. Wait, I know you Shark looked at another of the girls within this group, and she was aligned to the light side of the Force, among the other three of whom were Master T. ID didn't know you would leave the order. Lorana Jinsla was a Jedi at one point, but was patched by Anakin, and she was believed to be dead along with her master. But it was Anakin that had saved her and brought her in. Wait a minute, I know you as well, Shark looked over to the last girl which was also another human. It was Allison, of whom had decided to join Anakin and his new order, because he didn't restrict what people wanted to learn, or what side of the force they wanted to lean towards. In the end it was their decision, as long as they didn't misuse or abuse such power and information it was fine by him. Following the laws and trying to maintain moral stability is all that matters to Anakin within his empire. Master T, nice to see you again. Allison had a mischievous smile upon her face as she said this because they had met at least once before. Renala didn't care about the talks and was just directly attached to him. Anakin didn't know how to feel when it came to Renala, as she was in a similar situation to Padme, but she is force sensitive and was not connected to him, which only meant she isn't compatible enough within the force to be connected to him in that way. Of course if he cared about what the force wanted for him, he would have just destroyed the Jedi already and joined Palpatine as a Sith. It was too bad that Anakin didn't like the idea of being a puppet and having his fate, his destiny be predetermined by the force or by anything and everything else. So Ani, care to introduce everyone here? Isla was confused and slightly upset at the event that has just happened in front of her. But that didn't mean she was just going to cause an outburst. She would at the very least hear an explanation from her Ani first before ripping into him, if that is what he deserves. She would do this before forgiving him because it was only meant to scare him, and it probably wouldn't anyway because he knows her just as she knows him. Right. Isla, Shark, Barris and Ahsoka meet the first members of the New Order, that I haven't decided a name on yet. Anakin started. The girl hugging me is Renala. She was an archaeologist and scholar, affiliated to the University of Sambra. Barris is also similarly upset, but seeing as Isla was able to keep her cool, that meant she should also keep her cool. She is an adept at the dark side. Well, she was, but now she is just a dark side user now that has it under control. 
Anakin finished as Renala let go of him and inspected the four new girls. At least her and could say she doesn't all that care despite her tendencies. She already knew everything there was to know about what was going on, and she would be lying if she didn't she she is jealous. How could they have a bond and not me? Renala thought to herself. Renala just did a quick look over the group and stated quite proudly. Hello, I do not care what you are to my lord, but I hope to get along well with all of you. Everyone greeted her back while Anakin went on to introduce the other two people. That weren't connected to him through a dyad and probably wouldn't be joining in on the little circle of wives he is creating for himself. The last person here goes by the name Zanna. Anakin said as again everyone introduced themselves to each other without Anakin's aid, because they are proper adults, bar Ahsoka who was only 15 at this point of time. Not intentionally of course, or was it now that he can, that he subconsciously is. By the way, now he will have to spend a lot of time with however many lovers and wives he has. Right, now that everyone has been introduced to each other. Why don't we talk about what exactly is happening here with this academy? Anakin stated as they started to move away from the area everyone had come together at. What is its name going to be? Ahsoka was asking the real questions. What is what's name going to be? Anakin had an idea but still asked anyway to not be confused over whether or not Ahsoka was asking about something else. I do believe the little runt is talking about the academy. Xana supplied here while looking down on Ahsoka because she was the brightest of a bunch Anakin had brought over. Her light within the force being the brightest and most pure, which only further increased her disdain of Ahsoka specifically. Anakin gave Xana a rather harsh look because Ahsoka was now technically his apprentice, whether she was as a Jedi or not, now she is. If you have had enough of being a bitch, I suggest you keep quiet. Anakin was not shy around Ahsoka when using words that most adults wouldn't use around children knowingly. Even those around the same age of Ahsoka. Whatever, Xana said as she still wasn't exactly thrilled about the situation she is in, no matter if she knows about about how Anakin and herself are supposed to be together. Being revived and brought back from hell only to be unexpectedly bonded with a stranger she doesn't know at all. It was certainly not up her alley. Ahsoka, I think we can name it whatever you like. Anakin said to Ahsoka giving the naming rights over to her, and she seemed happy at being able to do so. As they continued to walk to their destination, Ahsoka finally had an idea of what this new order, new organization and academy could be. Grey Jedi. No, that is not cool enough. And it sounds like we are still very connected to the Jedi. We must represent something else, something different that isn't the Sith, but neither the Jedi. Ahsoka was putting in a lot of effort and thought into this thinking it is some big responsibility. But Anakin didn't care too much because in the end, the publicity of the academy matters to bring people in. Not the name but it could play a part in swaying people to his empire. From what Ahsoka had seen of Anakin's empire was that the people were happy and seemed to be content with their lives. The female Jedi that had come from the Order with Anakin didn't just spend some time with Anakin here on Tatooine. They all had their own little adventures every now and then, and this included to exploration and communication with various locals. Ahsoka, just like the original was a very passionate person, compassionate as well, and would properly be disappointed if Anakin didn't have a somewhat good social environment. Not that she knew all that much about developing and maintaining a semi-peaceful empire anyway. No, it has to be something that represents the New Order, separate from the Jedi, separate from the Sith, and exemplify what Anakin is, and what he represents. Ahsoka was so extremely deep within her thoughts that she was within a trance-like state. This of course alerted the others, but Anakin just had them go on further ahead as he waited for her to finish. Moments like this are defining and very important, because the Force likes to mess with people, whether that be for its own reasons, which is usually most of the time related to its selfishness, but others can't relate the living in cosmic forces as such except Anakin. He hadn't had the time to introduce this concept and make sure people knew that the Force was a lot less mystical than it seemed. Ahsoka started to sit down within her trance-like state and meditated, levitating off of the ground, and Anakin was starting to feel strange. He knew this feeling well by now, and was extremely terrified that the Force would go so far as to do this now. He thought of Ahsoka as too young for such a thing, but it would seem the Force didn't care and started to link the two interchangeably and forever more together. He knew that Ahsoka would look good in the future, but her current self is not something he is willing to get involved with. She is too young even though she is 15. His sensibilities from his previous life were still with him, and despite his wanting and desiring of women, that didn't mean it extended to those so much younger to him. They should at least be within the right physical and mental headspace to even think about such things. One thing is for certain at this point, is that Anakin wouldn't be involving himself with Ahsoka. Not at least until he believes she isn't himself as ready. Which would be years yet before anything more would happen. For now, Anakin will just have to live with the fact she would become increasingly more loving towards him in a romantic sense, which would lead to him having to reject most of her advances. The name shall be. Ahsoka thoughts were a little chaotic at this moment as she started to feel different. As if she was awakened to this new and delightful feeling, she had been missing throughout her entire life and had only just found. But she doesn't have time to explore these new emotions, thoughts and feelings as she had a task at hand to complete. A name, a title, something important, something Anakin. The others now far gone ahead and Anakin keeping the area on lockdown. Ahsoka can continue as she feels immense safety in the presence of Anakin just being around her. It was not like she didn't like him before the bond, but it would start to spiral.
spiral out of control, just as any emotion would, and this would be the start of her total and complete fall to Anakin. Arnie is strong, incredibly so, he is fast, he is everything and because of this the Academy's name has to represent this. She started to go over the code he had taught to her even before she has now become his real apprentice. The Grey Code, the code that spoke of a balance within the Force, and how he had told her of the problems and absolute difficulty of such a task. But she believed in him, in his status as the Chosen One, but it was more than that. She saw past everything else and went deep inside herself to see truly just how much he has done for her and others, and because of this, she could only come to one conclusion. The Academy's name shall be the Emperor in Order. Keeping it simple, I like it. Ahsoka thought within herself as everything came to an end, with which everything was over and the name she had decided on was chosen. Yes, it shall be called the Emperor in Order. A fitting name, Ahsoka thought to herself. And as she opened her eyes, she was greeted to the sight of Anakin watching over her. This fills her heart with warmth incomparable to how it was before. She had this feeling blossom from within herself she had never ever felt, not like the way she was feeling it. It was what she originally had developed for Anakin, unknowingly, and it was increased 100-fold. It was an extremely uncomfortable but pleasing feeling at the same time, because it ignited a desire she held within herself. A desire that was totally selfish and full of passion, desire like she had never felt before. But she was quickly brought back to reality as Anakin walked up to her. Ahsoka, are you okay? He asked her. Oh, yeah, I am alright, how about you? Ahsoka asked him weirdly still distracted as she gazed into his eyes, which were the result of both his genetic mutations through the sky seed and the force influencing its direction. It glowed with ethereal light that was barely noticeable when there was a lot of lighting. But Ahsoka could see those eyes clearly, and would look into them all day long. That is if Anakin allowed her to, of course. He had looked away and started to walk in the direction the others were heading to, and Ahsoka quickly got up to follow after him. Anakin didn't want the girl to fall too deeply now, as he would feel uncomfortable just as he does now. He decided to draw her attention away from the fact she had a deeper bond to him, by asking the question. So, what is the new name? Is it any good, or am I going to have to create one myself? She just gives him the stink eye as she exclaims. No, you have given me the responsibility, so it belongs to me. Okay, okay. Calm down. What is it then? Anakin asked her as they were nearing the end of their journey alone together. Well, I don't know if you will like it but... Ahsoka hesitates thinking that while she had assistance from the Force, she had this feeling he may not like it. This was just her insecurities of course, as Anakin didn't mind the Force helping her. Yes. He edged her on. The name I have chosen is Emperor in Order. Ahsoka says before they enter the room everyone else is contained within. Anakin smiled at her, which mesmerized her. I like it. Realizing his mistake however his smile goes away as she looks at him in a daze. Damn. What the now group of nine Force sensitives discussed had to do with what was going to go on within the Order. Anakin rather liked his role as a teacher within the Jedi, and knew that he wouldn't have the same burden of being a parental figure within his own order, because the people who join can still be attached. They have no need to leave behind all of their worldly possessions. They would still be able to inherit things, and wouldn't and shouldn't be disqualified from what their families have simply because they wanted to learn some space magic from Space Jesus. Xana will continue to play a role in teaching people about the dark side of the Force, because she is aligned to that side, and Anakin didn't really have any desire to tell her to not be like that. It is not his intentions to impose his way of thinking onto others, but to rather promote critical thinking as much as possible, when it comes to the Force as a whole. Isla had actually wanted to become a teacher herself off but only for smaller children that parents would allow into the order. It would basically become just like an educational institution, just for magical powers. Shark had actually decided against becoming a teacher, despite her experience because she feels her talents are not that good when it comes to teaching. Examples of her failures aside, she wasn't the worst. But Anakin could agree that her talents were best left to other areas. Then there is Barris who was unsure about whether or not she could teach some people, children or anyone really. She was and is still new to the concept, and would probably be, for now uninvolved with the order, and be focusing on other things. Other things like Anakin but that was besides Besides the point here, Ahsoka would now be living with him, and her interest in the Order wasn't much as well, other than the fact she will be able to participate in the class-like structure that Anakin had done before. She would be able to make friends with others her age, not that teenagers were all that great at social skills, but it was something. Lorana and Allison were the stark opposites of each other, and would be paired together to take on some classes as well. While Anakin had all of these four sensitive girls around him, he didn't have enough people to fill in all of the positions, so he would have to make use of the good old reliable droids. More specifically the living droids that still have the capacity to use the force at this point. Point. They were dying and Anakin had to do something about it. He could always just not care about them and move on with his life, but that wasn't him. He had created them so he should see it through to the end, and he doesn't like endings. So he will just make sure they don't have an end. A few living droids up to this point have dies, not because of external factors, but because of the fading non-organic midi-chlorians that was merged within them to give them consciousness. Proper consciousness that isn't derived from the coding within their programming. Renala? The last of the group, excluding what Anakin would be doing within this order or his involvement regarding it, would be doing other things. She had been taken on as an apprentice by Xana to better herself within the dark side of the Force as Anakin even the good wasn't on Tatooine all of the time. He couldn't give her face-to-face -face training as he was away, and even if he controlled a droid to communicate with her, it wouldn't have been the same. Thankfully it would seem that Xana had come at the right timing to help him, help her out. After everything was settled with the new order everyone went their separate ways to do their own things. For now though, it would seem that Isla, Shark Barris, and Ahsoka would be living within the palace. Xana 
Diana was staying within the temple along with Renala and the other two girls, who are the dual opposites of each other. Back to the subject of the droids dying and being stored within the Matrix, their consciousness and soul safe from any harm. Awaiting their chance to become a part of their emperors, their gods' armies once again and be useful. Their time would come soon enough as Anakin had been fast approaching the topic of synthetic beings. The first batch was soon to be ready and prepared for the introduction of a soul or consciousness. Anakin had his progenoid glands that was ready for harvesting, and could be done so to further create his droids to be turned into sense with which they would have the implants as well. He doesn't have the resources to make every single one of these soon to be made created beings nano suits, but he can still customize and craft hundreds if not thousands of specialized power armor. Some may be asking about how fast that was for his progenoid glands to manifest so fast, and that is because of a few factors. Primarily it has to do with his biological immortality, which is so strong it increases and accelerates the growth of the cells stored within these glands. He wouldn't have to worry ever again about not having enough as he will always have enough, but that doesn't mean he wants to always do surgery on himself to produce more. No, that was not how the glands were supposed to work originally. They were meant to be a means of which would keep his synth army alive and going with unlimited bodies to go into and out. It also serves as a way for him to increase their force-based abilities, because they would all essentially have a small part of him within themselves. This would increase their midi-chlorian count. Maybe it won't be huge or massive to the same extent as him, because midi-chlorians work like that, but they would certainly be much more powerful than the version he had done to the droids before. They would be living, truly biologically living, and he knew that this would just make them more interested in him as a god. Putting him on a pedestal already was already starting to show some strange effects within the Emperor, and he didn't want it to go so much further. He could take advantage of this fact and try and experiment, which he has been doing with the Force, his new and budding dimension within, and their connection to him. For now, however, he had to wait until the synth bodies have been grown on Kamino, before he goes there himself to transfer the consciousness of the dead droids, along with those close to death as well. Reminiscent to a lot of things, he needed to introduce the chip he intends to implant into the body's brains, and slowly merge the soul and consciousness of a droid with the brain dead synth bodies. It would be highly unethical for Anakin to just straight up destroy any soul or consciousness within those bodies, because they were made with the sole purpose of being the bodies for his followers. Soon Anakin thought to himself as he was meditating within the Order's building. Suri, the artificial intelligence he had created to be the administrator of the Matrix, was connected everywhere. At least, she is connected everywhere throughout the Emperor, and he wouldn't want any other way. He was not big on surveillance of his citizens, but there were some things he couldn't ignore. But he didn't want to devolve into the absolute mess of a dictatorship. There were just too many problems with that, and that is why he never just assumed total control over the Emperor. He did so behind the scenes. Assumed total control that is, as there was no need to paint a larger target on his back than he had already. There were properly a lot of people that would like him dead, and now with him leaving the Jedi Order, it would be all the more prominent than it was before. The huts within hut space may come after him more, despite the bounty on his head not being there he knew for sure it was. Officially it wasn't, but it was there unofficially. A good way to get around the Republic's watchful eye on them. But Anakin didn't care all the much about this as he could protect himself. Those he is close to can also protect themselves, but he would still prefer them not being targeted because of him. He was starting to think about expansion however, now that he has Geonosis under his control, and can increase the supply rate of droids as its production increases because of Geonosis. Kranon 12 was a star system under the control of the mining guild, so Anakin wouldn't be making any moves to capture and overtake this planetary system. Even though it was rich in various ores and minerals, it wasn't worth the trouble. Then there is Seferun, which was once owned by the Huts, specifically Gurdala and then her daughter, then finally Jabba. Now it would be under his control for its valuable spice trading. He would have to deal with the rampant smuggling that was there, but he would easily be able to eliminate those nuisances. Vordeo is a planet with a three-way hyperspace lanes, meaning that it is perfect for trade, and there was currently their owning or taking advantage of this fact. So, Anakin would be appropriating this star system for himself, as it would become yet another trade center like Kemal, because there was nothing else on this system other than that. It had land, which was always good, because this population is increasing at a rapid rate. Why is the population growing? Because of the start of the Clone Wars, in combination with the Emperor's safety and advertisement to those within the Outer Rooms. It also was a part of the massive movement for the abolishment of slavery, which slaves when they could took to get to Emperor controlled systems. He had purposely set up various medical stations and administrative things for slaves to be allowed entry to regain their freedom. This just gave his empire explosive growth, which would not slow down for the next few years, as people tried to escape the Republic and its war against the Cis. No doubt people from the Cis would be slowly filtered into his empire. The last star system he would take over is New Ata, which was an agricultural planet, meaning he would have yet another means to include and increase food production throughout the Emperor. If one was to look at a star map, they would see he is trying to expand outwards from Tatooine, slowly taking over many, many star systems that were either abandoned, uncivilized or otherwise, has no official government or leadership in place. If he tried to take over planets related to any organization, it would alert people more than it already does. It would tell everyone that he, himself and the Empire is a massive threat to the rule, and he doesn't want that. So he would keep it as peaceful as possible, until the Empire grows to a level that he doesn't have to worry about stuff like that. Anakin was slowly approaching many worlds that are actually owned by someone or affiliated with other organizations. This would put a halt on his rapid expansion, but he wouldn't just allow this. 
he would sooner or later need some way to expand the reaches of the Emperor, which means he would probably have to start some form of conflict. The last system he would be taking over, well, it wasn't really a system, but another asteroid belt. The Austin Asteroid Cluster is an asteroid belt located in the Arcanist Sector. It was the site of mining operations and resorts, and this is where Anakin would take advantage of this area. Since it is mainly used for mining operations and resorts, that means this asteroid belt would have to be built up in a different way. The mining operations properly won't stay, since within his empire there is nothing he has access to. That would enable such an operation. The resorts, however, could be something good. While he was rich, that didn't mean he wasn't at some point poor. He had to work himself up, way from the bottom of the food chain, and the resorts are usually reserved for those with lots of wealth. He would deconstruct the resorts here, given they would be completely useless to him, and he would chase away any businesses within the area. He would be turning this place into another facility with which he could train more of his agents. While he had an intelligence agency on the Abana system asteroid belt, that didn't mean he would stop with there. The Austin asteroid cluster was in between one of his agricultural worlds and Pi-3 which was a planet within the Pi star system. It was a great system for logging, and the industry would bloom there if he could take control of it over the company that would buy it. It is an insane galaxy when you have the ability to, if you're wealthy enough to purchase entire star systems. In fact, he was thinking of just buying that system himself and then integrating it into the Emperor, but he would have to pay a lot of money to the current holders. While the logging industry would there would fulfill one of the things his empire lacks within its economic market, that didn't mean he wasn't able to import anything. It would be nice however to grab a hold of this opportunity, before anyone else is able to find out about such a profitable business chain within the system. Thinking it over a little more, Anakin believes that he would be overextending himself and the empire, if he were to buy it up now, because there was only so many places he could protect with the current amount of droids he has. Sure, he has Geonosis now, but that doesn't mean droid production is instantaneous. No, he would have to wait and make due with the plans and resources he currently has. Back to what would be done with the Austin Asteroid Cluster. He would just have to make this into another important extension of his growing governmental departments. And the thing he needs to most right now of is somewhere he could create more jobs. Jobs for actual living people instead of droids because he now knows of some people's discontent with the situation they are in. There may be a lot of things available, but it would seem some people don't have the necessary skills in other jobs and were unwilling to learn anything new. He needed to make something for them that was both productive and something they would do, no matter how reluctantly. Out of everything he knows, he would probably set this asteroid belt to be. Now that he thinks about it, Anakin will just open this area up to the public, just like he had done with other things. If he couldn't come up with a creative solution, it was best to just leave it to those looking to start up their own business, to help him get rid of the joblessness. Great idea. Problems usually fix themselves right. Jokes aside, Anakin knew that letting the people decide what this would be was better than him dictating everything for them. Are we ready? A deep voice spoke as there were some people gathered around a table, within a building of some kind, located somewhere undisclosed and most likely off of the grid as well, because these figures didn't want to be found. Well, speak up, you useless lot. The same deep voice yelled out, which startles many of those sitting in on this meeting taking place. But, sir, they had captured Trevor Icinghold, even goddamn it. Another person exclaimed. They got Danny Dash one person tried to speak up, but was interrupted. Shut up. I don't care who they have captured. It doesn't matter because we have this. A whole bunch of people, servants brought in a large box that was sealed shut. The box had been cleaned off as it had gotten dirty on the way to their location. E but boss, you can't be possibly thinking of using this. One voice from within this dissident group spoke up. This is insane. You are going to kill people. And you are going to get us killed as a result. And yet another person who couldn't take the injustice of the situation. They hadn't killed before, or at least to the knowledge of most of the members. But there will nearly always exist corruption. They had killed before, of course not from the Emperor. Otherwise that would get too ugly too fast, and they wouldn't be able to send out their message. Which the Empress was still not getting after all this time, supposedly. All of you doubt me now. But with this we will send a proper message. One that can't be ignored by those above us. Thinking they are all high and mighty. The person stood up and directed his gaze upon the small group gathered within this dank location. Everyone within the room was unsure. Even those that are supporters of the madman talking to them all now. It was one thing to destroy things. As to them it wasn't harming anyone. And was only meant to send a message to those in positions of power. Of course, attacking defenseless people's properties was quite the shitty thing to do. And it shouldn't be done even when they protest. Because that is not right. They aren't actually helping the people they believe to be helping. But are just causing destruction and chaos. Us. In fact, they are harming themselves and those around them by trying to do all of this. And everyone here, probably deep down, knew this. If I may suggest someone else within the room started to speak, and this person seemed to be unusually calm for the situation at hand. Violently looking over towards this voice within the silence, the gruff and violent lunatic of a man saw that the person who had spoken was strange. Strange in a manner that suggested he was in complete control of the situation as if the entire event, the entire room was at his disposal. What is it stranger? The lunatic didn't notice this person, and no one else had really noticed him as well. It was as if he had appeared out of no where and was just sitting in on their meeting, which the lunatic didn't mind all too much, but the others W who are you? How did you get in here? Where are the servants? Or even the guards? 
Multiple other voices rose up as the situation was starting to get heated because of the mysterious visitor's presence. The room descended into total chaos, and the only two people that was calm now is the lunatic and the mysterious man. The servants were nowhere to be seen, otherwise presumed dead or missing, and the others filtered from the room at a very fast pace. Not wanting to know who this person was. It was a danger to their lives, and they are a paranoid bunch of lunatics. But the most mad of them all stayed. As everyone else evacuated, the only two left was the madman and his now new friend within the room with him, the mysterious man. How about we talk this over? The mysterious man said within his cloak as it would seem everyone who wishes to disguise themselves uses something that would cover their face inefficiently. If Anakin were here, he would tell them to hurry up and use a mask or something. Because the wind could and would get in the way of their grand entrance. Even if it weren't the wind, it would still be prudent to take caution when only using a hood to disguise your identity. It was enough however for the man to get in unnoticed by absolutely everyone. The guards, the servants, and not even even those within knew of what was happening. Of course, my friend, now that those useless pieces of trash are out of our way, we can get down to business. The madman had an insane smile on his face not too unlike the Joker. I wish to ask first for what reason you wanted to go against the Emperor and to what extremes you are willing to go through just to make sure the Empress, the Prince and their people are heard. The mysterious man asked. My reason, the madman posed and continued. Why of course, it is to create absolute chaos. Chaos with which it is unseen or even unheard of before. Chaos. Huh? Then you are just right for the job, the mysterious man said before continuing. It has come to my attention and the attention of those from my people that someone has been impersonating us. And who might you be? The madman asked. I should reveal it now then. I am from Trade Federation. The mysterious man revealed himself to be the representative sent by the remnants of the now disbanded Trade Federation. No doubt those from higher up positions, now aware of Anakin and what he has done is trying to get back at Anakin. Well, and here I thought that all of you were dead. Well, you are just in luck because you guys aren't the only people who want to stick it to the people here. The madman said. Oh, who else has come to you? The mysterious man coaxed the madman. I don't know. Some crazy scary dude that wanted to destabilize this developing empire. Some shit like that. The madman replied. I don't know his name or where he was from but he was someone I don't want to mess with. And you think messing with the Emperor is any better? The Trade Federation representative just had to ask. Of course it is. As long as I, or my associates don't hurt anyone in any way, they won't do anything to us. Look how far I have gotten. Cowards, a lot of them. The madman said before saying, Oh, I am terribly sorry, but I have forgotten to introduce myself. You may simply call me Jester, may I know your name? You may refer to me as, The Pawn. The now newly dubbed Pawn said, What a great name. Now that the introductions are over, I would like to know just what I will be receiving out of this deal. What more does this trade federation that doesn't exist anymore, want? The Jester asked, What did the scary figure offer to you before? The Pawn asked, He gave me money. Lots of it. Enough for me to live off of once I leave this hell hole. This place is crazy. The locals are crazy. Even the droids are crazy. The Jester was starting to rant about the things he had seen and heard from within the Emperor and as a citizen. The system for the citizens wasn't perfect, and there would obviously always be people that are unhinged allowed into society, because they look completely normal on the outside. While from within, there is this deep-seated craze, a burning fire that tells them to do things untold of. One must toe the fine line between genius and insanity rather carefully. We don't call ourselves the Trade Federation anymore. Given that we needed to give up everything we have, the pawn clenches his fist, and this isn't unnoticed by the Jester. I suggest this the two, the Jester and the pawn, would then go on to describe what they hadn't want to be done, and what they did want done. Negotiations didn't last long, and by the end of it both parties would be satisfied with the results. This only meant that Anakin would have more trouble to deal with. Within a spaceship, a woman was eagerly anticipating her arrival at her destination. This woman is Padme Amidala Skywalker, formerly Naberi, and she is extremely excited to not only meet up with her Ani again, but also to meet his family. In particular his mother, Shmai. She had a very close relationship with the woman and wanted to become an even closer, tight-knit family and was willing to do a lot of things to make this happen. She was aware that her decision to get married to Anakin was rash and probably not what she should have done, but she doesn't regret it. Her time spent with Anakin was more than enough for her to love him. No, what she wanted was to spend an inordinate amount of time with him evermore. After handling things within the Senate and with her new queen on Naboo, she had finally been able to not be a representative within the Senate no more. That is right, she will no longer be a major part of the Galactic Senate and would become a part of the royal family on Tatooine. The Emperor is where she would be spending most if not all of her life from now on. It is an all too natural choice for her, but she would be lying if she said she wouldn't miss her family from Naboo. Her mother, father, sister and her children. It would certainly be a daunting process to go through when she knew that the people were quite obsessed with Anakin. If she were to somehow do wrong within the public eye, she would fear for her life. At least that was what she had heard was going on there. It wasn't exactly chaos but it seemed like his people regarded him as an entity above them forever and evermore. It wasn't like they weren't correct in assuming he is powerful or even all-knowing, but that doesn't separate the fact from the matter. The matter being that it is scary, and she doesn't know what she would be doing exactly once she got there. Unaware of the responsibilities there would be when becoming the princess and eventual empress alongside with whoever else is to be included, she at least felt safe in the fact that she wouldn't shoulder this burden alone.
first and foremost she would have Anakin, and that was all she needed. But it was still nice to have someone else right beside her. That being Isla, whom had also gotten into a shotgun marriage with Anakin. Your Majesty, we will be arriving shortly. Thank you, Captain. Padme said to one of the pilots as they were nearing Tatooine now having gone through the hyperspace lanes available and those that were hidden as well. It was always better to be precautious, even within their own territory. Anakin was no stranger to events that would go against him in some manner, as no matter how much the Force may love him in a sense, it would still make sure he was tortured first, before fulfilling his role. It had done so to the original, so why wouldn't he also guess that the Force would try and do so to him as well? He was no masochist. There were other problems going on as well, and Anakin was very aware of what was happening. At least he thought he was as he wouldn't be prepared for what is to happen next. An event that would very much anger him. I am coming, Arnie. Had me thought to herself as she imagined what it would be like when she got there again. To see the massive amount of changes and improvements that Anakin had no doubt implemented for the people was something she would be proud of. Just as Anakin would bask in her glory, she too would in his. Anakin was waiting at the spaceport that would have Padme arriving, and he could see her now. Sense her within the very atmosphere as she landed despite the amount of distance between the two, despite the inability to bond to her through the Force. That was just how powerful he had become. That he would be able to destroy an entire planet through the Force if he really wanted to. He would be able to crush one, and that was why there would be no Death Star. Because it is pointless to him at this point. That is not even considering his connection to the Infinity Gate on Dathoma. That had been disabled. Because he also didn't need that anymore. It was backwards from his own, new design that is much better in all ways. Why would he leave a potentially dangerous planet destroying weapon within the hands of the Night Sisters? That is just asking for trouble. Arnie. A voice called out to him, and he awaited her eager embrace. Padme, he said softly as she was now dangling off of his neck because of the size difference she was much smaller compared to him. Not that it would get in the way of certain activities. I am so glad that I am here, to be with you. Still dangling, she stared into his eyes before prompting a kiss scene that was quite romantic, as the two were within their own world. However, there was no typical person interrupting them, and they could embrace each other as they wanted without prying eyes. Are you ready? After disengaging from the situation, Anakin and Padme began their trip back to the palace. Yeah. I think so, Padme answered. I hope so, because while the people may love me, my mother and I haven't given an announcement yet about my marriage to you or Isla, Anakin said. So she knows. Padme didn't seem surprised, and was actually wanting Anakin to do the explaining for the both of them to Shmai. It would make it easier on the both of them Padme and Shmai if Anakin did so. Yeah. I won't forget about that. You should have told her to save me the trouble. Anakin sighed with a troubled look on his face. Don't blame me. Padme pouted. But Anakin just ignored this and couldn't walk in. She had minimal luggage. Well, minimal in female terms. So he had to rely on either the droids or the force. He opted for the force as he was starting to become more and more comfortable with what the people are calling him now. A god. They're god. As the two continued on their way. The sound of children was heard as they were playing within the streets, and some elderly and young people every now and then passed by the two, in awe of Anakin's display. Do you really have to do dash Padme was interrupted however. An explosion occurred, with which had ripped a massive hole in the buildings behind them, and this led to many elderly people dying. Thankfully Anakin was able to save the children from such disaster, and protect everyone else from this. Arnie. Padme's scream was heard as he saw one child within her arms, cold and dying. He tried to save the small boy. Hold on. Anakin said as he used his considerable powers within the force, but it wasn't enough. Is that you? My god and his angel has come to bring me. The boy said before breathing his last breath. No. Anakin thought within himself as the child breathed his last breath. No. This was unexpected, and while Anakin had managed to save a lot of people, it didn't mean it was 100%. There was a spike within the force, and he started to control the direction of his raging emotions. His rage. His anger and wrath that was ready to explode at this devastating tragedy. The boy was mangled, his name unknown, and his soul forever gone, as Anakin's dimension had not been fully created yet. It would have been finished within the next few months, he thought to himself, as he started to feel his eyes. Arnie. Padme had tears running down her face as Anakin looked at the destruction. While minimal it was still a big hit to those within the area, and it was one of the least secure. Arnie. Padme hugged Anakin as the boy's lifeless body was just there. Mangled beyond repair, beyond any shadow of a doubt the boy had died, and Anakin had been able to sense it had happened through the falls. Anakin whispered, I am sorry, this is my fault. Technically this was both Anakin's fault and the fault of the perpetrator, but because Anakin had allowed this dissidence to exist, this had happened. He was only meant to use them and then completely get rid of them, but this seemed like the wrong choice. And like always he thought to himself, actions have consequences, but so did as an action though. Anakin, this isn't your fault. Padme said as she was hugging him, as if to make sure he was still there. It was both herself selfish and selfless reasons she did so. This isn't your fault. She repeated not knowing the full sequence of events that had happened. Anakin was just within a trance, and the force was still. So still that Anakin didn't feel anything when trying to connect to it. Not because it wasn't there. It is. It was as if there was no motion and he knew the reason about why the force had come to a stop. It was, no is because of him and his currently raging inner emotions, surging and filling him with a certain desire. A desire he has not had all too often throughout both of his lives. The hate, the anger was flowing through him, and if he was a Sith, or had a Sith master, they would be extremely pleased but terrified at the same time. I think I have left them for too long, he thought to himself before looking Padme in the eyes. It would seem that as soon as you got here everything went boom, 
He tried to play off his anger by making a joke, but Padme could see it in his eyes. She wasn't afraid he would lash out at her, but seeing him like that hurt her, which only made her shed some more tears. I need to go and deal with something. Anakin stated out of nowhere which kind of left her stunned, but Padme understood. She had questions however. What are you to do? And where am I to go and what do I do? You Anakin smiled at her, and this was a genuine smile filled with warm feelings. Thank you. If you could help settle the situation down here as your first act as Princess of the Emperor, I can do that. She was probably going to do that already without Anakin saying this. Anakin hugged her back to make sure her emotions within this situation were as calm as they could be. It certainly wasn't every day something like this happened to someone. No, stuff like this happens all the time. How foolish I am to believe that I am immune from mistakes that could cost people's lives. If not my own. Anakin thought to himself. After embracing each other for a quick moment, Anakin also kisses Padme on her forehead. Thank you. He dashes off right after this in the direction of Sky Palace. Anakin was communicating with his droids to get here as soon as possible to help mediate the situation. Medical units and disaster control units were sent along with some specialized combat droids to protect Padme Padme and others from harm. Anakin is unsure how this had happened and had gone on behind his back. He didn't receive any report from Grievous talking about a bomb of any kind, just the tragic story of the person they had taken in for questioning. Activating his nano suit, Anakin was now fully decked out within his power armor as he had merged this and made his nano suit better through this method. Power armor plus nano suit equals unstoppable beast. He wanted to board Jabitha. But that didn't mean he could just destroy more property even if he wanted to go faster. The streets of Sky City are somewhat compact, but they are not so tall that he wouldn't jump over them. It was just that the force of his speed and jumps would certainly create a dissonance everywhere he went. So he had to go at slower speeds than he usually would to reach the palace. Jibitha, you awake? Anakin sent a telepathic message ahead of time as he was to arrive soon. Papa, what is it? Anakin could have sworn he heard Jabitha yawn as she replied to his message. While Jabitha is a ship, she is also living, meaning that while she may have no brain to need rest like other biological species, Jabitha still had to sleep in a sense, so her parts don't become too used or overheated by being on all of the time. There is also the fact that she is also partially machine, meaning that she needs energy just like any other thing, including biological creatures. The only difference between Jabitha or droids and other living creatures is the type of energy they need and how it is delivered. Anakin had been wanting to come up with another method to make sure Jabitha could recharge herself better, but he had no success so far. She may be able to access the Force to do so, but she was basically still a child for the past few years he has had her. It is evident in the way she speaks to him even now. Papa, why do I feel strange? Jabitha asked him as she felt some spillage of his emotions, which meant the others connected to him also felt it. It is nothing. Do not attach too much importance to these emotions. They are not your own. Anakin replied as it was dangerous to send your thought and emotions into another without them being able to differentiate what is theirs and what is the others. Okay, Papa? If she had a face, he would imagine her smiling. But he wasn't really in the mood to be happy. Nor had the right Obi in this moment for some people will be sent to help. Isla, Shark, Barris, Ahsoka, and Xana had all been alerted to something within the Force. They were all doing their own things, Isla practicing methods of teaching for when she goes to teach. Shark was doing some meditation while Barris and Ahsoka were sparring with each other to further increase their skills. Whether this be with the training lightsabers, because despite having none anymore they would still get more in the future. Or, at least this was what Anakin had promised. And he usually fulfilled his promises like a certain knuckle-headed, blonde ninja. Xana was with Renala, helping her further understand and grasp some control over the dark side of the Force. Hell, even those that weren't connected to Anakin in that way, being Renala, Allison, and Lorana, had felt it, and however else that happened to be Force-sensitive on the planet. All of them rushed to the palace, as that was where they all felt they needed to head to. They all arrived, the only Force-sensitive people that was known of and has some training or experience with the Force within the Emperor and has come to the palace. Of course, they were all surprised that Shmite, Anakin's mother, one of the most gentle and kindest women all of them knew of, had a furious look on her face. It marred her now returned beautiful, youthful features. It certainly wasn't a pretty sight, and as they all saw each other, they all acknowledged each other's presence as they headed further in to see what is going on. They had no idea what they were in store for, and what is to come may very well have them look at Anakin in a different light. A side of him that wasn't kind, or loving, not compassionate, caring for all life or the liberties that should be afforded to everyone. No, they would all have to acknowledge even Allison, Xana and Renala, all of whom were a part of the dark side that Anakin can be angered to a point of relentless pursuit. Relentless and merciless justness in striking down those that have done wrong. Even Renala, who had been most exposed to Anakin as Vader, didn't know much about anything he did as Vader, and just believed that he was similar to her in that regard. He was actually much more willing to do things that others would say are immoral. An example of this would come soon enough. But for now the group has still yet to discover what is going on. So you are saying that an attack has happened? Shmai's voice was heard to the eight women as they drew closer. Yes, Empress. The prince has saved quite a lot of people from the incident. It was Siri, the artificial intelligence that had responded. How many casualties? Shmai asked. From what I estimate, there should only be around 147 people dead, 378 civilly injured, and 1384 with minor injuries. 
There were around five explosions and from those these are the total accrued amount of casualties. Siri replied with some statistics. While this amount was not overly massive compared to the actual population numbers within the Emperor, that didn't mean all of those lives were worthless. Or not valued at all. In fact there is a lot of importance placed on the fact that life is important precious to an extreme view. Anakin didn't want to just turn people into numbers. It was such an absolute thing. That numbers would determine whether or not he cared enough to bother with certain things. Has A been sent? Shmai asked again. Yes. Siri replied, and by now the group of four sensitive girls were now where Shmai was. Sitting upon her throne, the throne that would become Anakin's. What is happening here, mother? Isla asked the question that everyone surely had on their mind. Someone was stupid enough to attack multiple locations by planting some bombs. Shmai replied with a sigh as her anger didn't escape her, but was just pushed down until a later date, where she could give punishment to those involved. How is that possible? Out of everyone here, if there was a person most interested in technology other than Anakin, then it would be Ahsoka as she had to try and pick up some skill in it. After seeing Anakin's passion with this subject, Anakin had also told all of them about the security measure in place. But the thing about these security measures was that it only really applied to the palace. Not that there were others elsewhere. It was just the resources needed to extend this network was too much for an entire planet or two. Let alone everywhere the Emperor had now touched upon. Looking around the room, Shmai says. Why are you guys here? While your help may not be needed at the moment, I am sure that you guys could start somewhere, right? This prompts Lorana and Allison to look at each other, then both promptly head off outside of the palace presumably to help people. The others still stayed because they were here for other reasons, or more like reasons specifically Anakin. Where is Anakin then? I thought I overheard Siri say something about him rescuing some people. Barris question aloud. Affirmative. Siri said and then continued. The prince has left on Jabitha. Left everyone practically exclaimed at the same time. Affirmative. The prince has left on Jabitha to complete something important that pertains to the current situation. Situation. Siri supplied. Tell us what he is doing. Xana wanted to know. So did the others as well. But Siri has recommendations within herself to not tell. Given that a few within this group, if not all of them could be considered Anakin's loved ones, then Siri could tell. I believe that the prince would not like everyone to know. Siri said. Can you at least tell us where he was last before he went back to the palace? Shark questioned Siri. Of course. The prince was last seen with Princess Padme Amidala Skywalker Nina Berry with the next district. Siri said, giving the location and the person he was with. This didn't surprise the girls that he was with Padme as they all knew she was coming. What they didn't know however, was that she would be arriving so soon. Great, thanks. Isla dashed from the palace going towards Padme, along with the others, including Ahsoka. But Ahsoka was stopped by Shmai, as she wanted to tell her something before she left. Be careful. While I trust the other girls to take care of themselves because they are grown-ups, I don't expect you to go into dangerous situations. Just leave that to those older than you. Shmai said as she was quite capable in holding Ahsoka back. Shmai had been injected with the super serum after all, and Ahsoka wasn't. Along with Isla, Shark and Barris, as they hadn't gotten a super serum injection just yet themselves. Go along now. I won't stop you from doing what you want to do, but do so within reason. Shmai said, thank you. Ahsoka still dashed out as soon as she got the chance, but this still, but a gentle smile on Shmai's face, as she saw that Ahsoka was, no, is a lot like Harani. I just hope Anakin doesn't do anything stupid. She thought to herself as she was now left alone. Well not totally alone as Jira came in a second later from her nap. She was looking younger than before, but she wasn't granted immortality because she didn't want it. She did ask for an extension on her lifespan, however, so Anakin granted her this privilege. What did I miss? Jira had slept like a baby. Well, where do I start? Shmai replied as she went on to explain things to her. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.